Critique of Political Economy, Volume 1, Book 1, The Process of Production of Capital. Preface to the First Seven. The work, the first volume of which I now submit to the public, forms the continuation of my tour Critique des Politician Economie, a contribution to the criticism of political economy, published in 1859. The long pause between the first part and the continuation is due to an illness of many years' duration that again and again interrupted my work. The substance of that earlier work is summarized in the first three chapters of this volume. This is done not merely for the sake of connection and completeness. The presentation of the subject matter is improved. As far as circumstances in any way permit, many points only hinted at in the earlier book are here worked out more fully, whilst, conversely, points worked out fully there are only touched upon in this volume. The sections on the history of the theories of value and of money are now, of course, left out altogether. The reader of the earlier work will find, however, in the notes to the first chapter, additional sources of reference relative to the history of those theories. Every beginning is difficult, holds in all sciences. To understand the first chapter, especially the section that contains the analysis of commodities, will, therefore, present the greatest difficulty. That which concerns more especially the analysis of the substance of value and the magnitude of value, I have, as much as it was possible, popularized. Footnote. This is the more necessary, as even the section of Ferdinand Lassalle's work against Schulze-Delich, in which he professes to give the intellectual quintessence of my explanations on these subjects, contains important mistakes. If Ferdinand Lassalle has borrowed almost literally from my writings and without any acknowledgment, all the general theoretical propositions in his economic works, for example, those on the historical character of capital, on the connection between the conditions of production and the mode of production, etc., etc., even to the terminology created by me, this may perhaps be due to purposes of propaganda. I am here, of course, not speaking of his detailed working out and application of these propositions, with which I have nothing to do. End of footnote. The value form, whose fully developed shape is the money form, is very elementary and simple. Nevertheless, the human mind has for more than two thousand years sought in vain to get to the bottom of it all, whilst on the other hand, to the successful analysis of much more composite and complex forms, there has been at least an approximation. Why? Because the body, as an organic whole, is more easy of study than are the cells of that body. In the analysis of economic forms, moreover, neither microscopes nor chemical reagents are of use. The force of abstraction must replace both. But in bourgeois society, the commodity form of the product of labor, or value form of the commodity, is the economic cell form. To the superficial observer, the analysis of these forms seems to turn upon minutiae. It does in fact deal with minutiae, but they are of the same order as those dealt with in microscopic anatomy. With the exception of the section on value form, therefore, this volume cannot stand accused on the score of difficulty. I presuppose, of course, a reader who is willing to learn something new, and therefore to think for himself. The physicist either observes physical phenomena where they occur in their most typical form and most free from disturbing influence, or, wherever possible, he makes experiments under conditions that assure the occurrence of the phenomenon in its normality. 
in this work, I have to examine the capitalist mode of production and the conditions of production and exchange corresponding to that mode. Up to the present time, their classic ground is England. That is the reason why England is used as the chief illustration in the development of my theoretical ideas. If, however, the German reader shrugs his shoulders at the condition of the English industrial and agricultural labourers, or in optimist fashion comforts himself with the thought that in Germany things are not nearly so bad, I must plainly tell him, De te fabula narratur, it is of you that the story is told. Horace Intrinsically, it is not a question of the higher or lower degree of development of the social antagonisms that result from the natural laws of capitalist production. It is a question of these laws themselves, of these tendencies working with iron necessity towards inevitable results. The country that is more developed industrially only shows, to the less developed, the image of its own future. But apart from this, where capitalist production is fully naturalized among the Germans, for instance in the factories proper, the condition of things is much worse than in England, because the counterpoise of the factory acts is wanting. In all other spheres we, like all the rest of continental Western Europe, suffer not only from the development of capitalist production, but also from the incompleteness of that development. Alongside the modern evils, a whole series of inherited evils oppress us, arising from the passive survival of antiquated modes of production, with their inevitable train of social and political anachronisms. We suffer not only from the living, but from the dead. Le mort saisit le vif. The dead holds the living in his grasp. Formula of French common law. The social statistics of Germany and the rest of continental Western Europe are, in comparison with those of England, wretchedly compiled. But they raise the veil just enough to let us catch a glimpse of the Medusa head behind it. We should be appalled at the state of things at home if, as in England, our governments and parliaments appointed periodically commissions of inquiry into economic conditions, if these commissions were armed with the same plenary powers to get at the truth, if it was possible to find for this purpose men as competent, as free from partisanship and respect of persons as are the English factory inspectors, her medical reporters on public health, her commissioners of inquiry into the exploitation of women and children, into housing and food. Perseus wore a magic cap down over his eyes and ears, as make-believe that there are no monsters. Let us not deceive ourselves on this. As in the eighteenth century the American War of Independence sounded the toxin for the European middle class, so that in the nineteenth century the American Civil War sounded it for the European working class. In England the process of social disintegration is palpable. When it has reached a certain point, it must react on the continent. There it will take a form more brutal or more humane, according to the degree of development of the working class itself. Apart from higher motives, therefore, their own most important interests dictate to the classes that are for the nonce the ruling ones the removal of all legally removable hindrances to the free development of the working class. For this reason, as well as others, I have given so large a space in this volume to the history, the details, and the results of English factory legislation. One nation can and should learn from others, and even when a society has got upon the right track for the discovery of the natural laws of its movement, and it is the ultimate aim of this work to lay bare the economic law of motion of modern society, it can neither clear by bold leaps nor remove by legal enactments 
the obstacles offered by the successive phases of its normal development. But it can shorten and lessen the birth pangs. To prevent possible misunderstanding, a word. I paint the capitalist and the landlord in no sense couleur de rose, that is, seen through rose-tinted glasses. But here individuals are dealt with only in so far as they are the personification of economic categories, embodiments of particular class relations and class interests. My standpoint, from which the evolution of the economic formation of society is viewed as a process of natural history, can less than any other make the individual responsible for relations whose creature he socially remains, however much he may subjectively raise himself above them. In the domain of political economy, free scientific inquiry meets not merely the same enemies as in all other domains. The peculiar nature of the materials it deals with summons as foes into the field of battle the most violent, mean, and malignant passions of the human breast, the furies of private interest. The English established church, for example, will more readily pardon an attack on thirty-eight of its thirty-nine articles than on one thirty-ninth of its income. Nowadays, atheism is culpa levis, a relatively slight sin, as compared with criticism of existing property relations. Nevertheless, there is an unmistakable advance. I refer, for example, to the Blue Book, published within the last few weeks, Correspondence with Her Majesty's Missions Abroad Regarding Industrial Questions and Trades Unions. The representatives of the English Crown in foreign countries there declare in so many words that in Germany, in France, to be brief, in all the civilized states of the European continent, radical change in the existing relations between capital and labor is as evident and inevitable as in England. At the same time, on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, Mr. Wade, Vice President of the United States, declared in public meetings that after the abolition of slavery, a radical change of the relations of capital and of property in land is next upon the order of the day. These are signs of the times, not to be hidden by purple mantles or black cassocks. They do not signify that tomorrow a miracle will happen. They show that, within the ruling classes themselves, a foreboding is dawning, that the present society is no solid crystal, but an organism capable of change, and is constantly changing. The second volume of this book will treat of the process of the circulation of capital, book two, and of the varied forms assumed by capital in the course of its development, book three, the third, and last volume, book four, the history of the theory. Every opinion based on scientific criticism I welcome. As to prejudices of so-called public opinion, to which I have never made concessions, now as aforetime the maxim of the great Florentine is mine. Follow your own course and let people talk. Paraphrased from Dante. Karl Marx, London, July the 25th. 1867. Preface to the French edition. Marx, 1872. To the citizen Maurice Lachartre. Dear citizen, I applaud your idea of publishing the translation of Das Kapital as a serial. In this form, the book will be more accessible to the working class a consideration which, to me, outweighs everything else. That is the good side of your suggestion, but here is the reverse of the medal. The method of analysis which I have employed, 
and which had not previously been applied to economic subjects, makes the reading of the first chapters rather arduous, and it is to be feared that the French public, always impatient to come to a conclusion, eager to know the connection between general principles and the immediate questions that have aroused their passions, may be disheartened because they will be unable to move on at once. That is a disadvantage I am powerless to overcome, unless it be by forewarning and forearming those readers who zealously seek the truth. There is no royal road to science, and only those who do not dread the fatiguing climb of its steep paths have a chance of gaining its luminous summits. Believe me, dear citizen, your devoted Karl Marx, London, March the 18th, 1872. Afterward to the second German edition, Marx, 1873. I must start by informing the readers of the first edition about the alterations made in the second edition. One is struck at once by the clearer arrangement of the book. Additional notes are everywhere marked as notes to the second edition. The following are the most important points with regard to the text itself. In Chapter 1, Section 1, the derivation of value from an analysis of the equations by which every exchange value is expressed has been carried out with greater scientific strictness. Likewise, the connection between the substance of value and the determination of the magnitude of value by socially necessary labor time, which was only alluded to in the first edition, is now expressly emphasized. Chapter 1, Section 3, The Form of Value, has been completely revised, a task which was made necessary by the double exposition in the first edition, if nothing else. Let me remark in passing that the double exposition had been occasioned by my friend Dr. L. Kugelman in Hanover. I was visiting him in the spring of 1867 when the first proof sheets arrived from Hamburg, and he convinced me that most readers needed a supplementary, more didactic explanation of the form of value. The last section of the first chapter the fetishism of commodities, etc., has largely been altered. Chapter 3, Section 1, The Measure of Value, has been carefully revised, because in the first edition this section had been treated negligently, the reader having been referred to the explanation already given in Sur Critique der Politischen Ökonomie, Berlin, 1859. Chapter 7, particularly Part 2, has been rewritten to a great extent. It would be a waste of time to go into all the partial textual changes, which were often purely stylistic. They occur throughout the book. Nevertheless, I find now, on revising the French translation appearing in Paris, that several parts of the German original stand in need of rather thorough remoulding, other parts require rather heavy stylistic editing, and still others painstaking elimination of occasional slips. But there was no time for that, for I had been informed only in the autumn of 1871, when in the midst of other urgent work, that the book was sold out, and that the printing of the second edition was to begin in January of 1872. The appreciation which Das Kapital rapidly gained in wide circles of the German working class is the best reward of my labours. Herr Meyer, a Vienna manufacturer, who in economic matters represents the bourgeois point of view in a pamphlet published during the Franco-German War, aptly expounded the idea that the great capacity for theory, which used to be considered a hereditary German possession, had almost completely disappeared amongst the so-called educated classes in Germany, but that amongst its working classes, on the contrary, that capacity was celebrating its revival. 
To the present moment, political economy in Germany is a foreign science. Gustav von Gülich, in his historical description of commerce, industry, etc., especially in the two first volumes published in 1830, has examined at length the historical circumstances that prevented, in Germany, the development of the capitalist mode of production, and consequently the development, in that country, of modern bourgeois society. Thus the soil whence political economy springs was wanting. This science had to be imported from England and France as a ready-made article, its German professors remained schoolboys. The theoretical expression of a foreign reality was turned, in their hands, into a collection of dogmas interpreted by them in terms of the petty trading world around them, and therefore misinterpreted. The feeling of scientific impotence, a feeling not wholly to be repressed, and the uneasy consciousness of having to touch a subject in reality foreign to them, was but imperfectly concealed, either under a parade of literary and historical erudition, or by an admixture of extraneous material borrowed from the so-called cameral sciences, a medley of smatterings through whose purgatory the hopeful candidate for the German bureaucracy has to pass. Since 1848, capitalist production has developed rapidly in Germany, and at the present time it is in the full bloom of speculation and swindling. But fate is still unpropitious to our professional economists. At the time when they were able to deal with political economy in a straightforward fashion, modern economic conditions did not actually exist in Germany. And as soon as these conditions did come into existence, they did so under circumstances that no longer allowed of their being really and impartially investigated within the bounds of the bourgeois horizon. In so far as political economy remains within that horizon, in so far, that is, as the capitalist regime is looked upon as the absolutely final form of social production, instead of as a passing historical phase of its evolution, political economy can remain a science only so long as the class struggle is latent or manifests itself only in isolated and sporadic phenomena. Let us take England. Its political economy belongs to the period in which the class struggle was as yet undeveloped. Its last great representative, Ricardo, in the end consciously makes the antagonism of class interests, of wages and profits, of profits and rent, the starting point of his investigations, naively taking this antagonism for a social law of nature. But by this start, the science of bourgeois economy had reached the limits beyond which it could not pass. Already in the lifetime of Ricardo, and in opposition to him, it was met by criticism in the person of Sismondi. The succeeding period, from 1820 to 1830, was notable in England for scientific activity in the domain of political economy. It was the time, as well, of the vulgarizing and extending of Ricardo's theory, as of the contest of that theory with the old school. Splendid tournaments were held. What was done then is little known to the continent generally, because the polemic is for the most part scattered through articles in reviews, occasional literature and pamphlets. The unprejudiced character of this polemic, although the theory of Ricardo already serves, in exceptional cases, as a weapon of attack upon bourgeois economy, is explained by the circumstances of the time. On the one hand, modern industry itself was only just emerging from the age of childhood, as is shown by the fact that with the crisis of 1825, it for the first time opens the periodic cycle of its modern life. On the other hand, the class struggle between capital and labour is forced into the background. Politically, 
by the discord between the governments and the feudal aristocracy gathered around the Holy Alliance on the one hand and the popular masses led by the bourgeoisie on the other. Economically, by the quarrel between industrial capital and aristocratic landed property, a quarrel that in France was concealed by the opposition between small and large landed property, and that in England broke out openly after the Corn Laws. The literature of political economy in England at this time calls to mind the stormy forward movement in France after Dr. Kesney's death, but only as a St. Martin's summer reminds us of spring. With the year 1830 came the decisive crisis. In France and in England, the bourgeoisie had conquered political power. Thenceforth, the class struggle, practically as well as theoretically, took on more and more outspoken and threatening forms. It sounded the knell of scientific bourgeois economy. It was thenceforth no longer a question whether this theorem or that was true, but whether it was useful to capital or harmful, expedient or inexpedient, politically dangerous or not. In place of disinterested inquirers, there were hired prize fighters. In place of genuine scientific research, the bad conscience and the evil intent of apologetic. Still, even the obtrusive pamphlets with which the Anti Corn Law League, led by the manufacturers Cobden and Bright, deluged the world, have a historic interest, if no scientific one on account of their polemic against the landed aristocracy. But since then the free trade legislation, inaugurated by Sir Robert Peel, has deprived vulgar economy of this its last sting. The Continental Revolution of 1848-9 also had its reaction in England. Men who still claimed some scientific standing and aspired to be something more than mere sophists and sycophants of the ruling classes tried to harmonize the political economy of capital with the claims no longer to be ignored of the proletariat. Hence a shallow syncretism of which John Stuart Mill is the best representative. It is a declaration of bankruptcy by bourgeois economy, an event on which the great Russian scholar and critic N. Chernichevsky has thrown the light of a mastermind in his Outlines of Political Economy According to Mill. In Germany, therefore, the capitalist mode of production came to a head after its antagonistic character had already, in France and England, shown itself in a fierce strife of classes. And meanwhile, moreover, the German proletariat had attained a much more clear class consciousness than the German bourgeoisie. Thus, at the very moment when a bourgeois science of political economy seemed at last possible in Germany, it had in reality again become impossible. Under these circumstances, its professors fell into two groups. The one set, prudent, practical business folk, flocked to the banner of Bastiat, the most superficial and therefore the most adequate representative of the apologetic of vulgar economy. The other, proud of the professorial dignity of their science, followed John Stuart Mill in his attempt to reconcile irreconcilables. Just as in the classical time of bourgeois economy, so also in the time of its decline, the Germans remained mere schoolboys, imitators and followers, petty retailers and hawkers in the service of the great foreign wholesale concern. The peculiar historical development of German society therefore forbids in that country all original work in bourgeois economy, but not the criticism of that economy. So far as such criticism represents a class, it can only represent the class whose vocation in history is the overthrow of the capitalist mode of production and the final abolition of all classes. 
the proletariat. The learned and unlearned spokesmen of the German bourgeoisie tried at first to kill Das Kapital by silence, as they had managed to do with my earlier writings. As soon as they found that these tactics no longer fitted in with the conditions of the time, they wrote, under pretense of criticizing my book, prescriptions for the tranquilization of the bourgeois mind. But they found in the workers' press, see, for example, Joseph Dietchen's articles in the Volkstadt, antagonists stronger than themselves, to whom, down to this very day, they owe a reply. Footnote, the mealy-mouthed babblers of German vulgar economy fell foul of the style of my book. No one can feel the literary shortcomings in Das Kapital more strongly than I myself. Yet I will, for the benefit and the enjoyment of these gentlemen and their public, quote in this connection one English and one Russian notice. The Saturday Review, always hostile to my views, said in its notice of the first edition, The presentation of the subject invests the driest economic questions with a certain peculiar charm. The St. Petersburg Journal, in its issue of April the 8th, 1872, says, The presentation of the subject, with the exception of one or two exceptionally special parts, is distinguished by its comprehensibility by the general reader, its clearness, and in spite of the scientific intricacy of the subject by an unusual liveliness. In this respect, the author in no way resembles the majority of German scholars who write their books in a language so dry and obscure in a language so dry and obscure that the heads of ordinary mortals are cracked by it. End of footnote. An excellent Russian translation of Das Kapital appeared in the spring of 1872. The edition of 3,000 copies is already nearly exhausted. As early as 1871, N. Sieber, professor of political economy in the University of Kiev, in his work David Ricardo's Theory of Value and of Capital, referred to my theory of value, of money, and of capital as in its fundamentals a necessary sequel to the teaching of Smith and Ricardo. That which astonishes the Western European in the reading of this excellent work is the author's consistent and firm grasp of the purely theoretical position. That the method employed in Das Kapital has been little understood is shown by the various conceptions, contradictory one to another, that have been formed of it. Thus, the Paris Revue Positiviste reproaches me in that, on the one hand, I treat economics metaphysically, and on the other hand, imagine, confine myself to the mere critical analysis of actual facts, instead of writing receipts, compted ones, for the cookshops of the future. In answer to the reproach re-metaphysics, Professor Sieber has it, in so far as it deals with actual theory, the method of Marx is the deductive method of the whole English school, a school whose failings and virtues are common to the best theoretic economists. M. Bloch, Les Théoriciens du Socialisme en Allemagne, 1872, makes the discovery that my method is analytic, and says, Par cet ouvrage, Monsieur Marx, se classe parmi les esprits analytiques les plus éminents. German reviews, of course, shriek out at Hegelian sophistics. The European messenger of St. Petersburg, in an article dealing exclusively with the method of Das Kapital, finds my method of inquiry severely realistic, but my method of presentation, unfortunately, German dialectical. It says, at first sight, if the judgment is based on the external form of the presentation of the subject, Marx is the most ideal of ideal philosophers, always in the German, that is, the bad sense of the word, 
but in point of fact he is infinitely more realistic than all his forerunners in the work of economic criticism. He can in no sense be called an idealist. I cannot answer the writer better than by the aid of a few extracts from his own criticism, which may interest some of my readers to whom the Russian original is inaccessible. After a quotation from the preface to my Criticism of Political Economy, Berlin, 1859, where I discuss the materialistic basis of my method, the writer goes on, The one thing which is of moment to Marx is to find the law of the phenomena with whose investigation he is concerned. And not only is that law of moment to him, which governs these phenomena in so far as they have a definite form and mutual connection within a given historical period, of still greater moment to him is the law of their variation, of their development, that is, of their transition from one form into another, from one series of connections into a different one. This law, once discovered, he investigates in detail the effects in which it manifests itself in social life. Consequently, Marx only troubles himself about one thing, to show, by rigid scientific investigation, the necessity of successive determinate orders of social conditions, and to establish, as impartially as possible, the facts that serve him for fundamental starting points. For this, it is quite enough if he proves, at the same time, both the necessity of the present order of things and the necessity of another order into which the first must inevitably pass over, and this all the same, whether men believe or do not believe it, whether they are conscious or unconscious of it. Marx treats the social movement as a process of natural history, governed by laws not only independent of human will, consciousness and intelligence, but rather, on the contrary, determining that will, consciousness, and intelligence. If in the history of civilization the conscious element plays a part so subordinate, then it is self-evident that a critical inquiry whose subject matter is civilization can, less than anything else, have for its basis any form of, or any result of, consciousness. That is to say, that not the idea but the material phenomenon alone can serve as its starting point. Such an inquiry will confine itself to the confrontation and the comparison of a fact, not with ideas as its starting point. Such an inquiry will confine itself to the confrontation and the comparison of a fact, not with ideas, but with another fact. For this inquiry, the one thing of moment is that both facts be investigated as accurately as possible, and that they actually form, each with respect to the other, different momenta of an evolution. But most important of all is the rigid analysis of the series of successions, of the sequences and concatenations in which the different stages of such an evolution present themselves. But it will be said, the general laws of economic life are one and the same, no matter whether they are applied to the present or the past. This, Marx directly denies. According to him, such abstract laws do not exist. On the contrary, in his opinion, every historical period has laws of its own. As soon as society has outlived a given period of development and is passing over from one given stage to another, it begins to be subject also to other laws. In a word, economic life offers us a phenomenon analogous to the history of evolution in other branches of biology. The old economists misunderstood the nature of economic laws when they likened them to the laws of physics and chemistry. A more thorough analysis of phenomena shows that social organisms differ among themselves as fundamentally as plants or animals. Nay, one and the same phenomenon falls under quite different laws in consequence of the different structure of those organisms as a whole, of the variations of their individual organs, of the different conditions in which those organs function, etc. Marx, for example, denies that the law of population is the same at all times and in all places, 
He asserts, on the contrary, that every stage of development has its own law of population. With the varying degree of development of productive power, social conditions and the laws governing them vary too. Whilst Marx sets himself the task of following and explaining from this point of view the economic system established by the sway of capital, he is only formulating, in a strictly scientific manner, the aim that every accurate investigation into economic life must have. The scientific value of such an inquiry lies in the disclosing of the special laws that regulate the origin, existence, development, death of a given social organism, and its replacement by another and higher one. And it is this value that, in point of fact, Marx's book has. Whilst the writer pictures what he takes to be actually my method in this striking and, as far as concerns my own application of it, generous way, what else is he picturing but the dialectic method? Of course, the method of presentation must differ in form from that of inquiry. The latter has to appropriate the material in detail, to analyse its different forms of development, to trace out their inner connection. Only after this work is done can the actual movement be adequately described. If this is done successfully, if the life of the subject matter is ideally reflected as in a mirror, then it may appear as if we had before us a mere a priori construction. My dialectic method is not only different from the Hegelian, but is its direct opposite. To Hegel, the life process of the human brain, that is, the process of thinking, which under the name of the idea he even transforms into an independent subject, is the demiurgos of the real world, and the real world is only the external phenomenal form of the idea. With me, on the contrary, the ideal is nothing else than the material world reflected by the human mind and translated into forms of thought. The mystifying side of Hegelian dialectic I criticized nearly thirty years ago, at a time when it was still the fashion. But just as I was working at the first volume of Das Kapital, it was the good pleasure of the peevish, arrogant, mediocre epigons, Buchner, During, and others, who now talk large in cultured Germany, to treat Hegel in the same way as the brave Moses Mendelssohn in Lessing's time treated Spinoza, that is, as a dead dog. I therefore openly avowed myself the pupil of that mighty thinker, and even here and there, in the chapter on the theory of value, coquetted with the modes of expression peculiar to him. The mystification which dialectic suffers in Hegel's hands by no means prevents him from being the first to present its general form of working in a comprehensive and conscious manner. With him it is standing on its head. It must be turned right side up again if you would discover the rational kernel within the mystical shell. In its mystified form, dialectic became the fashion in Germany because it seemed to transfigure and to glorify the existing state of things. In its rational form, it is a scandal and abomination to bourgeoisdom and its doctrinaire professors because it includes in its comprehension and affirmative recognition of the existing state of things at the same time also the recognition of the negation of that state, of its inevitable breaking up, because it regards every historically developed social form as in fluid movement, and therefore takes into account its transient nature not less than its momentary existence, because it lets nothing impose upon it, and is in its essence critical and revolutionary. The contradictions inherent in the movement of capitalist society impress themselves upon the practical bourgeois most strikingly in the changes of the periodic cycle through which modern industry runs and whose crowning point is the universal crisis. That crisis is once again approaching, although as yet but in its preliminary stage, and by the universality of its theatre 
and the intensity of its action, it will drum dialectics even into the heads of the mushroom upstarts of the new holy Prusso-German Empire. Karl Marx, London, January the 24th, 1873. Commodities and Money Chapter 1 Commodities Section 1 The Two Factors of a Commodity Use Value and Value The Substance of Value and the Magnitude of Value The wealth of those societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails presents itself as an immense accumulation of commodities, its unit being a single commodity. Our investigation must therefore begin with the analysis of a commodity. A commodity is, in the first place, an object outside us, a thing that by its properties satisfies human wants of some sort or another. The nature of such wants, whether, for instance, they spring from the stomach or from fancy, makes no difference. Neither are we here concerned to know how the object satisfies these wants, whether directly as means of subsistence or indirectly as means of production. Footnote. Desire implies want. It is the appetite of the mind, and as natural as hunger to the body. The greatest number of things have their value from supplying the wants of the mind. Nicolas Barbon, A Discourse Concerning Coining the New Money Lighter, In Answer to Mr. Locke's Considerations, etc. London, 1696. End of footnote. Every useful thing, as iron, paper, etc., may be looked at from the two points of view of quality and quantity. It is an assemblage of many properties, and may therefore be of use in various ways. To discover the various uses of things is the work of history. So also is the establishment of socially recognized standards of measure for the quantities of these useful objects. The diversity of these measures has its origin partly in the diverse nature of the objects to be measured, partly in convention. Footnote Things have an intrinsic virtue, this is Barbon's special term for value in use, which in all places have the same virtue, as the lodestone to attract iron. The property which the magnet possesses of attracting iron became of use only after, by means of that property, the polarity of the magnet had been discovered. End of footnote. The utility of a thing makes it a use-value. Footnote. The natural worth of anything consists in its fitness to supply the necessities or serve the conveniences of human life. John Locke. Some Considerations on the Consequences of the Lowering of Interest. 1691. In English writers of the 17th century, we frequently find worth in the sense of value in use, and value in the sense of exchange value. This is quite in accordance with the spirit of a language that likes to use a Teutonic word for the actual thing, and a Romance word for its reflection. End of footnote. But this utility is not a thing of air. Being limited by the physical properties of the commodity, it has no existence apart from that commodity. A commodity, such as iron, corn, or a diamond, is therefore, so far as it is a material thing, a use-value, something useful. This property of a commodity is independent of the amount of labor required to appropriate its useful qualities. When treating of use-value, we always assume to be dealing with definite quantities, such as dozens of watches, yards of linen, or tons of iron. The use-values of commodities furnish the material for a special study, 
that of the commercial knowledge of commodities. Footnote. In bourgeois societies, the economic fictio juris prevails, that everyone, as a buyer, possesses an encyclopedic knowledge of commodities. End of footnote. Use values become a reality only by use or consumption. They also constitute the substance of all wealth, whatever may be the social form of that wealth. In the form of society we are about to consider, they are, in addition, the material depositories of exchange value. Exchange value, at first sight, presents itself as a quantitative relation, as the proportion in which values in use of one sort are exchanged for those of another sort, a relation constantly changing with time and place. Footnote. Value consists in the exchange relation between one thing and another, between a given amount of one product and a given amount of another. Le Trône De l'intérêt social Physiocrates Paris, 1846 End of footnote Hence, exchange value appears to be something accidental and purely relative, and consequently an intrinsic value. That is, an exchange value that is inseparably connected with inherent in commodities, seems a contradiction in terms. Footnote. Nothing can have an intrinsic value. N. Barbon. Or, Butler says, the value of a thing is just as much as it will bring. Let us consider the matter a little more closely. A given commodity, for example, a quarter of wheat, is exchanged for X blacking, Y silk, or Z gold, etc., in short, for other commodities in the most different proportions. Instead of one exchange value, the wheat has, therefore, a great many. But since X blacking, Y silk, or Z gold, etc., each represents the exchange value of one quarter of wheat, X blacking, Y silk, Z gold, etc., must, as exchange values, be replaceable by each other, or equal to each other. Therefore, first, the valid exchange values of a given commodity express something equal. Secondly, exchange value, generally, is only the mode of expression, the phenomenal form, of something contained in it, yet distinguishable from it. Let us take two commodities, for example, corn and iron. The proportions in which they are exchangeable, whatever those proportions may be, can always be represented by an equation in which a given quantity of corn is equated to some quantity of iron. For example, one quarter of corn equals X hundredweight of iron. What does this equation tell us? It tells us that in two different things, in one quarter of corn and X hundredweight of iron, there exists in equal quantities something common to both. The two things must therefore be equal to a third, which in itself is neither the one nor the other. Each of them, so far as it is exchange value, must therefore be reducible to this third. A simple geometrical illustration will make this clear. In order to calculate and compare the areas of rectilinear figures, we decompose them into triangles. But the area of the triangle itself is expressed by something totally different from its visible figure, namely, by half the product of the base multiplied by the altitude. In the same way, the exchange values of commodities must be capable of being expressed in terms of something common to them all, of which thing they represent a greater or less quantity. This common something cannot be either a geometrical, a chemical, 
or any other natural property of commodities. Such properties claim our attention only in so far as they affect the utility of those commodities, make them use values. But the exchange of commodities is evidently an act characterized by a total abstraction from use value. Then, one use value is just as good as another, provided only it be present in sufficient quantity. Or, as old Barbon says, one sort of wares are as good as another. If the values be equal, there is no difference or distinction in things of equal value. An hundred pounds worth of lead or iron is of as great value as one hundred pounds worth of silver or gold. As use values, commodities are, above all, of different qualities. But as exchange values, they are merely different quantities, and consequently do not contain an atom of use value. If, then, we leave out of consideration the use value of commodities, they have only one common property left, that of being products of labor. But even the product of labor itself has undergone a change in our hands. If we make abstraction from its use value, we make abstraction at the same time from the material elements and shapes that make the product a use value. We see in it no longer a table, a house, yarn, or any other useful thing. Its existence as a material thing is put out of sight. Neither can it any longer be regarded as the product of the labor of the joiner, the mason, the spinner, or of any other definite kind of productive labor. Along with the useful qualities of the products themselves, we put out of sight both the useful character of the various kinds of labor embodied in them and the concrete forms of that labor. There is nothing left but what is common to them all. All are reduced to one and the same sort of labor, human labor, in the abstract. Let us now consider the residue of each of these products. It consists of the same unsubstantial reality in each, a mere congelation of homogeneous human labor, of labor power expended without regard to the mode of its expenditure. All that these things now tell us is that human labor power has been expended in their production, that human labor is embodied in them. When looked at as crystals of this social substance, common to them all, they are values. We have seen that when commodities are exchanged, their exchange value manifests itself as something totally independent of their use value. But if we abstract from their use value, there remains their value, as defined above. Therefore, the common substance that manifests itself in the exchange value of commodities whenever they are exchanged is their value. The progress of our investigation will show that exchange value is the only form in which the value of commodities can manifest itself or be expressed. For the present, however, we have to consider the nature of value independently of this its form. A use value, or useful article, therefore, has value only because human labor in the abstract has been embodied or materialized in it. How, then, is the magnitude of this value to be measured? Plainly by the quantity of the value-creating substance, the labor contained in the article. The quantity of labor, however, is measured by its duration, and labor time, in its turn, finds its standard in weeks, days and hours. Some people might think that if the value of a commodity is determined by the quantity of labor spent on it, the more idle and unskillful the laborer, the more valuable would his commodity be, because more time would be required in its production. The labor, however, that forms the substance of value is homogeneous human labor, 
expenditure of one uniform labor power. The total labor power of society, which is embodied in the sum total of the values of all commodities produced by that society, counts here as one homogeneous mass of human labor power, composed though it be of innumerable individual units. Each of these units is the same as any other, so far as it has the character of the average labor power of society, and takes effect as such. That is, so far as it requires for producing a commodity no more time than is needed on an average, no more than is socially necessary. The labor time, socially necessary, is that required to produce an article under the normal conditions of production and with the average degree of skill and intensity prevalent at the time. The introduction of power looms into England probably reduced by one half the labor required to weave a given quantity of yarn into cloth. The hand loom weavers, as a matter of fact, continued to require the same time as before, but for all that, the product of one hour of their labor represented after the change only half an hour's social labor, and consequently fell to one half its former value. We see, then, that that which determines the magnitude of the value of any article is the amount of labor socially necessary, or the labor time socially necessary for its production. Footnote. The value of them, the necessaries of life, when they are exchanged, the one for another, is regulated by the quantity of labor necessarily required and commonly taken in producing them. Some thoughts on the interest of money in general, and particularly in the public funds, etc. This remarkable anonymous work, written in the last century, bears no date. It is clear, however, from internal evidence, that it appeared in the reign of George II, about 1739 or 1740. End of footnote. Each individual commodity, in this connection, is to be considered as an average sample of its class. Footnote. Properly speaking, all products of the same kind form a single mass and their price is determined in general and without regard to particular circumstances. Le Trône End of footnote Commodities, therefore, in which equal quantities of labor are embodied, or which can be produced in the same time, have the same value. The value of one commodity is to the value of any other, as the labor time necessary for the production of the one is to that necessary for the production of the other. As values, all commodities are only definite masses of congealed labor time. The value of a commodity would therefore remain constant if the labor time required for its production also remained constant but the latter changes with every variation in the productiveness of labor. This productiveness is determined by various circumstances, amongst others by the average amount of skill of the workmen, the state of science, and the degree of its practical application, the social organization of production, the extent and capabilities of the means of production, and by physical conditions. For example, the same amount of labor in favorable seasons is embodied in eight bushels of corn, and in unfavorable, only in four. The same labor extracts from rich mines more metal than from poor mines. Diamonds are of very rare occurrence on the Earth's surface, and hence their discovery costs on average a great deal of labor time. Consequently, much labor is represented in a small compass. Jacob doubts whether gold has ever been paid for at its full value. This applies still more to diamonds. According to Eschwege, the total produce of the Brazilian diamond mines for the 80 years ending in 1823 
had not realized the price of one and a half years' average produce of the sugar and coffee plantations of the same country, although the diamonds cost much more labor and therefore represented more value. With richer mines, the same quantity of labor would embody itself in more diamonds, and their value would fall. If we could succeed at a small expenditure of labor in converting carbon into diamonds, their value might fall below that of bricks. In general, the greater the productiveness of labor, the less is the labor time required for the production of an article, the less is the amount of labor crystallized in that article, and the less is its value. And vice versa. The less the productiveness of labor, the greater is the labor time required for the production of an article, and the greater is its value. The value of a commodity, therefore, varies directly as the quantity, and inversely as the productiveness of the labor incorporated in it. A thing can be a use value without having a value. This is the case whenever its utility to man is not due to labor. Such are air, virgin soil, natural meadows, etc. A thing can be useful and the product of human labor without being a commodity. Whoever directly satisfies his wants with the produce of his own labor creates indeed use values but not commodities. In order to produce the latter, he must not only produce use values, but use values for others, social use values. And not only for others without more, the medieval peasant produced quit-rent corn for his feudal lord and tithe corn for his parson, but neither the quit-rent corn nor the tithe corn became commodities by reason of the fact that they had been produced for others. To become a commodity, a product must be transferred to another, whom it will serve as a use value by means of an exchange. Lastly, nothing can have value without being an object of utility. If the thing is useless, so is the labor contained in it. The labor does not count as labor, and therefore creates no value. Section 2. The Twofold Character of the Labor Embodied in Commodities At first sight, a commodity presented itself to us as a complex of two things, use value and exchange value. Later on, we saw also that labor too possesses the same twofold nature. For, so far as it finds expression in value, it does not possess the same characteristics that belong to it as a creator of use values. I was the first to point out and to examine critically this twofold nature of the labor contained in commodities. As this point is the pivot on which a clear comprehension of political economy turns, we must go more into detail. Let us take two commodities, such as a coat and ten yards of linen, and let the former be double the value of the latter, so that if ten yards of linen equals W, the coat equals two W. The coat is a use value that satisfies a particular want. Its existence is the result of a special sort of productive activity, the nature of which is determined by its aim, mode of operation, subject, means, and result. The labor, whose utility is thus represented by the value in use of its product, or which manifests itself by making its product a use value, we call useful labor. In this connection, we consider only its useful effect. As the coat and the linen are two qualitatively different use values, so also are the two forms of labor that produce them, tailoring and weaving. Were these two objects not qualitatively different, 
not produced respectively by labour of different quality, they could not stand to each other in the relation of commodities. Coats are not exchanged for coats. One use value is not exchanged for another of the same kind. To all the different varieties of values in use, there correspond as many different kinds of useful labour, classified according to the order, genus, species, and variety to which they belong in the social division of labour. This division of labour is a necessary condition for the production of commodities, but it does not follow conversely that the production of commodities is a necessary condition for the division of labour. In the primitive Indian community there is social division of labour without production of commodities. Or, to take an example nearer home, in every factory the labour is divided according to a system, but this division is not brought about by the operatives mutually exchanging their individual products. Only such products can become commodities with regard to each other as a result from different kinds of labour, each kind being carried on independently and for the account of private individuals. To resume, then. In the use value of each commodity there is contained useful labour, that is, productive activity of a definite kind and exercised with a definite aim. Use values cannot confront each other as commodities unless the useful labour embodied in them is qualitatively different in each of them. In a community, the produce of which in general takes the form of commodities, that is, in a community of commodity producers, this qualitative difference between the useful forms of labour that are carried on independently by individual producers, each on their own account, develops into a complex system, a social division of labour. Anyhow, whether the coat be worn by the tailor or by his customer, in either case it operates as a use value. Nor is the relation between the coat and the labour that produced it altered by the circumstance that tailoring may have become a special trade, an independent branch of the social division of labour. Wherever the want of clothing forced them to it, the human race made clothes for thousands of years without a single man becoming a tailor. But coats and linen, like every other element of material wealth that is not the spontaneous produce of nature, must invariably owe their existence to a special productive activity, exercised with a definite aim, an activity that appropriates particular nature-given materials to particular human wants. So far, therefore, as labour is a creator of use-value, is useful labour, it is a necessary condition, independent of all forms of society, for the existence of the human race. It is an eternal nature-imposed necessity, without which there can be no material exchanges between man and nature, and therefore no life. The use values, coat, linen, etc., that is, the bodies of commodities, are combinations of two elements, matter and labour. If we take away the useful labour expended upon them, a material substratum is always left, which is furnished by nature without the help of man. The latter can work only as nature does, that is, by changing the form of matter. Footnote. All the phenomena of the universe, whether produced by the hand of man or through the universal laws of physics, are not actual new creations, but merely a modification of matter. Joining together and separating are the only elements which the human mind always finds on analysing the concept of reproduction, and it is just the same with the reproduction of value. Value in use, although very, in this passage of his controversy with the physiocrats, is not himself quite certain of the kind of value he is speaking of. And of wealth, 
when earth, air, and water in the fields are transformed into corn, or when the hand of man transforms the secretions of an insect into silk, or some pieces of metal are arranged to make the mechanism of a watch. Pietro Veri, Meditazione sulla Economia Politica, first printed in 1773, in Custodi's edition of the Italian Economists, Parte Moderna. End of footnote. Nay, more, in this work of changing the form, he is constantly helped by natural forces. We see, then, that labour is not the only source of material wealth, of use values produced by labour. As William Petty puts it, labour is its father and the earth its mother. Let us now pass from the commodity considered as a use value to the value of commodities. By our assumption, the coat is worth twice as much as the linen. But this is a mere quantitative difference, which for the present does not concern us. We bear in mind, however, that if the value of the coat is double that of ten yards of linen, twenty yards of linen must have the same value as one coat. So far as they are values, the coat and the linen are things of a like substance, objective expressions of essentially identical labour. But tailoring and weaving are, qualitatively, different kinds of labour. There are, however, states of society in which one and the same man does tailoring and weaving alternately, in which case these two forms of labour are mere modifications of the labour of the same individual, and not special and fixed functions of different persons, just as the coat which our tailor makes one day, and the trousers which he makes another day, imply only a variation in the labour of one and the same individual. Moreover, we see at a glance that, in our capitalist society, a given portion of human labour is, in accordance with the varying demand, at one time supplied in the form of tailoring, at another in the form of weaving. This change may possibly not take place without friction, but take place it must. Productive activity, if we leave out of sight its special form, viz. the useful character of the labour, is nothing but the expenditure of human labour power. Tailoring and weaving, though qualitatively different productive activities, are each a productive expenditure of human brains, nerves and muscles, and in this sense are human labour. They are but two different modes of expending human labour power. Of course, this labour power, which remains the same under all its modifications, must have attained a certain pitch of development before it can be expended in a multiplicity of modes, but the value of a commodity represents human labour in the abstract, the expenditure of human labour in general. And just as in society a general or a banker plays a great part, but mere man, on the other hand, a very shabby part, so here with mere human labour. It is the expenditure of simple labour power, that is, of the labour power which, on an average, apart from any special development, exists in the organism of every ordinary individual. Simple, average labour, it is true varies in character in different countries and at different times, but in a particular society it is given. Skilled labour counts only as simple labour intensified, or rather as multiplied simple labour, a given quantity of skilled being considered equal to a greater quantity of simple labour. Experience shows that this reduction is constantly being made. A commodity may be the product of the most skilled labour, but its value, by equating it to the product of simple unskilled labour, represents a definite quantity of the latter labour alone. Footnote. The reader must note that we are not speaking here of the wages or value that the labourer gets for a given labour time, but of the value of the commodity in which that labour time is materialised. Wages is a category that, as yet, has no existence at the present stage of our investigation. End of footnote. 
The different proportions in which different sorts of labour are reduced to unskilled labour as their standard are established by a social process that goes on behind the backs of the producers and consequently appear to be fixed by custom. For simplicity's sake, we shall henceforth account every kind of labour to be unskilled simple labour. By this we do no more than save ourselves the trouble of making the reduction. Just as, therefore, in viewing the coat and linen as values, we abstract from their different use values, so it is with the labour represented by those values. We disregard the difference between its useful forms, weaving and tailoring. As the use values coat and linen are combinations of special productive activities with cloth and yarn, while the values coat and linen are, on the other hand, mere homogeneous congelations of undifferentiated labour, so the labour embodied in these latter values does not count by virtue of its productive relation to cloth and yarn, but only as being expenditure of human labour power. Tailoring and weaving are necessary factors in the creation of the use values coat and linen, precisely because these two kinds of labour are of different qualities. But only in so far as abstraction is made from their special qualities, only in so far as both possess the same quality of being human labour, do tailoring and weaving form the substance of the values of the same articles. Coats and linen, however, are not merely values, but values of definite magnitude. And according to our assumption, the coat is worth twice as much as the ten yards of linen. Whence this difference in their values? It is owing to the fact that the linen contains only half as much labour as the coat, and consequently that in the production of the latter, labour power must have been expended during twice the time necessary for the production of the former. While, therefore, with reference to use value, the labour contained in a commodity counts only qualitatively, with reference to value it counts only quantitatively, and must first be reduced to human labour pure and simple. In the former case, it is a question of how and what. In the latter, of how much, how long a time. Since the magnitude of the value of a commodity represents only the quantity of labour embodied in it, it follows that all commodities, when taken in certain proportions, must be equal in value. If the productive power of all the different sorts of useful labour required for the production of a coat remains unchanged, the sum of the values of coats produced increases with their number. If one coat represents X days' labour, two coats represent two X days' labour, and so on. But assume that the duration of the labour necessary for the production of a coat becomes doubled or halved. In the first case, one coat is worth as much as two coats were before. In the second case, two coats are only worth as much as one was before, although in both cases one coat renders the same service as before, and the useful labour embodied in it remains of the same quality, but the quantity of labour spent on its production has altered. An increase in the quantity of use values is an increase of material wealth. With two coats, two men can be clothed. With one coat, only one man. Nevertheless, an increased quantity of material wealth may correspond to a simultaneous fall in the magnitude of its value. This antagonistic movement has its origin in the twofold character of labour. Productive power has reference, of course, only to labour of some useful concrete form. The efficacy of any special productive activity during a given time being dependent on its productiveness. Useful labour becomes, therefore, a more or less abundant source of products in proportion to the rise or fall of its productiveness. On the other hand, no change in this productiveness affects the labour represented by value. Since productive power is an attribute of the concrete useful forms of labour, 
of course it can no longer have any bearing on that labor, so soon as we make abstraction from those concrete useful forms. However then productive power may vary, the same labor, exercised during equal periods of time, always yields equal amounts of value. But it will yield, during equal periods of time, different quantities of values in use. More, if the productive power rise, fewer, if it fall. The same change in productive power, which increases the fruitfulness of labor and, in consequence, the quantity of use values produced by that labor, will diminish the total value of this increased quantity of use values, provided such change shorten the total labor time necessary for their production, and vice versa. On the one hand, all labor is, speaking physiologically, an expenditure of human labor power, and in its character of identical abstract human labor, it creates and forms the value of commodities. On the other hand, all labor is the expenditure of human labor power in a special form and with a definite aim, and in this, its character of concrete useful labor, it produces use values. In order to prove that labor alone is that all-sufficient and real measure, by which at all times the value of all commodities can be estimated and compared, Adam Smith says, Equal quantities of labor must at all times and in all places have the same value for the laborer. In his normal state of health, strength, and activity, and with the average degree of skill that he may possess, he must always give up the same portion of his rest, his freedom, and his happiness. Wealth of Nations On the one hand, Adam Smith here, but not everywhere, confuses the determination of value by means of the quantity of labor expended in the production of commodities with the determination of the values of commodities by means of the value of labor, and seeks in consequence to prove that equal quantities of labor have always the same value. On the other hand, he has a presentiment that labor so far as it manifests itself in the value of commodities, counts only as expenditure of labor power. But he treats this expenditure as the mere sacrifice of rest, freedom, and happiness, not as at the same time the normal activity of living beings. But then he has the modern wage laborer in his eye. Much more aptly, the anonymous predecessor of Adam Smith quoted before in this chapter, says, One man has employed himself a week in providing this necessary of life, and he that gives him some other in exchange cannot make a better estimate of what is a proper equivalent than by computing what cost him just as much labor and time, which in effect is no more than exchanging one man's labor in one thing for a time certain, for another man's labor in another thing, for the same time. The English language has the advantage of possessing different words for the two aspects of labor here considered. The labor which creates use value and counts qualitatively is work, as distinguished from labor. That which creates value and counts quantitatively is labor as distinguished from work. Engels End of footnote. The form of value or exchange value. Commodities come into the world in the shape of use values, articles or goods, such as iron, linen, corn, etc. This is their plain, homely, bodily form. They are, however, commodities only because they are something twofold, both objects of utility and at the same time depositories of value. They manifest themselves, therefore, as commodities, or have the form of commodities, only in so far as they have two forms, a physical or natural form, and a value form. The reality of the value of commodities differs in this respect from Dame Quickly, that we don't know where to have it.
The value of commodities is the very opposite of the coarse materiality of their substance. Not an atom of matter enters into its composition. Turn and examine a single commodity by itself as we will, yet in so far as it remains an object of value, it seems impossible to grasp it. If, however, we bear in mind that the value of commodities has a purely social reality, and that they acquire this reality only in so far as they are expressions or embodiments of one identical social substance, viz. human labor, it follows, as a matter of course, that value can only manifest itself in the social relation of commodity to commodity. In fact, we started from exchange value, or the exchange relation of commodities, in order to get at the value that lies hidden behind it. We must now return to this form under which value first appeared to us. Everyone knows, if he knows nothing else, that commodities have a value form common to them all, and presenting a marked contrast with the varied bodily forms of their use values. I mean their money form. Here, however, a task is set us, the performance of which has never yet even been attempted by bourgeois economy. The task of tracing the genesis of this money form, of developing the expression of value implied in the value relation of commodities, from its simplest, almost imperceptible outline to the dazzling money form. By doing this, we shall, at the same time, solve the riddle presented by money. The simplest value relation is evidently that of one commodity to some one other commodity of a different kind. Hence, the relation between the values of two commodities supplies us with the simplest expression of the value of a single commodity. A. Elementary or accidental form of value. X commodity A equals Y commodity B, or X commodity A is worth Y commodity B. 20 yards of linen equals one coat, or 20 yards of linen are worth one coat. 1. The two poles of the expression of value, relative form and equivalent form. The whole mystery of the form of value lies hidden in this elementary form. Its analysis, therefore, is our real difficulty. Here, two different kinds of commodities, in our example the linen and the coat, evidently play two different parts. The linen expresses its value in the coat. The coat serves as the material in which that value is expressed. The former plays an active the latter a passive part. The value of the linen is represented as relative value, or appears in relative form. The coat officiates as equivalent, or appears in equivalent form. The relative form and the equivalent form are two intimately connected, mutually dependent and inseparable elements of the expression of value, but at the same time are mutually exclusive antagonistic extremes, that is, poles of the same expression. They are allotted respectively to the two different commodities brought into relation by that expression. It is not possible to express the value of linen in linen. Twenty yards of linen equals twenty yards of linen is no expression of value. On the contrary, such an equation merely says that twenty yards of linen are nothing else than twenty yards of linen, a definite quantity of the use value linen. The value of the linen can therefore be expressed only relatively, that is, in some other commodity. The relative form of the value of the linen presupposes, therefore, the presence of some other commodity, here the coat, under the form of an equivalent. On the other hand, the commodity that figures as the equivalent cannot at the same time assume the relative form. That second commodity is not the one whose value is expressed. 
Its function is merely to serve as the material in which the value of the first commodity is expressed. No doubt, the expression 20 yards of linen equals one coat or 20 yards of linen are worth one coat implies the opposite relation. One coat equals 20 yards of linen or one coat is worth 20 yards of linen. But in that case, I must reverse the equation in order to express the value of the coat relatively. And so soon as I do that, the linen becomes the equivalent instead of the coat. A single commodity cannot therefore simultaneously assume in the same expression of value both forms. The very polarity of these forms makes them mutually exclusive. Whether, then, a commodity assumes the relative form or the opposite equivalent form depends entirely upon its accidental position in the expression of value. That is, upon whether it is the commodity whose value is being expressed or the commodity in which value is being expressed. 2. The Relative Form of Value A. The Nature and Import of This Form In order to discover how the elementary expression of the value of a commodity lies hidden in the value relation of two commodities, we must, in the first place, Consider the latter entirely apart from its quantitative aspect. The usual mode of procedure is generally the reverse, and in the value relation nothing is seen but the proportion between definite quantities of two different sorts of commodities that are considered equal to each other. It is apt to be forgotten that the magnitudes of different things can be compared quantitatively only when those magnitudes are expressed in terms of the same unit. It is only as expressions of such a unit that they are of the same denomination and therefore commensurable. Footnote. The few economists, amongst whom is S. Bailey, who have occupied themselves with the analysis of the form of value, have been unable to arrive at any result. First, because they confuse the form of value with value itself, and second, because under the coarse influence of the practical bourgeois, they exclusively give their attention to the quantitative aspect of the question. The command of quantity constitutes value. Money and its vicissitudes. London, 1837, by S. Bailey. End of footnote. Whether 20 yards of linen equals one coat, or equals 20 coats, or equals X coats, that is, whether a given quantity of linen is worth few or many coats, every such statement implies that the linen and coats, as magnitudes of value, are expressions of the same unit, things of the same kind. Linen equals coat is the basis of the equation. But the two commodities, whose identity of quality is thus assumed, do not play the same part. It is only the value of the linen that is expressed. And how? By its reference to the coat as its equivalent, as something that can be exchanged for it. In this relation, the coat is the mode of existence of value, is value embodied. For only as such is it the same as the linen. On the other hand, the linen's own value comes to the front, receives independent expression, for it is only as being value that it is comparable with the coat as a thing of equal value, or exchangeable with the coat. To borrow an illustration from chemistry, butyric acid is a different substance from propyl formate, yet both are made up of the same chemical substances carbon, C, hydrogen, H, and oxygen, O, and that, too, in like proportions, namely C4H8O2. If now we equate butyric acid to propyl formate, then, in the first place, propyl formate would be, in this relation, merely a form of existence of C4H8O2, and in the second place, we should be stating that butyric acid also consists of C4H8O2. Therefore, by thus equating the two substances, 
expression would be given to their chemical composition, while their different physical forms would be neglected. If we say that, as values, commodities are mere congelations of human labor, we reduce them by our analysis, it is true, to the abstraction value. But we ascribe to this value no form apart from their bodily form. It is otherwise in the value relation of one commodity to another. Here, the one stands forth in its character of value by reason of its relation to the other. By making the coat the equivalent of the linen, we equate the labor embodied in the former to that in the latter. Now, it is true that the tailoring which makes the coat is concrete labor of a different sort from the weaving which makes the linen. But the act of equating it to the weaving reduces the tailoring to that which is really equal in the two kinds of labor to their common character of human labor. In this roundabout way, then, the fact is expressed that weaving also, in so far as it weaves value, has nothing to distinguish it from tailoring, and consequently is abstract human labor. It is the expression of equivalence between different sorts of commodities that alone brings into relief the specific character of value-creating labor, and this it does by actually reducing the different varieties of labor embodied in the different kinds of commodities to their common quality of human labor in the abstract. Footnote. The celebrated Franklin, one of the first economists, after William Petty, who saw through the nature of value, says, Trade in general being nothing else but the exchange of labor for labor, the value of all things is, most justly, measured by labor. The works of B. Franklin, etc., edited by Sparks, Boston, 1836. Franklin is unconscious that by estimating the value of everything in labor, he makes abstraction from any difference in the sorts of labor exchanged, and thus reduces them all to equal human labor. But although ignorant of this, yet he says it. He speaks first of the one labor, then of the other labor, and finally of labor, without further qualification, as the substance of the value of everything. End of footnote. There is, however, something else required beyond the expression of the specific character of the labor of which the value of the linen consists. Human labor power in motion, or human labor, creates value, but is not itself value. It becomes value only in its congealed state, when embodied in the form of some object. In order to express the value of the linen as a congelation of human labor, that value must be expressed as having objective existence, as being a something materially different from the linen itself, and yet a something common to the linen and all other commodities. The problem is already solved. When occupying the position of equivalent in the equation of value, the coat ranks qualitatively as the equal of the linen, as something of the same kind, because it is value. In this position, it is a thing in which we see nothing but value, or whose palpable bodily form represents value. Yet the coat itself, the body of the commodity coat, is a mere use value. A coat, as such, no more tells us it is value than does the first piece of linen we take hold of. This shows that when placed in value relation to the linen, the coat signifies more than when out of that relation, just as many a man strutting about in a gorgeous uniform counts for more than when in mufti. In the production of the coat, human labor power in the shape of tailoring must have been actually expended. Human labor is therefore accumulated in it. In this aspect, the coat is a depository of value, but though worn to a thread, it does not let this fact show through. And as equivalent of the linen in the value equation, 
It exists under this aspect alone, counts therefore as embodied value, as a body that is value. A, for instance, cannot be your majesty to B, unless at the same time majesty in B's eyes assumes the bodily form of A. And, what is more, with every new father of the people, changes its features, hair, and many other things besides. Hence, in the value equation in which the coat is the equivalent of the linen, the coat officiates as the form of value. The value of the commodity linen is expressed by the bodily form of the commodity coat, the value of one by the use value of the other. As a use value, the linen is something palpably different from the coat. As value, it is the same as the coat, and now has the appearance of a coat. Thus the linen acquires a value form different from its physical form. The fact that it is value is made manifest by its equality with the coat, just as the sheep's nature of a Christian is shown in his resemblance to the Lamb of God. We see, then, all that our analysis of the value of commodities has already told us is told us by the linen itself, so soon as it comes into communication with another commodity, the coat. Only it betrays its thoughts in that language with which it alone is familiar, the language of commodities. In order to tell us that its own value is created by labor in its abstract character of human labor, it says that the coat, in so far as it is worth as much as the linen, and therefore is value, consists of the same labor as the linen. In order to inform us that its sublime reality as value is not the same as its buckram body, it says that value has the appearance of a coat, and consequently that so far as the linen is value, it and the coat are as like as two peas. We may here remark that the language of commodities has, besides Hebrew, many other more or less correct dialects. The German Wertsein, to be worth, for instance, expresses in a less striking manner than the Romance verbs valere, vale, valoir, that the equating of commodity B to commodity A is commodity A's own mode of expressing its value. Paris vaut bien une messe. Paris is certainly worth a mass. By means, therefore, of the value relation expressed in our equation, the bodily form of commodity B becomes the value form of commodity A, or the body of commodity B acts as a mirror to the value of commodity A. Footnote. In a sort of way, it is with man as with commodities. Since he comes into the world neither with a looking-glass in his hand, nor as a Fichtean philosopher to whom I am I is sufficient, man first sees and recognizes himself in other men. Peter only establishes his own identity as a man by first comparing himself with Paul as being of like kind and thereby Paul, just as he stands in his Pauline personality, becomes to Peter the type of the genus Homo. End of footnote. By putting itself in relation with commodity B, as value in propria persona, as the matter of which human labor is made up, the commodity A converts the value in use B into the substance in which to express its, A's, own value. The value of A, thus expressed in the use value of B, has taken the form of relative value. B. Quantitative Determination of Relative Value Every commodity, whose value it is intended to express, is a useful object of given quantity as fifteen bushels of corn, or one hundred pounds of coffee. And a given quantity of any commodity contains a definite quantity of human labor, 
The value form must therefore not only express value generally, but also value in definite quantity. Therefore, in the value relation of commodity A to commodity B, of the linen to the coat, not only is the latter as value in general made the equal in quality of the linen, but a definite quantity of coat, one coat, is made the equivalent of a definite quantity, 20 yards, of linen. The equation 20 yards of linen equals one coat, or 20 yards of linen are worth one coat, implies that the same quantity of value substance, congealed labor, is embodied in both, that the two commodities have each cost the same amount of labor of the same quantity of labor time. But the labor time necessary for the production of 20 yards of linen, or one coat, varies with every change in the productiveness of weaving or tailoring. We have now to consider the influence of such changes on the quantitative aspect of the relative expression of value. 1. Let the value of the linen vary, that of the coat remain constant. Footnote. Value is here, as occasionally in the preceding pages, used in sense of value determined as to quantity or of magnitude of value. End of footnote. If, say, in consequence of the exhaustion of flax-growing soil, the labor time necessary for the production of the linen be doubled, the value of the linen will also be doubled. Instead of the equation 20 yards of linen equals one coat, we should have 20 yards of linen equals two coats, since one coat would now contain only half the labor time, embodied in 20 yards of linen. If, on the other hand, in consequence, say, of improved looms, this labor time be reduced by one half, the value of the linen would fall by one half. Consequently, we should have 20 yards of linen equals half a coat. The relative value of commodity A, that is, its value expressed in commodity B, rises and falls directly as the value of A, the value of B being supposed constant. 2. Let the value of the linen remain constant while the value of the coat varies. If, under these circumstances, in consequence, for instance, of a poor crop of wool, the labor time necessary for the production of a coat becomes doubled, we have instead of 20 yards of linen equals one coat, 20 yards of linen equals half a coat. If, on the other hand, the value of the coat sinks by one half, then 20 yards of linen equals two coats. Hence, if the value of commodity A remain constant, its relative value expressed in commodity B rises and falls inversely as the value of B. If we compare the different cases in 1 and 2, we see that the same change of magnitude in relative value may arise from totally opposite causes. Thus, the equation 20 yards of linen equals one coat becomes 20 yards of linen equals two coats, either because the value of the linen has doubled or because the value of the coat has fallen by one half, and it becomes 20 yards of linen equals half a coat, either because the value of the linen has fallen by one half, or because the value of the coat has doubled. 3. Let the quantities of labor time respectively necessary for the production of the linen and the coat vary simultaneously in the same direction and in the same proportion. In this case, 20 yards of linen continue equal to one coat, however much their values may have altered. Their change of value is seen as soon as they are compared with a third commodity, whose value has remained constant. If the values of all commodities rose or fell simultaneously and in the same proportion, their relative values would remain unaltered. Their real change of value would appear from the diminished or increased quantity of commodities produced in a given time. 4. 
The labour time respectively necessary for the production of the linen and the coat, and therefore the value of these commodities, may simultaneously vary in the same direction, but at unequal rates, or in opposite directions, or in other ways. The effect of all these possible different variations on the relative value of a commodity may be deduced from the results of one, two, and three. Thus, real changes in the magnitude of value are neither unequivocally nor exhaustively reflected in their relative expression, that is, in the equation expressing the magnitude of relative value. The relative value of a commodity may vary, although its value remains constant. Its relative value may remain constant, although its value varies. And finally, simultaneous variations in the magnitude of value and in that of its relative expression by no means necessarily correspond in amount. Footnote. This incongruity between the magnitude of value and its relative expression has, with customary ingenuity, been exploited by vulgar economists. For example, once admit that A falls, because B, with which it is exchanged, rises, while no less labour is bestowed in the meantime on A, and your general principle of value falls to the ground. If he, Ricardo, allowed that when A rises in value relatively to B, B falls in value relatively to A, he cut away the ground on which he rested his grand proposition that the value of a commodity is ever determined by the labour embodied in it of B relatively to that of A, though no change has taken place in the quantity of labour to produce B, then not only the doctrine falls to the ground which asserts that the quantity of labour bestowed on an article regulates its value, but also that which affirms the cost of an article to regulate its value. J. Broadhurst, Political Economy, London, 1842 Mr. Broadhurst might just as well say, Consider the fractions 10 over 20, 10 over 50, 10 over 100, etc. The number 10 remains unchanged, and yet its proportional magnitude, its magnitude relatively to the numbers 20, 50, 100, etc., continually diminishes. Therefore, the great principle that the magnitude of a whole number, such as 10, is regulated by the number of times unity is contained in it, falls to the ground. The author explains in section 4 of this chapter what he understands by vulgar economy. Engels. End of footnote. 3. The Equivalent Form of Value We have seen that the commodity A, the linen, by expressing its value in the use-value of a commodity differing in kind, the coat, at the same time impresses upon the latter a specific form of value, namely that of the equivalent. The commodity linen manifests its quality of having a value by the fact that the coat, without having assumed a value form different from its bodily form, is equated to the linen. The fact that the latter, therefore, has a value is expressed by saying that the coat is directly exchangeable with it. Therefore, when we say that a commodity is in the equivalent form, we express the fact that it is directly exchangeable with other commodities. When one commodity, such as a coat, serves as the equivalent of another, such as linen, and coats consequently acquire the characteristic property of being directly exchangeable with linen, we are far from knowing in what proportion the two are exchangeable. The value of the linen being given in magnitude, that proportion depends on the value of the coat. Whether the coat serves as the equivalent and the linen as relative value, or the linen as the equivalent, and the coat as relative value, the magnitude of the coat's value is determined, independently of its value form, by the labour time necessary for its production. But whenever the coat assumes in the equation of value the position of equivalent, 
its value acquires no quantitative expression. On the contrary, the commodity coat now figures only as a definite quantity of some article. For instance, forty yards of linen are worth what? Two coats, because the commodity coat here plays the part of equivalent, because the use value coat, as opposed to the linen, figures as an embodiment of value. Therefore, a definite number of coats suffices to express the definite quantity of value in the linen. Two coats may therefore express the quantity of value of forty yards of linen, but they can never express the quantity of their own value. A superficial observation of this fact, namely that in the equation of value, the equivalent figures exclusively as a simple quantity of some article of some use value, has misled Bailey, as also many others, both before and after him, into seeing in the expression of value merely a quantitative relation. The truth being that when a commodity acts as equivalent, no quantitative determination of its value is expressed. The first peculiarity that strikes us in considering the form of the equivalent is this. Use value becomes the form of manifestation, the phenomenal form of its opposite, value. The bodily form of the commodity becomes its value form. But mark well that this quid pro quo exists in the case of any commodity B only when some other commodity A enters into a value relation with it, and then only within the limits of this relation. Since no commodity can stand in the relation of equivalent to itself, and thus turn its own bodily shape into the expression of its own value, every commodity is compelled to choose some other commodity for its equivalent, and to accept the use value, that is to say, the bodily shape of that other commodity as the form of its own value. One of the measures that we apply to commodities as material substances, as use values, will serve to illustrate this point. A sugar loaf, being a body, is heavy and therefore has weight, but we can neither see nor touch this weight. We then take various pieces of iron whose weight has been determined beforehand. The iron, as iron, is no more the form of manifestation of weight than is the sugar loaf. Nevertheless, in order to express the sugar loaf as so much weight, we put it into a weight relation with the iron. In this relation, the iron officiates as a body representing nothing but weight. A certain quantity of iron therefore serves as the measure of the weight of the sugar, and represents, in relation to the sugar loaf, weight embodied, the form of manifestation of weight. This part is played by the iron only within this relation, into which the sugar or any other body whose weight has to be determined enters with the iron. Were they not both heavy, they could not enter into this relation, and the one could therefore not serve as the expression of the weight of the other. When we throw both onto the scales, we see in reality that as weight they are both the same, and that, therefore, when taken in proper proportions, they have the same weight. Just as the substance iron, as a measure of weight, represents in relation to the sugar loaf weight alone, so in our expression of value, the material object coat, in relation to the linen, represent value alone. Here, however, the analogy ceases. The iron, in the expression of the weight of the sugar loaf, represents a natural property common to both bodies, namely their weight. But the coat, in the expression of value of the linen, represents a non-natural property of both, something purely social, namely their value. Since the relative form of value of a commodity, the linen, for example, expresses the value of that commodity as being something wholly different from its substance and properties, as being, for instance, coat-like, we see that this expression itself 
indicates that some social relation lies at the bottom of it. With the equivalent form, it is just the contrary. The very essence of this form is that the material commodity itself, the coat, just as it is, expresses value and is endowed with the form of value by nature itself. Of course, this holds good only so long as the value relation exists in which the coat stands in the position of equivalent to the linen. Footnote Such expressions of relations in general, called by Hegel reflex categories, form a very curious class. For instance, one man is king only because other men stand in the relation of subjects to him. They, on the contrary, imagine that they are subjects because he is king. End of footnote. Since, however, the properties of a thing are not the result of its relations to other things, but only manifest themselves in such relations, the coat seems to be endowed with its equivalent form, its property of being directly exchangeable, just as much by nature as it is endowed with the property of being heavy or the capacity to keep us warm. Hence the enigmatical character of the equivalent form which escapes the notice of the bourgeois political economist, until this form, completely developed, confronts him in the shape of money. He then seeks to explain away the mystical character of gold and silver by substituting for them less dazzling commodities, and by reciting, with ever-renewed satisfaction, the catalogue of all possible commodities which at one time or another have played the part of equivalent. He has not the least suspicion that the most simple expression of value, such as twenty yards of linen equals one coat, already propounds the riddle of the equivalent form for our solution. The body of the commodity that serves as the equivalent figures as the materialization of human labor in the abstract, and is at the same time the product of some specifically useful concrete labor. This concrete labor becomes, therefore, the medium for expressing abstract human labor. If on the one hand the coat ranks as nothing but the embodiment of abstract human labor, so on the other hand the tailoring which is actually embodied in it counts as nothing but the form under which that abstract labor is realized. In the expression of value of the linen, the utility of the tailoring consists not in making clothes, but in making an object, which we at once recognize to be value, and therefore to be a congelation of labor, but of labor indistinguishable from that realized in the value of the linen. In order to act as such a mirror of value, the labor of tailoring must reflect nothing besides its own abstract quality of being human labor generally. In tailoring, as well as in weaving, human labor power is expended. Both, therefore, possess the general property of being human labor, and may therefore, in certain cases, such as in the production of value, have to be considered under this aspect alone. There is nothing mysterious in this, but in the expression of value there is a complete turn of the tables. For instance, how is the fact to be expressed that weaving creates the value of the linen not by virtue of being weaving, as such, but by reason of its general property of being human labor? Simply by opposing to weaving, that other particular form of concrete labor, in this instance tailoring, which produces the equivalent of the product of weaving. Just as the coat in its bodily form became a direct expression of value, so now does tailoring, a concrete form of labor, appear as the direct and palpable embodiment of human labor generally. Hence the second peculiarity of the equivalent form is that concrete labor becomes the form under which its opposite, abstract human labor, manifests itself. But because this concrete labor, tailoring in our case, ranks as, and is directly identified with, 
undifferentiated human labor, it also ranks as identical with any other sort of labor, and therefore with that embodied in the linen. Consequently, although, like all other commodity-producing labor, it is the labor of private individuals, yet, at the same time, it ranks as labor directly social in its character. This is the reason why it results in a product directly exchangeable with other commodities. We have then a third peculiarity of the equivalent form, namely that the labor of private individuals takes the form of its opposite, labor directly social in its form. The two latter peculiarities of the equivalent form will become more intelligible if we go back to the great thinker who was the first to analyze so many forms, whether of thought, society, or nature, and amongst them also the form of value. I mean Aristotle. In the first place, he clearly enunciates that the money form of commodities is only the further development of the simple form of value. That is, of the expression of the value of one commodity in some other commodity taken at random. For he says, five beds equals one house is not to be distinguished from five beds equals so much money. He further sees that the value relation which gives rise to this expression makes it necessary that the house should qualitatively be made equal of the bed, and that without such an equalization, these two clearly different things could not be compared with each other as commensurable quantities. Exchange, he says, cannot take place without equality, and equality not without commensurability. Here, however, he comes to a stop, and gives up the further analysis of the form of value. It is, however, in reality impossible that such unlike things can be commensurable that is, qualitatively equal. Such an equalization can only be something foreign to their real nature, consequently only a makeshift for practical purposes. Aristotle, therefore, himself tells us what barred the way to his further analysis. It was the absence of any concept of value. What is that equal something, that common substance, which admits of the value of the beds being expressed by a house. Such a thing, in truth, cannot exist, says Aristotle. And why not? Compared with the beds, the house does represent something equal to them, in so far as it represents what is really equal, both in the beds and the house, and that is human labor. There was, however, an important fact which prevented Aristotle from seeing that to attribute value to commodities is merely a mode of expressing all labor as equal human labor, and consequently as labor of equal quality. Greek society was founded upon slavery, and had therefore for its natural basis the inequality of men and of their labor powers. The secret of the expression of value namely that all kinds of labor are equal and equipped. This, however, is possible only in a society in which the great mass of the produce of labor takes the form of commodities, in which, consequently, the dominant relation between man and man is that of owners of commodities. The brilliancy of Aristotle's genius is shown by this alone, that he discovered in the expression of the value of commodities, a relation of equality. The peculiar conditions of the society in which he lived alone prevented him from discovering what, in truth, was at the bottom of this equality. 4. The Elementary Form of Value Considered as a Whole The elementary form of value of a commodity is contained in the equation expressing its value relation to another commodity of a different kind, or in its exchange relation to the same. The value of commodity A is qualitatively expressed by the fact that commodity B 
is directly exchangeable with it. Its value is quantitatively expressed by the fact that a definite quantity of B is exchangeable with a definite quantity of A. In other words, the value of a commodity obtains independent and definite expression by taking the form of exchange value. When, at the beginning of this chapter, we said, in common parlance, that a commodity is both a use value and an exchange value, we were, accurately speaking, wrong. A commodity is a use value or object of utility and a value. It manifests itself as this twofold thing as soon as its value assumes an independent form, viz. the form of exchange value. It never assumes this form when isolated, but only when placed in a value or exchange relation with another commodity of a different kind. When once we know this, such a mode of expression does no harm. It simply serves as an abbreviation. Our analysis has shown that the form or expression of the value of a commodity originates in the nature of value, and not that value and its magnitude originate in the mode of their expression as exchange value. This, however, is the delusion as well of the mercantilists and their recent revivers, Ferrier, Ganil, and others, as also of their antipodes, the modern bagmen of free trade, such as Bastia. Footnote FLA Ferrier Deputy Inspector of Customs, du gouvernement considéré dans ses rapports avec le commerce. Paris, 1805. And Charles Ganil, des systèmes d'économie politique. Paris, 1821. End of footnote. The mercantilists lay special stress on the qualitative aspect of the expression of value, and consequently on the equivalent form of commodities which attains its full perfection in money. The modern hawkers of free trade, who must get rid of their article at any price, on the other hand lay most stress on the quantitative aspect of the relative form of value. For them, there consequently exists neither value nor magnitude of value anywhere except in its expression by means of the exchange relation of commodities, that is, in the daily list of prices current. MacLeod, who has taken upon himself to dress up the confused ideas of Lombard Street in the most learned finery, is a successful cross between the superstitious mercantilists and the enlightened free-trade bagmen. A close scrutiny of the expression of the value of A in terms of B, contained in the equation expressing the value relation of A to B, has shown us that within that relation the bodily form of A figures only as a use value, the bodily form of B only as the form or aspect of value. The opposition or contrast existing internally in each commodity between use value and value is therefore made evident externally by two commodities being placed in such relation to each other that the commodity whose value it is sought to express figures directly as a mere use value, while the comedy in which that value is to be expressed figures directly as mere exchange value. Hence the elementary form of value of a commodity is the elementary form in which the contrast contained in that commodity between use value and value becomes apparent. Every product of labor is, in all states of society, a use value. But it is only at a definite historical epoch in a society's development that such a product becomes a commodity, viz., at the epoch when the labour spent on the production of a useful article becomes expressed as one of the objective qualities of that article, that is, as its value. It therefore follows that the elementary value form 
is also the primitive form under which a product of labor appears historically as a commodity, and that the gradual transformation of such products into commodities proceeds pari passu with the development of the value form. We perceive, at first sight, the deficiencies of the elementary form of value. It is a mere germ which must undergo a series of metamorphoses before it can ripen into the price form. The expression of the value of commodity A in terms of any other commodity B merely distinguishes the value from the use value of A, and therefore places A merely in a relation of exchange with a single different commodity B. But it is still far from expressing A's qualitative equality and quantitative proportionality to all commodities. To the elementary relative value form of a commodity, there corresponds the single equivalent form of one other commodity. Thus, in the relative expression of value of the linen, the coat assumes the form of equivalent, or of being directly exchangeable, only in relation to a single commodity, the linen. Nevertheless, the elementary form of value passes by an easy transition into a more complete form. It is true that by means of the elementary form, the value of a commodity A becomes expressed in terms of one and only one other commodity, but that one may be a commodity of any kind coat, iron, corn, or anything else. Therefore, according as A is placed in relation with one or the other, we get for one and the same commodity different elementary expressions of value. Footnote. In Homer, for instance, the value of an article is expressed in a series of different things. End of footnote. The number of such possible expressions is limited only by the number of the different kinds of commodities distinct from it. The isolated expression of A's value is therefore convertible into a series, prolonged to any length, of the different elementary expressions of that value. Twenty yards of linen equals one coat, or equals ten pounds of tea, or equals forty pounds of coffee, or equals one quarter of corn, or equals two ounces of gold, or half a ton of iron, or equals etc. B. Total or expanded form of value. 1. The expanded relative form of value. The value of a single commodity, the linen, for example, is now expressed in terms of numberless other elements of the world of commodities. Every other commodity now becomes a mirror of the linen's value. Footnote. For this reason, we can speak of the coat value of the linen when its value is expressed in coats, or of its corn value when expressed in corn, and so on. Every such expression tells us that what appears in the use values, coat, corn, etc., is the value of the linen. The value of any commodity denoting its relation in exchange, we may speak of it as corn value, cloth value, according to the commodity with which it is compared, and hence there are a thousand different kinds of value, as many kinds of value as there are commodities in existence and all are equally real and equally nominal. A critical dissertation on the nature, measures, and causes of value, chiefly in reference to the writings of Mr. Ricardo and his followers. By the author of Essays on the Formation, etc., of Opinions, London, 1825. S. Bailey, the author of this anonymous work, a work which in its day created much stir in England, fancied that by thus pointing out the various relative expressions of one and the same value, he had proved the impossibility of any determination of the concept of value. However narrow his own views may have been, yet 
that he laid his finger on some serious defects in the Ricardian theory is proved by the animosity with which he was attacked by Ricardo's followers. See the Westminster Review, for example. End of footnote. It is thus that for the first time this value shows itself in its true light as a congelation of undifferentiated human labor. For the labor that creates it now stands expressly revealed as labor that ranks equally with every other sort of human labor, no matter what its form, whether tailoring, plowing, mining, etc., and no matter, therefore, whether it is realized in coats, corn, iron, or gold. The linen, by virtue of the form of its value, now stands in a social relation, no longer with only one other kind of commodity, but with the whole world of commodities. As a commodity, it is a citizen of that world. At the same time, the interminable series of value equations implies that as regards the value of a commodity, it is a matter of indifference under what particular form or kind of use value it appears. In the first form, twenty yards of linen equals one coat. It might, for aught that otherwise appears, be pure accident that these two commodities are exchangeable in definite quantities. In the second form, on the contrary, we perceive at once the background that determines and is essentially different from this accidental appearance. The value of the linen remains unaltered in magnitude, whether expressed in coats, coffee, or iron, or in numberless different commodities, the property of as many different owners. The accidental relation between two individual commodity owners disappears. It becomes plain that it is not the exchange of commodities which regulates the magnitude of their value, but on the contrary, that it is the magnitude of their value which controls their exchange proportions. 2. The Particular Equivalent Form Each commodity, such as coat, tea, corn, iron, etc., figures in the expression of value of the linen, as an equivalent, and consequently as a thing that is value. The bodily form of each of these commodities figures now as a particular equivalent form, one out of many. In the same way, the manifold concrete useful kinds of labor embodied in these different commodities rank now as so many different forms of the realization or manifestation of undifferentiated human labor. 3. Defects of the total or expanded form of value In the first place, the relative expression of value is incomplete because the series representing it is interminable. The chain of which each equation of value is a link is liable at any moment to be lengthened by each new kind of commodity that comes into existence and furnishes the material for a fresh expression of value. In the second place, it is a many-coloured mosaic of disparate and independent expressions of value. And lastly, if, as must be the case, the relative value of each commodity in turn becomes expressed in this expanded form, we get for each of them a relative value form, different in every case, and consisting of an interminable series of expressions of value. The defects of the expanded relative value form are reflected in the corresponding equivalent form. Since the bodily form of each single commodity is one particular equivalent form amongst numberless others, we have, on the whole, nothing but fragmentary equivalent forms, each excluding the others. In the same way also, the special concrete useful kind of labor embodied in each particular equivalent is presented only as a particular kind of labor, and therefore not as an exhaustive representative of human labor generally. The latter, indeed, 
gains adequate manifestation in the totality of its manifold, particular, concrete forms. But in that case, its expression in an infinite series is ever incomplete and deficient in unity. The expanded relative form is, however, nothing but the sum of the elementary relative expressions or equations of the first kind, such as 20 yards of linen equals one coat, 20 yards of linen equals 10 pounds of tea, etc. Each of these implies the corresponding inverted equation. One coat equals 20 yards of linen, 10 pounds of tea equals 20 yards of linen, etc. In fact, when a person exchanges his linen for many other commodities and thus expresses its value in a series of other commodities, it necessarily follows that the various owners of the latter exchange them for the linen and consequently express the value of their various commodities in one and the same third commodity, the linen. If, then, we reverse the series, 20 yards of linen equals one coat, or equals ten pounds of tea, etc., that is to say, if we give expression to the converse relation already implied in the series, we get one coat, or ten pounds of tea, or forty pounds of coffee, or one quarter of corn, or two ounces of gold, or half a ton of iron, X of commodity A, etc., equals twenty yards of linen. C. The general form of value. 1. The altered character of the form of value. All commodities now express their value, one, in an elementary form, because in a single commodity, two, with unity, because in one and the same commodity. This form of value is elementary, and the same for all, therefore general. The forms A and B were fit only to express the value of a commodity as something distinct from its use value or material form. The first form, A, furnishes such equations as the following. One coat equals twenty yards of linen. Ten pounds of tea equals half a ton of iron. The value of the coat is equated to linen, that of the tea to iron. But to be equated to linen and again to iron is to be as different as our linen and iron. This form, it is plain, occurs practically only in the first beginning, when the products of labor are converted into commodities by accidental and occasional exchanges. The second form, B, distinguishes in a more adequate manner than the first the value of a commodity from its use value, for the value of the coat is there placed in contrast under all possible shapes with the bodily form of the coat. It is equated to linen, to iron, to tea, in short, to everything else, only not to itself, the coat. On the other hand, any general expression of value common to all is directly excluded, for in the equation of value of each commodity, all other commodities now appear only under the form of equivalence. The expanded form of value comes into actual existence for the first time so soon as a particular product of labor, such as cattle, is no longer exceptionally but habitually exchanged for various other commodities. The third and lastly developed form expresses the values of the whole world of commodities in terms of a single commodity set apart for the purpose, namely the linen, and thus represents to us their values by means of their equality with linen. The value of every commodity is now, by being equated to linen, not only differentiated from its own use value, but from all other use values generally, and is, by that very fact, expressed as that which is common to all commodities. By this form, commodities are, for the first time, effectively brought into relation with one another as values, or made to appear as exchange values. The two earlier forms, 
either express the value of each commodity in terms of a single commodity of a different kind, or in a series of many such commodities. In both cases, it is, so to say, the special business of each single commodity to find an expression for its value, and this it does without the help of the others. These others, with respect to the former, play the passive parts of equivalence. The general form of value C results from the joint action of the whole world of commodities, and from that alone. A commodity can acquire a general expression of its value only by all other commodities simultaneously with it, expressing their values in the same equivalent, and every new commodity must follow suit. It thus becomes evident that since the existence of commodities as values is purely social, this social existence can be expressed by the totality of their social relations alone, and consequently that the form of their value must be a socially recognized form. All commodities being equated to linen now appear not only as qualitatively equal as values generally, but also as values whose magnitudes are capable of comparison. By expressing the magnitudes of their values in one and the same material, the linen, those magnitudes are also compared with each other. For instance, ten pounds of tea equals twenty yards of linen, and forty pounds of coffee equals twenty yards of linen. Therefore, ten pounds of tea equals forty pounds of coffee. In other words, there is contained in one pound of coffee only one-fourth as much substance of value, labor, as is contained in one pound of tea. The general form of relative value, embracing the whole world of commodities, converts the single commodity that is excluded from the rest and made to play the part of equivalent, here the linen, into the universal equivalent. The bodily form of the linen is now the form assumed in common by the values of all commodities. It therefore becomes directly exchangeable with all and every of them. The substance linen becomes the visible incarnation, the social chrysalis state of every kind of human labor. Weaving, which is the labor of certain private individuals producing a particular article linen, acquires in consequence a social character, the character of equality with all other kinds of labor. The innumerable equations of which the general form of value is composed equate in turn the labor embodied in the linen to that embodied in every other commodity, and they thus convert weaving into the general form of manifestation of undifferentiated human labor. In this manner, the labor realized in the values of commodities is presented not only under its negative aspect, under which abstraction is made from every concrete form and useful property of actual work, but its own positive nature is made to reveal itself expressly. The general value form is the reduction of all kinds of actual labor to their common character of being human labor generally of being the expenditure of human labor power. The general value form, which represents all products of labor as mere congelations of undifferentiated human labor, shows by its very structure that it is the social resume of the world of commodities. That form consequently makes it indisputably evident that in the world of commodities the character possessed by all labor of being human labor constitutes its specific social character. 2. The interdependent development of the relative form of value and of the equivalent form. The degree of development of the relative form of value corresponds to that of the equivalent form but we must bear in mind that the development of the latter is only the expression and result of the development of the former. The primary or isolated relative form of value of one commodity 
converts some other commodity into an isolated equivalent. The expanded form of relative value, which is the expression of the value of one commodity in terms of all other commodities, endows those other commodities with the character of particular equivalents differing in kind. And lastly, a particular kind of commodity acquires the character of universal equivalent because all other commodities make it the material in which they uniformly express their value. The antagonism between the relative form of value and the equivalent form, the two poles of the value form, is developed concurrently with that form itself. The first form, 20 yards of linen equals one coat, already contains this antagonism without as yet fixing it. According as we read this equation forwards or backwards, the parts played by the linen and the coat are different. In the one case, the relative value of the linen is expressed in the coat. In the other case, the relative value of the coat is expressed in the linen. In this first form of value, therefore, it is difficult to grasp the polar contrast. Form B shows that only one single commodity at a time can completely expand its relative value, and that it acquires this expanded form only because, and in so far as, all other commodities are, with respect to it, equivalents. Here we cannot reverse the equation, as we can the equation 20 yards of linen equals one coat, without altering its general character and converting it from the expanded form of value into the general form of value. Finally, the form C gives to the world of commodities a general social relative form of value, because, and in so far as, thereby all commodities, with the exception of one, are excluded from the equivalent form. A single commodity, the linen, appears therefore to have acquired the character of direct exchangeability with every other commodity because, and in so far as, this character is denied to every other commodity. Footnote. It is by no means self-evident that this character of direct and universal exchangeability is, so to speak, a polar one, and as intimately connected with its opposite pole, the absence of direct exchangeability, as the positive pole of the magnet is with the negative counterpart. It may therefore be imagined that all commodities can simultaneously have this character impressed upon them, just as it can be imagined that all Catholics can be popes together. It is, of course, highly desirable in the eyes of the petty bourgeois, for whom the production of commodities is the neck plus ultra of human freedom and individual independence, that the inconveniences resulting from this character of commodities not being directly exchangeable should be removed. Proudhon's socialism is a working out of this Philistine utopia, a form of socialism which, as I have elsewhere shown, does not possess even the merit of originality. Long before his time, the task was attempted with much better success by Gray, Bray, and others. But for all that, wisdom of this kind flourishes even now in certain circles under the name of science. Never has any school played more tricks with the word science than that of Proudhon, for where thoughts are absent, words are brought in as convenient replacements. Goethe's Faust. See Proudhon's Philosophy of Poverty. End of footnote. The commodity that figures as universal equivalent is, on the other hand, excluded from the relative value form. If the linen, or any other commodity serving as universal equivalent, were at the same time to share in the relative form of value, it would have to serve as its own equivalent. We should then have 20 yards of linen equals 20 yards of linen. This tautology expresses neither value nor magnitude of value. 
In order to express the relative value of the universal equivalent, we must rather reverse the form C. This equivalent has no relative form of value in common with other commodities, but its value is relatively expressed by a never-ending series of other commodities. Thus, the expanded form of relative value, or form B, now shows itself as the specific form of relative value for the equivalent commodity. 3. Transition from the general form of value to the money form. The universal equivalent form is a form of value in general. It can therefore be assumed by any commodity. On the other hand, if a commodity be found to have assumed the universal equivalent form, form C, this is only because and insofar as it has been excluded from the rest of all other commodities as their equivalent, and that by their own act. And from the moment that this exclusion becomes finally restricted to one particular commodity, from that moment only the general form of relative value of the world of commodities obtains real consistence and general social validity. The particular commodity with whose bodily form the equivalent form is thus socially identified now becomes the money commodity, or serves as money. It becomes the special social function of that commodity, and consequently its social monopoly to play within the world of commodities the part of the universal equivalent. Amongst the commodities which, in form B, figure as particular equivalents of the linen, and in form C express in common their relative values in linen, this foremost place has been attained by one in particular, namely, gold. If, then, in form C we replace the linen by gold, we get 20 yards of linen equals one coat equals 10 pounds of tea equals 40 pounds of coffee equals one quarter of corn equals half a ton of iron equals X commodity A equals two ounces of gold. D. The money form. In passing from form A to form B, and from the latter to form C, the changes are fundamental. On the other hand, there is no difference between forms C and D, except that in the latter, gold has assumed the equivalent form in the place of linen. Gold is in form D what linen was in form C, the universal equivalent. The progress consists in this alone, that the character of direct and universal exchangeability, in other words, that the universal equivalent form, has now, by social custom, become finally identified with the substance gold. Gold is now money with reference to all other commodities only because it was previously, with reference to them, a simple commodity. Like all other commodities, it was also capable of serving as an equivalent, either as simple equivalent in isolated exchanges, or as particular equivalent by the side of others. Gradually it began to serve, within varying limits, as universal equivalent. So soon as it monopolizes this position in the expression of value for the world of commodities, it becomes the money commodity, and then, and not till then, does form D become distinct from form C, and the general form of value become changed into the money form. The elementary expression of the relative value of a single commodity such as linen, in terms of the commodity such as gold that plays the part of money, is the price form of that commodity. The price form of the linen is therefore 20 yards of linen equals 2 ounces of gold, or if 2 ounces of gold when coined are 2 pounds, 20 yards of linen equals 2 pounds. The difficulty in forming a concept of the money form consists in clearly comprehending the universal equivalent form, 
and as a necessary corollary, the general form of value, form C. The latter is deducible from form B, the expanded form of value, the essential component B. The simple commodity form is therefore the germ of the money form. Section 4. The Fetishism of Commodities and the Secret Thereof A commodity appears at first sight a very trivial thing and easily understood. Its analysis shows that it is in reality a very queer thing, abounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties. So far as it is a value in use, there is nothing mysterious about it, whether we consider it from the point of view that by its properties it is capable of satisfying human wants, or from the point that those properties are the product of human labour. It is as clear as noonday that man, by his industry, changes the forms of the materials furnished by nature in such a way as to make them useful to him. The form of wood, for instance, is altered by making a table out of it. Yet, for all that, the table continues to be that common, everyday thing, wood. But so soon as it steps forth as a commodity, it is changed into something transcendent. It not only stands with its feet on the ground, but in relation to all other commodities, it stands on its head and evolves out of its wooden brain grotesque ideas far more wonderful than table-turning ever was. The mystical character of commodities does not originate, therefore, in their use-value. Just as little does it proceed from the nature of the determining factors of value. For in the first place, however varied the useful kinds of labour or productive activities may be, it is a physiological fact that they are functions of the human organism, and that each such function, whatever may be its nature or form, is essentially the expenditure of human brain, nerves, muscles, etc. Secondly, with regard to that which forms the groundwork for the quantitative determination of value, namely the duration of that expenditure or the quantity of labour, it is quite clear that there is a palpable difference between its quantity and quality. In all states of society, the labour time that it costs to produce the means of subsistence must necessarily be an object of interest to mankind, though not of equal interest in different stages of development. And lastly, from the moment that men in any way work for one another, their labour assumes a social form. Whence, then, arises the enigmatical character of the product of labour, so soon as it assumes the form of commodities? clearly from this form itself. The equality of all sorts of human labour is expressed objectively by their products all being equally values. The measure of the expenditure of labour power by the duration of that expenditure takes the form of the quantity of value of the products of labour, and finally the mutual relations of the producers within which the social character of their labour affirms itself take the form of a social relation between the products. A commodity is therefore a mysterious thing, simply because in it the social character of men's labour appears to them as an objective character stamped upon the product of that labour, because the relation of the producers to the sum total of their own labour is presented to them as a social relation existing not between themselves, but between the products of their labour. This is the reason why the products of labour become commodities, social things whose qualities are at the same time perceptible and imperceptible by the senses. In the same way, the light from an object is perceived by us not as the subjective excitation of our optic nerve, but as the objective form of something outside the eye itself. But in the act of seeing there is at all events an actual passage of light from one thing to another, from the external object to the eye, 
there is a physical relation between physical things. But it is different with commodities. There, the existence of the things qua commodities and the value relation between the products of labor which stamps them as commodities have absolutely no connection with their physical properties and with the material relations arising therefrom. There, it is a definite social relation between men that assumes in their eyes the fantastic form of a relation between things. In order, therefore, to find an analogy, we must have recourse to the mist-enveloped regions of the religious world. In that world, the productions of the human brain appear as independent beings endowed with life and entering into relation both with one another and the human race. So it is in the world of commodities with the products of men's hands. This I call the fetishism, which attaches itself to the products of labor, so soon as they are produced as commodities, and which is therefore inseparable from the production of commodities. This fetishism of commodities has its origin, as the foregoing analysis has already shown, in the peculiar social character of the labor that produces them. As a general rule, articles of utility become commodities only because they are products of the labor of private individuals or groups of individuals who carry on their work independently of each other. The sum total of the labor of all these private individuals forms the aggregate labor of society. Since the producers do not come into social contact with each other until they exchange their products, the specific social character of each producer's labor does not show itself except in the act of exchange. In other words, the labor of the individual asserts itself as a part of the labor of society only by means of the relations which the act of exchange establishes directly between the products, and indirectly, through them, between the producers. To the latter, therefore, the relations connecting the labor of one individual with that of the rest appear not as direct social relations between individuals at work, but as what they really are, material relations between persons and social relations between things. It is only by being exchanged that the products of labor acquire, as values, one uniform social status distinct from their varied forms of existence as objects of utility. This division of a product into a useful thing and a value becomes practically important only when exchange has acquired such an extension that useful articles are produced for the purpose of being exchanged, and their character as values has therefore to be taken into account beforehand during production. From this moment, the labor of the individual producer acquires socially a twofold character. On the one hand, it must, as a definite useful kind of labor, satisfy a definite social want, and thus hold its place as part and parcel of the collective labor of all, as a branch of a social division of labor that has sprung up spontaneously. On the other hand, it can satisfy the manifold wants of the individual producer himself only in so far as the mutual exchangeability of all kinds of useful private labor is an established social fact, and therefore the private useful labor of each producer ranks on an equality with that of all others. The equalization of the most different kinds of labor can be the result only of an abstraction from their inequalities, or of reducing them to their common denominator, viz. expenditure of human labor power, or human labor in the abstract. The twofold social character of the labor of the individual appears to him, when reflected in his brain, only under those forms which are impressed upon that labor in everyday practice by the exchange of products. In this way, the character that his own labor possesses of being socially useful takes the form of the condition that the product must be not only useful, but useful for others, 
and the social character that his particular labor has of being the equal of all other particular kinds of labor takes the form that all the physically different articles that are the products of labor have one common quality, viz. that of having value. Hence, when we bring the products of our labor into relation with each other as values, it is not because we see in these articles the material receptacles of homogeneous human labor. Quite the contrary. Whenever, by an exchange, we equate as values our different products, by that very act we also equate as human labor the different kinds of labor expended on them. We are not aware of this. Nevertheless, we do it. Footnote. When, therefore, Galliani says, value is a relation between persons, he ought to have added, a relation between persons expressed as a relation between things. End of footnote. Value, therefore, does not stalk about with a label describing what it is. It is value, rather, that converts every product into a social hieroglyphic. Later on, we try to decipher the hieroglyphic, to get behind the secret of our own social products. For to stamp an object of utility as a value is just as much a social product as language. The recent scientific discovery that the products of labor, so far as they are values, are but material expressions of the human labor spent in their production marks, indeed, an epoch in the history of the development of the human race, but by no means dissipates the mist through which the social character of labor appears to us to be an objective character of the products themselves. The fact that in the particular form of production with which we are dealing, viz. the production of commodities, the specific social character of private labor carried on independently consists in the equality of every kind of that labor, by virtue of its being human labor, which character therefore assumes in the product the form of value, this fact appears to the producers, notwithstanding the discovery above referred to, to be just as real and final as the fact that, after the discovery by science of the component gases of air, the atmosphere itself remained unaltered. What, first of all, practically concerns producers when they make an exchange is the question how much of some other product they get for their own, in what proportions the products are exchangeable. When these proportions have, by custom, attained a certain stability, they appear to result from the nature of the products, so that, for instance, one ton of iron and two ounces of gold appear as naturally to be of equal value as a pound of gold and a pound of iron, in spite of their different physical and chemical qualities, appear to be of equal weight. The character of having value, when once impressed upon products, obtains fixity only by reason of their acting and reacting upon each other as quantities of value. These quantities vary continually, independently of the will, foresight, and action of the producers. To them, their own social action takes the form of the action of objects which rule the producers instead of being ruled by them. It requires a fully developed production of commodities before, from accumulated experience alone, the scientific conviction springs up that all the different kinds of private labor which are carried on independently of each other, and yet as spontaneously developed branches of the social division of labor, are continually being reduced to the quantitative proportions in which society requires them. And why? Because, in the midst of all the accidental and ever-fluctuating exchange relations between the products, the labor time socially necessary for their production forcibly asserts itself like an overriding law of nature. The law of gravity thus asserts itself when a house falls about our ears. Footnote. 
What are we to think of a law that asserts itself only by periodical revolutions? It is just nothing but a law of nature, founded on the want of knowledge of those whose action is the subject of it. Friedrich Engels Umrisse zu einer Kritik der Nationalökonomie in the deutsch französische Jahrbücher Edited by Arnold Ruger and Karl Marx, Paris, 1844. End of footnote. The determination of the magnitude of value by labor time is therefore a secret, hidden under the apparent fluctuations in the relative values of commodities. Its discovery, while removing all appearance of mere accidentality from the determination of the magnitude of the values of products, yet in no way alters the mode in which that determination takes place. Man's reflections on the forms of social life, and consequently also his scientific analysis of those forms, takes a course directly opposite to that of their actual historical development. He begins, post-festum, with the results of the process of development ready to hand before him. The characters that stamp products as commodities and whose establishment is a necessary preliminary to the circulation of commodities, have already acquired the stability of natural, self-understood forms of social life, before man seeks to decipher not their historical character, or in his eyes they are immutable, but their meaning. Consequently, it was the analysis of the prices of commodities that alone led to the determination of the magnitude of value, and it was the common expression of all commodities in money that alone led to the establishment of their characters as values. It is, however, just this ultimate money form of the world of commodities that actually conceals, instead of disclosing, the social character of private labor and the social relations between the individual producers. When I state that coats or boots stand in a relation to linen, because it is the universal incarnation of abstract human labor, the absurdity of the statement is self-evident. Nevertheless, when the producers of coats and boots compare those articles with linen, or what is the same thing with gold or silver as the universal equivalent, they express the relation between their own private labor and the collective labor of society in the same absurd form. The categories of bourgeois economy consist of such like forms. They are forms of thought expressing with social validity the conditions and relations of a definite, historically determined mode of production, viz. the production of commodities. The whole mystery of commodities all the magic and necromancy that surrounds the products of labor as long as they take the form of commodities, vanishes, therefore, so soon as we come to other forms of production. Since Robinson Crusoe's experiences are a favorite theme with political economists, let us take a look at him on his island. Footnote. Even Ricardo has his stories, a la Robinson, he makes the primitive hunter and the primitive fisher straightway, as owners of commodities, exchange fish and game in the proportion in which labor time is incorporated in these exchange values. On this occasion, he commits the anachronism of making these men apply to the calculation, so far as their implements have to be taken into account, the annuity tables in current use on the London Exchange in the year 1817. The parallelograms of Mr. Owen appear to be the only form of society, besides the bourgeois form with which he was acquainted. Karl Marx, to a critique, etc. End of footnote. Moderate though he be, yet some few wants he has to satisfy, and must therefore do a little useful work of various sorts, such as making tools and furniture, taming goats, fishing and hunting. 
of his prayers and the like we take no account, since they are a source of pleasure to him, and he looks upon them as so much recreation. In spite of the variety of his work, he knows that his labour, whatever its form, is but the activity of one and the same Robinson, and consequently that it consists of nothing but different modes of human labour. Necessity itself compels him to apportion his time accurately between his different kinds of work. Whether one kind occupies a greater space in his general activity than another depends on the difficulties, greater or less as the case may be, to be overcome in attaining the useful effect aimed at. This our friend Robinson soon learns by experience, and having rescued a watch, ledger, and pen and ink from the wreck, commences, like a true-born Briton, to keep a set of books. His stock-book contains a list of the objects of utility that belong to him, of the operations necessary for their production, and lastly, of the labour-time that definite quantities of those objects have, on average, cost him. All the relations between Robinson and the objects that form this wealth of his own creation are here so simple and clear as to be intelligible without exertion, even to Mr. Sedley Taylor. And yet those relations contain all that is essential to the determination of value. Let us now transport ourselves from Robinson's island bathed in light to the European Middle Ages, shrouded in darkness. Here, instead of the independent man, we find everyone dependent, serfs and lords, vassals and suzerains, laymen and clergy. Personal dependence here characterizes the social relations of production just as much as it does the other spheres of life organized on the basis of that production. But for the very reason that personal dependence forms the groundwork of society, there is no necessity for labor and its products to assume a fantastic form different from their reality. They take the shape, in the transactions of society, of services in kind and payments in kind. Here the particular and natural form of labor, and not as in a society based on production of commodities its general abstract form, is the immediate social form of labor. Compulsory labor is just as properly measured by time as commodity-producing labor, but every serf knows that what he expends in the service of his lord is a definite quantity of his own personal labor power. The tithe to be rendered to the priest is more matter-of-fact than his blessing. No matter, then, what we may think of the parts played by the different classes of people themselves in this society, the social relations between individuals in the performance of their labor appear at all events as their own mutual personal relations, and are not disguised under the shape of social relations between the products of labor. For an example of labor in common, or directly associated labor, we have no occasion to go back to that spontaneously developed form which we find on the threshold of the history of all civilized races. Footnote. A ridiculous presumption has latterly got abroad that common property in its primitive form is specifically a Slavonian or even exclusively Russian form. It is the primitive form that we can prove to have existed amongst Romans, Teutons, and Celts, and even to this day we find numerous examples, ruins though they be, in India. A more exhaustive study of Asiatic, and especially of Indian forms of common property, would show how, from the different forms of primitive common property, different forms of its dissolution have been developed. Thus, for instance, the various original types of Roman and Teutonic private property are deducible from different forms of Indian common property. Karl Marx, Sur Critique, etc. End of footnote. We have one close at hand in the patriarchal industries of a peasant family that produces corn, cattle, yarn, linen, and clothing for home use. 
These different articles are, as regards the family, so many products of its labor, but as between themselves, they are not commodities. The different kinds of labor, such as tillage, cattle tending, spinning, weaving, and making clothes, which result in the various products, are in themselves, and such as they are, direct social functions, because functions of the family, which, just as much as a society based on the production of commodities, possesses a spontaneously developed system of division of labor. The distribution of the work within the family and the regulation of the labor time of the several members depend as well upon differences of age and sex as upon natural conditions varying with the seasons. The labor power of each individual, by its very nature, operates in this case merely as a definite portion of the whole labor power of the family, and therefore the measure of the expenditure of individual labor power by its duration appears here by its very nature as a social character of their labor. Let us now picture to ourselves, by way of change, a community of free individuals, carrying on their work with the means of production in common, in which the labor power of all the different individuals is consciously applied as the combined labor power of the community. All the characteristics of Robinson's labor are here repeated, but with this difference, that they are social instead of individual. Everything produced by him was exclusively the result of his own personal labor, and therefore simply an object of use for himself. The total product of our community is a social product. One portion serves as fresh means of production and remains social but another portion is consumed by the members as means of subsistence. A distribution of this portion amongst them is consequently necessary. The mode of this distribution will vary with the productive organization of the community and the degree of historical development attained by the producers. We will assume but merely for the sake of a parallel with the production of commodities, that the share of each individual producer in the means of subsistence is determined by his labor time. Labor time would, in that case, play a double part. Its apportionment, in accordance with a definite social plan, maintains the proper proportion between the different kinds of work to be done and the various wants of the community. On the other hand, it also serves as a measure of the portion of the common labor borne by each individual, and of his share in the part of the total product destined for individual consumption. The social relations of the individual producers, with regard both to their labor and to its products, are in this case perfectly simple and intelligible, and that with regard not only to production, but also to distribution. The religious world is but the reflex of the re into social relations with one another by treating their products as commodities and values, whereby they reduce their individual private labor to the stand, more especially in its bourgeois developments, Protestantism, Deism, etc., is the most fitting form of religion. In the ancient Asiatic and other ancient modes of production, we find that the conversion of products into commodities, and therefore importance, as the primitive communities approach nearer and nearer to their dissolution. Trading nations, properly so called, exist in the ancient world only in its interstices, like the gods of Epicurus in the Intermundia, or like Jews in the pores of Polish society. Those ancient social organisms of production are, as compared with bourgeois society, extremely simple and transparent. But they are founded either on the immature development of man individually, who has not yet severed the umbilical cord that unites him with his fellow men in a primitive tribal community, 
or upon direct relations of subjection. They can arise and exist only when the development of the productive life between man and man and between man and nature are correspondingly narrow. This narrowness is reflected in the ancient worship of nature and in the other elements of the popular religions. The religious reflex of the real world can in any case only then finally vanish when the practical relations of everyday life offer to man none but perfectly intelligible and reasonable relations with regard to his fellow men and to nature. The life process of society, which is based on the process of material production, does not strip off its mystical veil until it is treated as production by freely associated men, and is consciously regulated by them in accordance with a settled plan. This, however, demands for society a certain material groundwork or set of conditions of existence which in their turn are the spontaneous product of a long and painful process of development. Political economy has indeed analysed, however incompletely, value and its magnitude, and has discovered what lies beneath these forms. Footnote the insufficiency of Ricardo's analysis of the magnitude of value, and his analysis is by far the best, will appear from the third and fourth books of this work. As regards value in general, it is the weak point of the classical school of political economy that it nowhere expressly and with full consciousness distinguishes between labour as it appears in the value of a product and the same labour as it appears in the use value of that product. Of course, the distinction is practically made, since this school treats labour at one time under its quantitative aspect, at another under its qualitative aspect. But it has not the least idea that when the difference between various kinds of labour is treated as purely quantitative, their qualitative unity or equality, and therefore their reduction to abstract human labour, is implied. For instance, Ricardo declares that he agrees with de Tracy in this proposition. As it is certain that our physical and moral faculties are alone our original riches, the employment of those faculties, labour of some kind, is our only original treasure, and it is always from this employment that all those things are created which we call riches. It is certain, too, that all those things only represent the labour which has created them, and if they have a value, or even two distinct values, they can only derive them from that, the value, of the labour from which they emanate. Ricardo the principles of political economy. We would here only point out that Ricardo puts his own more profound interpretation upon the words of Distut. What the latter really says is that, on the one hand, all things which constitute wealth represent the labour that creates them, but that, on the other hand, they acquire their two different values, use value and exchange value, from the value of labour. He thus falls into the commonplace error of the vulgar economists, who assume the value of one commodity, in this case labour, in order to determine the values of the rest. But Ricardo reads him as if he had said that labour, not the value of labour, is embodied both in use value and exchange value. Nevertheless, Ricardo himself pays so little attention to the twofold character of the labour which has a twofold embodiment that he devotes the whole of his chapter on value and riches, their distinctive properties, to a laborious examination of the trivialities of a J.B. Say. And at the finish, he is quite astonished to find that Destut on the one hand agrees with him as to labour being the source of value, 
and on the other hand with J. B. Say as to the notion of value. End of footnote. But it has never once asked the question why labour is represented by the value of its product and labour time by the magnitude of that value. Footnote. It is one of the chief failings of classical economy that it has never succeeded, by means of its analysis of commodities, and in particular of their value, in discovering that form under which value becomes exchange value. Even Adam Smith and Ricardo, the best representatives of the school, treat the form of value as a thing of no importance, as having no connection with the inherent nature of commodities. The reason for this is not solely because their attention is entirely absorbed in the analysis of the magnitude of value. It lies deeper. The value form of the product of labor is not only the most abstract, but is also the most universal form taken by the product in bourgeois production, and stamps that production as a particular species of social production, and thereby gives it its special historical character. If, then, we treat this mode of production as one eternally fixed by nature for every state of society, we necessarily overlook that which is the differentia specifica of the value form, and consequently of the commodity form, and of its further developments, money form, capital form, etc. We consequently find that economists, who are thoroughly agreed as to labor time being the measure of the magnitude of value, have the most strange and contradictory ideas of money, the perfected form of the general equivalent. This is seen in a striking manner when they treat of banking, where the commonplace definitions of money will no longer hold water. This led to the rise of a restored mercantile system, gunia, etc., which sees in value nothing but a social form, or rather the unsubstantial ghost of that form. Once for all I may here state that by classical political economy I understand that economy which, since the time of W. Petty, has investigated the real relations of production in bourgeois society in contradistinction to vulgar economy, which deals with appearances only, ruminates without ceasing on the materials long since provided by scientific economy, and there seeks plausible explanations of the most obtrusive phenomena for bourgeois daily use. But for the rest, confines itself to systematizing in a pedantic way, and proclaiming for everlasting truths the trite ideas held by the self-complacent bourgeoisie with regard to their own world, to them the best of all possible worlds. End of footnote. These formulae, which bear it stamped upon them in unmistakable letters that they belong to a state of society in which the process of production has the mastery over man instead of being controlled by him, such formulae appear to the bourgeois intellect to be as much a self-evident necessity imposed by nature as productive labor itself. Hence, Forms of social production that preceded the bourgeois form are treated by the bourgeoisie in much the same way as the fathers of the church treated pre-Christian religions. Footnote. Economists have a singular method of procedure. There are only two kinds of institutions for them, artificial and natural. The institutions of feudalism are artificial institutions, those of the bourgeoisie are natural institutions. In this they resemble the theologians, who likewise establish two kinds of religion. Every religion which is not theirs is an invention of men, while their own is an emanation from God. Thus there has been history, but there is no longer any. Karl Marx, Misère de la Philosophie, Réponse à la philosophie de la misère par M. Proudhon, 1847. 
truly comical is Monsieur Bastia, who imagines that the ancient Greeks and Romans lived by plunder alone. But when people plunder for centuries, there must always be something at hand for them to seize. The objects of plunder must be continually reproduced. It would thus appear that even Greeks and Romans had some process of production, consequently an economy, which just as much constituted the material basis of their world as bourgeois economy constitutes that of our modern world. Or perhaps Bastia means that a mode of production based on slavery is based on a system of plunder. In that case he treads on dangerous ground. If a giant thinker like Aristotle erred in his appreciation of slave labour, why should a dwarf economist like Bastia be right in his appreciation of wage labour? I seize this opportunity of shortly answering an objection taken by a German paper in America to my work Zur Kritik der politischen Ökonomie, 1859. In the estimation of that paper, my view that each special mode of production and the social relations corresponding to it, in short, that the economic structure of society is the real basis on which the juridical and political superstructure is raised, and to which definite social forms of thought correspond, that the mode of production determines the character of the social, political, and intellectual life generally, all this is very true for our own times, in which material interests preponderate, but not for the Middle Ages in which Catholicism, nor for Athens and Rome, where politics reign supreme. In the first place, it strikes one as an odd thing for anyone to suppose that these well-worn phrases about the Middle Ages and the ancient world are unknown to anyone else. This much, however, is clear that the Middle Ages could not live on Catholicism, nor the ancient world on politics. On the contrary, it is the mode in which they gained a livelihood that explains why here politics and there Catholicism played the chief part. For the rest, it requires but a slight acquaintance with the history of the Roman Republic, for example, to be aware that its secret history is the history of its landed property. On the other hand, Don Quixote long ago paid the penalty for wrongly imagining that knight-errantry was compatible with all economic forms of society. End of footnote. To what extent some economists are misled by the fetishism inherent in commodities or by the objective appearance of the social characteristics of labour is shown, amongst other ways, by the dull and tedious quarrel over the part played by nature in the formation of exchange value. Since exchange value is a definite social manner of expressing the amount of labour bestowed upon an object, Nature has no more to do with it than it has in fixing the course of exchange. The mode of production in which the product takes the form of a commodity or is produced directly for exchange is the most general and most embryonic form of bourgeois production. It therefore makes its appearance at an early date in history, though not in the same predominating and characteristic manner as nowadays. Hence, its fetish character is comparatively easy to be seen through. But when we come to more concrete forms, even this appearance of simplicity vanishes. Whence arose the illusions of the monetary system? To it, gold and silver, when serving as money, did not represent a social relation between producers, but were natural objects with strange social properties and modern economy, which looks down with such disdain on the monetary system, does not its superstition come out as clear as noonday whenever it treats of capital? How long is it since economy discarded the physiocratic illusion that rents grow out of the soil and not out of society? But not to anticipate, 
we will content ourselves with yet another example relating to the commodity form. Could commodities themselves speak, they would say, Our use value may be a thing that interests men. It is no part of us as objects. What, however, does belong to us as objects is our value. Our natural intercourse as commodities proves it. In the eyes of each other, we are nothing but exchange values. Now listen how those commodities speak through the mouth of the economist. Value, that is, exchange value, is a property of things. Riches, that is, use value, of man. Value, in this sense, necessarily implies exchanges. Riches do not. Footnote. Observations on certain verbal disputes in political economy, particularly relating to value and to demand and supply. London, 1821. End of footnote. Riches, use value, are the attribute of men. Value is the attribute of commodities. A man or a community is rich. A pearl or a diamond is valuable. A pearl or a diamond is valuable as a pearl or a diamond. So far, no chemist has ever discovered exchange value either in a pearl or a diamond. The economic discoverers of this chemical element, who, by the by, lay special claim to critical acumen, find, however, that the use value of objects belongs to them independently of their material properties, while their value, on the other hand, forms a part of them as objects. What confirms them in this view is the peculiar circumstance that the use value of objects is realized without exchange, by means of a direct relation between the objects and man, while on the other hand their value is realized only by exchange, that is, by means of a social process. Who fails here to call to mind our good friend Dogberry, who informs neighbor Seacole that to be a well-favored man is the gift of fortune, but reading and writing comes by nature. Footnote. The author of Observations and S. Bailey accuse Ricardo of converting exchange value from something relative into something absolute. The opposite is the fact. He has explained the apparent relation between objects, such as diamonds and pearls, in which relation they appear as exchange values, and disclosed the true relation hidden behind the appearances, namely, their relation to each other as mere expressions of human labor. If the followers of Ricardo answer Bailey somewhat rudely, and by no means convincingly, the reason is to be sought in this, that they were unable to find in Ricardo's own works any key to the hidden relations existing between value and its form, exchange value. End of footnote. Chapter 2. Exchange it is plain that commodities cannot go to market and make exchanges of their own account. We must therefore have recourse to their guardians, who are also their owners. Commodities are things, and therefore without power of resistance against man. If they are wanting in docility, he can use force. In other words, he can take possession of them. Footnote in the twelfth century, so renowned for its piety, they included amongst commodities some very delicate things. Thus a French poet of the period enumerates amongst the goods to be found in the market of Longy, not only clothing, shoes, leather, agricultural implements, etc., but also femme folle de leur corps. End of footnote. In order that these objects may enter into relation with each other as commodities, their guardians must place themselves in relation to one another, 
as persons whose will resides in those objects, and must behave in such a way that each does not appropriate the commodity of the other, and part with his own, except by means of an act done by mutual consent. They must, therefore, mutually recognize in each other the rights of private proprietors. This juridical relation, which thus expresses itself in a contract, whether such contract be part of a developed legal system or not, is a relation between two wills, and is but the reflex of the real economic relation between the two. It is this economic relation that determines the subject matter comprised in each such juridical act. Footnote. Proudhon begins by taking his ideal of justice, of justice éternelle, from the juridical relations that correspond to the production of commodities. Thereby, it may be noted, he proves, to the consolation of all good citizens, that the production of commodities is a form of production as everlasting as justice. Then he turns round and seeks to reform the actual production of commodities and the actual legal system corresponding thereto in accordance with this ideal. What opinion should we have of a chemist who, instead of studying the actual laws of the molecular changes in the composition and decomposition of matter, and on that foundation solving definite problems, claimed to regulate the composition and decomposition of matter by means of the eternal ideas of naturalité and affinité. Do we really know any more about usury when we say it contradicts justice éternelle, équité éternelle, mutualité éternelle, and other vérité éternelle? than the fathers of the church did when they said it was incompatible with grâce éternelle, foi éternelle, and la volonté éternelle de Dieu. End of footnote. The persons exist for one another merely as representative of, and therefore as owners of, commodities. In the course of our investigation we shall find, in general, that the characters who appear on the economic stage are but the personifications of the economic relations that exist between them. What chiefly distinguishes a commodity from its owner is the fact that it looks upon every other commodity as but the form of appearance of its own value. A born leveller and a cynic, it is always ready to exchange not only soul but body with any and every other commodity, be the same more repulsive than Mariton herself. The owner makes up for this lack in the commodity of a sense of the concrete by his own five and more senses. His commodity possesses for himself no immediate use value, otherwise he would not bring it to the market. It has use value for others, but for himself its only direct use-value is that of being a depository of exchange-value, and consequently a means of exchange. Footnote. For twofold is the use of every object. The one is peculiar to the object as such, the other is not, as a sandal which may be worn, and is also exchangeable. Both are uses of the sandal. For even he who exchanges the sandal for money or food he is in want of makes use of the sandal as a sandal, but not in its natural way, for it has not been made for the sake of being exchanged. Aristoteles. End of footnote. Therefore, he makes up his mind to part with it for commodities whose value in use is of service to him. All commodities are non-use values for their owners and use values for their non-owners. Consequently, they must all change hands. But this change of hands is what constitutes their exchange, and the latter puts them in relation with each other as values and realizes them as values. Hence, commodities must be realized as values before they can be realized as use values. On the other hand, they must show that they are use-values before they can be realized as values. 
for the labour spent upon them counts effectively only in so far as it is spent in a form that is useful for others. Whether that labour is useful for others and its product consequently capable of satisfying the wants of others can be proved only by the act of exchange. Every owner of a commodity wishes to part with it in exchange only for those commodities whose use value satisfies some want of his. Looked at in this way, exchange is for him simply a private transaction. On the other hand, he desires to realize the value of his commodity, to convert it into any other suitable commodity of equal value, irrespective of whether his own commodity has or has not any use value for the owner of the other. From this point of view, exchange is for him a social transaction of a general character. But one and the same set of transactions cannot be simultaneously for all owners of commodities, both exclusively private and exclusively social and general. Let us look at the matter a little closer. To the owner of a commodity, every other commodity is, in regard to his own, a particular equivalent, and consequently his own commodity is the universal equivalent for all the others. But since this applies to every owner, there is, in fact, no commodity acting as universal equivalent, and the relative value of commodities possesses no general form under which they can be equated as values and have the magnitude of their values compared. So far, therefore, they do not confront each other as commodities, but only as products or use values. In their difficulties, our commodity owners think like Faust. Im Anfang war die Tat. In the beginning was the deed. Goethe, Faust. They therefore acted and transacted before they thought. Instinctively they conform to the laws imposed by the nature of commodities. They cannot bring their commodities into relation as values, and therefore as commodities, except by comparing them with some one other commodity as the universal equivalent. That we saw from the analysis of a commodity. But a particular commodity cannot become the universal equivalent except by a social act. The social action, therefore, of all other commodities sets apart the particular commodity in which they all represent their values. Thereby the bodily form of this commodity becomes the form of the socially recognized universal equivalent. To be the universal equivalent becomes, by this social process, the specific function of the commodity thus excluded by the rest. Thus it becomes money. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Revelations chapter 17 verse 13 And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Revelations chapter 13 verse 17 Apocalypse Money is a crystal formed of necessity in the course of the exchanges, whereby different products of labor are practically equated to one another and thus by practice converted into commodities. The historical progress and extension of exchanges develops the, the contrast, latent in commodities, between use value and value. The necessity for giving an external expression to this contrast for the purposes of commercial intercourse urges on the establishment of an independent form of value and finds no rest until it is once for all satisfied by the differentiation of commodities into commodities and money. At the same rate, then, as the conversion of products into commodities is being accomplished, so also is the conversion of one special commodity into money. Footnote. From this we may form an estimate of the shrewdness of the petit bourgeois socialism, which, while perpetuating the production of commodities, aims at abolishing the antagonism between money and commodities, 
and consequently, since money exists only by virtue of this antagonism, at abolishing money itself. We might just as well try to retain Catholicism without the Pope. End of footnote. The direct barter of products attains the elementary form of the relative expression of value in one respect, but not in another. That form is X commodity A equals Y commodity B. The form of direct barter is X use value A equals Y use value B. Footnote. So long as, instead of two distinct use values being exchanged, a chaotic mass of articles are offered as the equivalent of a single article, which is often the case with savages, even the direct barter of products is in its first infancy. End of footnote. The articles A and B in this case are not as yet commodities, but become so only by the act of barter. The first step made by an object of utility towards acquiring exchange value is when it forms a non-use value for its owner, and that happens when it forms a superfluous portion of some article required for his immediate wants. Objects in themselves are external to man and consequently alienable by him. In order that this alienation may be reciprocal, it is only necessary for men, by a tacit understanding, to treat each other as private owners of those alienable objects, and, by implication, as independent individuals. But such a state of reciprocal independence has no existence in a primitive society based on property in common. Whether such a society takes the form of a patriarchal family, an ancient Indian community, or a Peruvian Inca state. The exchange of commodities, therefore, first begins on the boundaries of such communities, at their points of contact with other similar communities, or with members of the latter. So soon, however, as products once become commodities in the external relations of a community, they also, by reaction, become so in its internal intercourse. The proportions in which they are exchangeable are at first quite a matter of chance. What makes them exchangeable is the mutual desire of their owners to alienate them. Meantime, the need for foreign objects of utility gradually establishes itself. The constant repetition of exchange makes it a normal social act. Exchange. From that moment, the distinction becomes firmly established between the utility of an object for the purposes of consumption and its utility for the purposes of exchange. Its use value becomes distinguished from its exchange value. On the other hand, the quantitative proportion in which the articles are exchangeable becomes dependent on their production itself. Custom stamps them as values with definite magnitudes. In the direct barter of products, each commodity is directly a means of exchange to its owner and to all other persons an equivalent, but that only in so far as it has no use value for them. At this stage, therefore, the articles exchanged do not acquire a value form independent of their own use value or of the individual needs of the exchangers. The necessity for a value form grows with the increasing number and variety of the commodities exchanged. The problem and the means of solution arise simultaneously. Commodity owners never equate their own commodities to those of others and exchange them on a large scale without different kinds of commodities belonging to different owners being exchangeable for, and equated as values to, one and the same special article. Such last-mentioned article, by becoming the equivalent of various other commodities, acquires at once, though within narrow limits, the character of a general social equivalent. This character comes and goes with the momentary social acts that called it into life. In turns, and transiently, 
it attaches itself first to this and then to that commodity. But with the development of exchange, it fixes itself firmly and exclusively to particular sorts of commodities and becomes crystallized by assuming the money form. The particular kind of commodity to which it sticks is at first a matter of accident. Nevertheless, there are two circumstances whose influence is decisive. The money form attaches itself either to the most important articles of exchange from outside, and these in fact are primitive and natural forms in which the exchange value of home products finds expression, or else it attaches itself to the object of utility that forms, like cattle, the chief portion of indigenous alienable wealth. Nomad races are the first to develop the money form because all their worldly goods consist of movable objects and are therefore directly alienable, and because their mode of life, by continually bringing them into contact with foreign communities, solicits the exchange of products. Man has often made man himself, under the form of slaves, serve as the primitive material of money, but has never used land for that purpose. Such an idea could only spring up in a, a bourgeois society already well developed. It dates from the last third of the seventeenth century, and the first attempt to put it in practice on a national scale was made a century afterwards, during the French bourgeois revolution. In proportion as exchange bursts its local bonds, and the value of commodities more and more expands into an embodiment of human labor in the abstract, in the same proportion the character of money attaches itself to commodities that are by nature fitted to perform the social function of a universal equivalent. Those commodities are the precious metals. The truth of the proposition that, although gold and silver are not by nature money, money is by nature gold and silver, is shown by the fitness of the physical properties of these metals for the functions of money. Footnote. The metals are by their nature money. Galliani, della moneta, in Custodis Collection, Parte Moderna. End of footnote. Up to this point, however, we are acquainted only with one function of money, namely, to serve as the form of manifestation of the value of commodities, or as the material in which the magnitudes of their values are socially expressed. An adequate form of manifestation of value, a fit embodiment of abstract, undifferentiated, and therefore equal human labor, that material alone can be whose every sample exhibits the same uniform qualities. On the other hand, since the difference between the magnitudes of value is purely quantitative, the money commodity must be susceptible of merely quantitative differences, must therefore be divisible at will, and equally capable of being reunited. Gold and silver possess these properties by nature. The use value of the money commodity becomes twofold. In addition to its special use value as a commodity, gold, for instance, serving to stop teeth, to form the raw material of articles of luxury, etc., it acquires a formal use value, originating in its specific social function. Since all commodities are merely particular equivalents of money, the latter being their universal equivalent, they, with regard to the latter as the universal commodity, play the parts of particular commodities. We have seen that the money form is but the reflex, thrown upon one single commodity, of the value relations between all the rest. That money is a commodity is therefore a new discovery only for those who, when they analyze it, start from its fully developed shape. Footnote. Silver and gold themselves, 
which we may call by the general name of bullion, are commodities rising and falling in value. Bullion, then, may be reckoned to be of higher value where the smaller weight will purchase the greater quantity of the product or manufacture of the country, etc. A discourse of the general notions of money trade and exchanges as they stand in relation to each other by a merchant, London, 1695. Silver and gold, coined or uncoined, though they are used for a measure of all other things, are no less a commodity than wine, oil, tobacco, cloth, or stuffs. A discourse concerning trade, and that in particular of the East Indies, etc., London, 1689. The stock and riches of the kingdom cannot properly be confined to money, nor ought gold and silver to be excluded from being merchandised. The East India trade, a most profitable trade. London, 1677. End of footnote. The act of exchange gives to the commodity converted into money not its value, but its specific value form. By confounding these two distinct things, some writers have been led to hold that the value of gold and silver is imaginary. Footnote. Gold and silver have value as metals before they are money. Galliani. Locke says, The universal consent of mankind gave to silver, on account of its qualities which made it suitable for money, an imaginary value. Law, on the other hand, How could different nations give an imaginary value to any single thing, or how could this imaginary value have maintained itself? But the following shows how little he himself understood about the matter. Silver was exchanged in proportion to the value in use it possessed, consequently in proportion to its real value. By its adoption as money, it received an additional value, une valeur additionnelle. Jean Law, Considération sur le numéraire et le commerce. In Economiste Financier du Huitième Siècle. End of footnote. The fact that money can, in certain functions, be replaced by mere symbols of itself gave rise to that other mistaken notion that it is itself a mere symbol. Nevertheless, under this error lurked a presentiment that the money form of an object is not an inseparable part of that object but is simply the form under which certain social relations manifest themselves. In this sense, every commodity is a symbol, since, in so far as it is value, it is only the material envelope of the human labor spent upon it. Footnote. Money is the commodity's symbol. V. de Forbonnet, Element du Commerce, 1766. As a symbol, it is attracted by commodities. Money is a symbol of a thing and represents it. Montesquieu, Esprit des Lois, Oeuvre, London, 1767. Money is not a mere symbol, for it is itself wealth. It does not represent the values, it is their equivalence. Le Trône, the notion of value contemplates the valuable article as a mere symbol, the article counts not for what it is, but for what it is worth. Hegel Lawyers started long before economists the idea that money is a mere symbol and that the value of the precious metals is purely imaginary. This they did in the sycophantic service of the crowned heads, supporting the right of the latter to debase the coinage during the whole of the Middle Ages by the traditions of the Roman Empire and the conceptions of money to be found in the Pandects. Let no one call into question, says an apt scholar of theirs, Philip of Valois, in a decree of 1346, that the trade, the composition, the supply, and the power of issuing ordinances on the currency belongs exclusively to us and to our royal majesty, 
to fix such a rate and at such price as it shall please us and seem good to us. It was a maxim of the Roman law that the value of money was fixed by decree of the emperor. It was expressly forbidden to treat money as a commodity. However, it shall not be lawful to anyone to buy money, for, as it was created for public use, it is not permissible for it to be a commodity. Some good work on this question has been done by G. F. Pagnini, 1751, Custodi Parte Moderna. In the second part of his work, Pagnini directs his polemics especially against the lawyers. End of footnote. But if it be declared that the social characters assumed by objects or the material forms assumed by the social qualities of labor under the regime of a definite mode of production are mere symbols, it is in the same breath also declared that these characteristics are arbitrary fictions sanctioned by the so-called universal consent of mankind. This suited the mode of explanation in favor during the eighteenth century. Unable to account for the origin of the puzzling forms assumed by social relations between man and man, people sought to denude them of their strange appearance by ascribing to them a conventional origin. It has already been remarked that the equivalent form of a commodity does not imply the determination of the magnitude of its value. Therefore, although we may be aware that gold is money, and consequently directly exchangeable for all other commodities, yet that fact by no means tells how much ten pounds, for instance, of gold is worth. Money, like every other commodity, cannot express the magnitude of its value except relatively in other commodities. This value is determined by the labor time required for its production and is expressed by the quantity of any other commodity that costs the same amount of labor time. Footnote. If a man can bring to London an ounce of silver out of the earth in Peru in the same time that he can produce a bushel of corn, then the one is the natural price of the other. Now, if by reason of new or more easier mines a man can procure two ounces of silver, as easily as he formerly did one, the corn will be as cheap at ten shillings the bushel as it was before at five shillings. Ceteris paribus. William Petty, A Treatise of Taxes and Contributions, London, 1667. Such quantitative determination of its relative value takes place at the source of its production by means of barter. When it steps into circulation as money, its value is already given. In the last decades of the seventeenth century, it had already been shown that money is a commodity, but this step marks only the infancy of the analysis. The difficulty lies not in comprehending that money is a commodity, but in discovering how, why, and by what means a commodity becomes money. Footnote. The learned Professor Rocher, after first informing us that the false definitions of money may be divided into two main groups, those which make it more and those which make it less than a commodity, gives us a long and very mixed catalogue of works on the nature of money from which it appears that he has not the remotest idea of the real history of the theory, and then he moralizes thus. For the rest, it is not to be denied that most of the later economists do not bear sufficiently in mind the peculiarities that distinguish money from other commodities. It is then, after all, either more or less than a commodity. So far, the semi-mercantilist reaction of Ghani is not altogether without foundation. Wilhelm Rocher Die Grundlagen der Nationale Ökonomie, 3rd edition, 1858. More, less, not sufficiently, so far, 
not altogether. What clearness and precision of ideas and language! And such eclectic professorial twaddle is modestly baptised by Mr. Rocher, the anatomico-physiological method of political economy. One discovery, however, he must have credit for, namely, that money is a pleasant commodity. End of footnote. We have already seen, from the most elementary expression of value, X commodity A equals Y commodity B, that the object in which the magnitude of the value of another object is represented appears to have the equivalent form independently of this relation, as a social property given to it by nature. We followed up this false appearance to its final establishment, which is complete so soon as the universal equivalent form becomes identified with the bodily form of a particular commodity, and thus crystallized into the money form. What appears to happen is not that gold becomes money, in consequence of all other commodities expressing their values in it, but on the contrary, that all other commodities universally express their values in gold, because it is money. The intermediate steps of the process vanish in the result, and leave no trace behind. Commodities find their own value already completely represented, without any initiative on their part, in another commodity existing in company with them. These objects, gold and silver, just as they come out of the bowels of the earth, are forthwith the direct incarnation of all human labour. Hence the magic of money. In the form of society now under consideration, the behaviour of men in the social process of production is purely atomic. Hence their relations to each other in production assume a material character independent of their control and conscious individual action. These facts manifest themselves at first by products as a general rule taking the form of commodities. We have seen how the progressive development of a society of commodity producers stamps one privileged commodity with the character of money. Hence the riddle presented by money is but the riddle presented by commodities, only it now strikes us in its most glaring form. Chapter 3 Money or the Circulation of Commodities Section 1. The Measure of Values Throughout this work, I assume, for the sake of simplicity, gold as the money commodity. The first chief function of money is to supply commodities with the material for the expression of their values, or to represent their values as magnitudes of the same denomination, qualitatively equal and quantitatively comparable. It thus serves as a universal measure of value, and only by virtue of this function does gold, the equivalent commodity par excellence, become money. It is not money that renders commodities commensurable, just the contrary. It is because all commodities, as values, are realized human labor, and therefore commensurable, that their values can be measured by one and the same special commodity, and the latter be converted into the common measure of their values, that is, into money. Money as a measure of value is the phenomenal form that must of necessity be assumed by that measure of value which is immanent in commodities. Labour Time Footnote The question why does not money directly represent labour time, so that a piece of paper may represent, for instance, X hours labour, is at bottom the same as the question why, given the production of commodities, must products take the form of commodities? This is evident, since their taking the form of commodities implies their differentiation into commodities and money. Or, why cannot private labour, labour for the account of private individuals, be treated as its opposite, immediate social labour? 
I have elsewhere examined thoroughly the utopian idea of labor money in a society founded on the production of commodities. On this point, I will only say further that Owen's labor money, for instance, is no more money than a ticket for the theater. Owen presupposes directly associated labor, a form of production that is entirely inconsistent with the production of commodities. The certificate of labor is merely evidence of the part taken by the individual in the common labor and of his right to a certain portion of the common produce destined for consumption. But it never enters into Owen's head to presuppose the production of commodities and at the same time, by juggling with money, to try to evade the necessary conditions of that production. End of footnote. The expression of the value of a commodity in gold, X commodity A equals Y money commodity, is its money form or price. A single equation, such as one ton of iron equals two ounces of gold, now suffices to express the value of the iron in a socially valid manner. There is no longer any need for this equation to figure as a link in the chain of equations that express the values of all other commodities, because the equivalent commodity, gold, now has the character of money. The general form of relative value has resumed its original shape of simple or isolated relative value. On the other hand, the expanded expression of relative value, the endless series of equations, has now become the form peculiar to the relative value of the money commodity. The series itself, too, is now given, and has social recognition in the prices of actual commodities. We have only to read the quotations of a price list backwards to find the magnitude of the value of money expressed in all sorts of commodities, but money itself has no price. In order to put it on an equal footing with all other commodities in this respect, we should be obliged to equate it to itself as its own equivalent. The price or money form of commodities is, like their form of value generally, a form quite distinct from their palpable bodily form. It is therefore a purely ideal or mental form. Although invisible, the value of iron, linen, and corn has actual existence in these very articles. It is ideally made perceptible by their equality with gold, a relation that, so to say, exists only in their own heads. Their owner must, therefore, lend them his tongue or hang a ticket on them before their prices can be communicated to the outside world. Footnote. Savages and half-civilized races use the tongue differently. Captain Parry says of the inhabitants on the west coast of Baffin's Bay, In this case, he refers to barter, they licked it, the thing represented to them, twice to their tongues, after which they seem to consider the bargain satisfactorily concluded. In the same way, the eastern Eskimo licked the articles they received in exchange. If the tongue is thus used in the north as the organ of appropriation, no wonder that, in the south, the stomach serves as the organ of accumulated property, and that a kafir estimates the wealth of a man by the size of his belly. That the kafirs know what they are about is shown by the following. At the same time that the official British Health Report of 1864 disclosed the deficiency of fat-forming food among a large part of the working class, a certain Dr. Harvey, not, however, the celebrated discoverer of the circulation of the blood, made a good thing by advertising recipes for reducing the superfluous fat of the bourgeoisie and aristocracy. End of footnote. Since the expression of the value of commodities in gold is a merely ideal act, we may use for this purpose imaginary or ideal money. Every trader knows that he is far from having turned his goods into money when he has expressed their value in a price 
or in imaginary money, and that it does not require the least bit of real gold to estimate in that metal millions of pounds worth of goods. When, therefore, money serves as a measure of value, it is employed only as imaginary or ideal money. This circumstance has given rise to the wildest theories. Footnote. See Karl Marx, Zur Kritik, etc. Theorien von der Masseinheit des Geldes. End of footnote. But although the money that performs the functions of a measure of value is only ideal money, price depends entirely upon the actual substance that is money. The value, or in other words the quantity, of human labor contained in a ton of iron is expressed in imagination by such a quantity of the money commodity as contains the same amount of labor as the iron. According, therefore, as the measure of value is gold, silver, or copper, the value of the ton of iron will be expressed by very different prices, or will be represented by very different quantities of those metals respectively. If, therefore, two different commodities, such as gold and silver, are simultaneously measures of value, all commodities have two prices, one a gold price, the other a silver price. These exist quietly side by side, so long as the ratio of the value of silver to that of gold remains unchanged, say, at fifteen to one. Every change in their ratio disturbs the ratio which exists between the gold prices and the silver prices of commodities, and thus proves, by facts, that a double standard of value is inconsistent with the functions of a standard. Footnote Wherever gold and silver have by law been made to perform the function of money, or of a measure of value side by side, it has always been tried, but in vain, to treat them as one and the same material. To assume that there is an invariable ratio between the quantities of gold and silver in which a given quantity of labor time is incorporated is to assume, in fact, that gold and silver are of one and the same material, and that a given mass of the less valuable metal, silver, is a constant fraction of a given mass of gold. From the reign of Edward III to the time of George II, the history of money in England consists of one long series of perturbations caused by the clashing of the legally fixed ratio between the values of gold and silver, with the fluctuations in their real values. At one time gold was too high, at another silver. The metal, that for the time being was estimated below its value, was withdrawn from circulation, mated, and exported. The ratio between the two metals was then again altered by law, but the new nominal ratio soon came into conflict again with the real one. In our own times, the slight and transient fall in the value of gold compared with silver which was a consequence of the Indo-Chinese demand for silver, produced on a far more extended scale in France the same phenomena, export of silver, and its expulsion from circulation by gold. During the years 1855, 1856, and 1857, the excess in France of gold imports over gold exports amounted to 41,580,000, while the excess of silver exports over silver imports was 14,704,000. In fact, in those countries in which both metals are legally measures of value, and therefore both legal tender so that everyone has the option of paying in either metal, the metal that rises in value is at a premium, and like every other commodity, measures its price in the overestimated metal which alone serves in reality as the standard of value. The result of all experience and history with regard to this equation is simply that where two commodities perform by law the functions of a measure of value, in practice one alone 
maintains that position. Karl Marx End of footnote Commodities with definite prices present themselves under the form A commodity A equals X gold, B commodity B equals Z gold, C commodity C equals Y gold, etc., where A, B, C represent definite quantities of the commodities A, B, C, and X, Z, Y definite quantities of gold. The values of these commodities are therefore changed in imagination into so many different quantities of gold. Hence, in spite of the confusing variety of the commodities themselves, their values become magnitudes of the same denomination, gold magnitudes. They are now capable of being compared with each other and measured, and the want becomes technically felt of comparing them with some fixed quantity of gold as a unit measure. This unit, by subsequent division into aliquot parts, becomes itself the standard or scale. Before they become money, gold, silver, and copper already possess such standard measures in their standards of weight, so that, for example, a pound weight, while serving as the unit, is on the one hand divisible into ounces, and on the other may be combined to make up hundredweights. Footnote. The peculiar circumstance has been explained as follows. Our coinage was originally adapted to the employment of silver only. Hence, an ounce of silver can always be divided into certain adequate number of pieces of coin. But as gold was introduced at a later period into a coinage adapted only to silver, an ounce of gold cannot be coined into an aliquot number of pieces. McLaren, A Sketch of the History of the Currency, London, 1858 End of footnote. It is owing to this that in all metallic currencies the names given to the standards of money or of price were originally taken from the pre-existing names of the standards of weight. As measure of value and as standard of price, money has two entirely distinct functions to perform. It is the measure of value inasmuch as it is the socially recognized incarnation of human labor. It is the standard of price inasmuch as it is a fixed weight of metal. As the measure of value, it serves to convert the values of all the manifold commodities into prices, into imaginary quantities of gold. As the standard of price, it measures those quantities of gold. The measure of values measures commodities considered as values. The standard of price measures, on the contrary, quantities of gold by a unit quantity of gold, not the value of one quantity of gold by the weight of another. In order to make gold a standard of price, a certain weight must be fixed upon as the unit. In this case, as in all cases of measuring quantities of the same denomination, the establishment of an unvarying unit of measure is all-important. Hence, the less the unit is subject to variation, so much the better does the standard of price fulfill its office. But only in so far as it is itself a product of labor, and therefore potentially variable in value, can gold serve as a measure of value. Footnote. With English writers, the confusion between measure of value and standard of price, standard of value, is indescribable. Their functions, as well as their names, are constantly interchanged. End of footnote. It is in the first place quite clear that a change in the value of gold does not in any way affect its function as a standard of price. No matter how this value varies, the proportions between the values of different quantities of the metal remain constant. However great the fall in its value, twelve ounces of gold still have twelve times the value of one ounce, and in prices the only thing considered is the relation between different quantities of gold. Since, on the other hand, no rise or fall in the value of an ounce of gold can alter its weight, 
no alteration can take place in the weight of its aliquot parts. Thus, gold always renders the same service as an invariable standard of price, however much its value may vary. In the second place, a change in the value of gold does not interfere with its functions as a measure of value. The change affects all commodities simultaneously, and therefore, Ceteris paribus leaves their relative values inter se unaltered, although those values are now expressed in higher or lower gold prices. Just as when we estimate the value of any commodity by a definite quantity of the use value of some other commodity, so in estimating the value of the former in gold, we assume nothing more than that the production of a given quantity of gold costs, at the given period, a given amount of labour. As regards the fluctuations of prices generally, they are subject to the laws of elementary relative value investigated in a former chapter. A general rise in the prices of commodities can result only either from a rise in their values, the value of money remaining constant, or from a fall in the value of money, the values of commodities remaining constant. On the other hand, a general fall in prices can result only either from a fall in the values of commodities, the value of money remaining constant, or from a rise in the value of money, the values of commodities remaining constant. It therefore by no means follows that a rise in the value of money necessarily implies a proportional fall in the prices of commodities, or that a fall in the value of money implies a proportional rise in prices. Such change of price holds good only in the case of commodities whose value remains constant. With those, for example, whose value rises, simultaneously with and proportionally to that of money, there is no alteration in price. And if their value rise either slower or faster than that of money, the fall or rise in their prices will be determined by the difference between the change in their value and that of money, and so on. Let us now go back to the consideration of the price form. By degrees there arises a discrepancy between the current money names of the various weights of the precious metal, figuring as money, and the actual weights which those names originally represented. This discrepancy is the result of historical causes, among which the chief are 1. The importation of foreign money into an imperfectly developed community. This happened in Rome in its early days, where gold and silver coins circulated at first as foreign commodities. The names of these foreign coins never coincide with those of the indigenous weights. Two. As wealth increases, the less precious metal is thrust out by the more precious from its place as a measure of value, copper by silver, silver by gold. However much this order of sequence may be in contradiction with poetical chronology. Footnote. Moreover, it has not general historical validity. End of footnote. The word pound, for instance, was the money name given to an actual pound weight of silver. When gold replaced silver as a measure of value, the same name was applied according to the ratio between the values of silver and gold, to perhaps one-fifteenth of a pound of gold. The word pound, as a money name, thus becomes differentiated from the same word as a weight name. Footnote. It is thus that the pound sterling in England denotes less than one-third of its original weight. The pound Scot, before the Union, only one-thirty-sixth. The French Livre, one-seventy-fourth. The Spanish Maravedi, less than one-one-thousandth. And the Portuguese Ray, a still smaller fraction. End of footnote. 3. The debasing of money carried on for centuries by kings and princes to such an extent that, 
of the original weights of the coins, nothing in fact remained but the names. Footnote. The coins which today are ideal are the oldest coins of every nation, and all of them were once real, and precisely because they were real, they were used for calculation. Galliani, Della Moneta. End of footnote. These historical causes convert the separation of the money name from the weight name into an established habit with the community. Since the standard of money is on the one hand purely conventional and must on the other hand find general acceptance, it is in the end regulated by law. A given weight of one of the precious metals, an ounce of gold for instance, becomes officially divided into aliquot parts with legally bestowed names such as pound, dollar, etc. These aliquot parts, which thenceforth serve as units of money, are then subdivided into other aliquot parts with legal names, such as shilling, penny, etc. Footnote. David Urquhart remarks in his Familiar Words on the monstrosity that nowadays a pound sterling, which is the unit of the English standard of money, is equal to about a quarter of an ounce of gold. This is falsifying a measure, not establishing a standard. He sees in this false denomination of the weight of gold, as in everything else, the falsifying hand of civilization. End of footnote. But, both before and after these divisions are made, a definite weight of metal is the standard of metallic money. The sole alteration consists in the subdivision and denomination. The prices or quantities of gold into which the values of commodities are ideally changed are therefore now expressed in the names of coins, or in the legally valid names of the subdivisions of the gold standard. Hence, instead of saying, a quarter of wheat is worth an ounce of gold, we say, it is worth three pounds seventeen shillings and tenpence halfpenny. In this way, commodities express by their prices how much they are worth, and money serves as money of account whenever it is a question of fixing the value of an article in its money form. Footnote. When Anacarsis was asked for what purposes the Greeks used money, he replied, for reckoning. End of footnote. The name of a thing is something distinct from the qualities of that thing. I know nothing of a man by knowing that his name is Jacob. In the same way, with regard to money, every trace of a value relation disappears in the names pound, dollar, franc, ducat, etc. The confusion caused by attributing a hidden meaning to these cabalistic signs is all the greater because these money names express both the values of commodities and at the same time aliquot parts of the weight of the metal that is the standard of money. Footnote. Owing to the fact that money, when serving as the standard of price, appears under the same reckoning names as do the prices of commodities, and that therefore the sum of three pounds seventeen shillings ten and a half pence may signify on the one hand an ounce weight of gold, and on the other the value of a ton of iron, this reckoning name of money has been called its mint price. Hence there sprang up the extraordinary notion that the value of gold is estimated in its own material, and that in contradistinction to all other commodities its price is fixed by the state. It was erroneously thought that the giving of reckoning names to definite weights of gold is the same thing as fixing the value of those weights. Karl Marx End of footnote On the other hand, it is absolutely necessary that value, in order that it may be distinguished from the varied bodily forms of commodities, should assume this material and unmeaning but at the same time purely social, form. Footnote. See Theorien von der Masseinheit des Geldes in Zur Kritik 
der politische Ökonomie etc. The fantastic notions about raising or lowering the mint price of money by transferring to greater or smaller weights of gold or silver the names already legally appropriated to fix weights of those metals. Such notions, at least in those cases in which they aim not at clumsy financial operations against creditors, both public and private, but at economic quack remedies, have been so exhaustively treated by William Petty in his Quantulum Cunque Concerning Money to the Lord Marquis of Halifax, 1682, that even his immediate followers, Sir Dudley North and John Locke, not to mention later ones, could only dilute him. If the wealth of a nation, he remarks, could be decoupled by a proclamation, it were strange that such proclamations have not long since been made by our governors. End of footnote. Price is the money name of the labor realized in a commodity. Hence the expression of the equivalence of a commodity with the sum of money constituting its price is a tautology. Footnote. Or indeed it must be admitted that a million in money is worth more than an equal value in commodities, le trône, which amounts to saying that one value is worth more than another value which is equal to it. End of footnote. Just as in general the expression of the relative value of a commodity is a statement of the equivalence of two commodities. But although price, being the exponent of the magnitude of a commodity's value, is the exponent of its exchange ratio with money, it does not follow that the exponent of this exchange ratio is necessarily the exponent of the magnitude of the commodity's value. Suppose two equal quantities of socially necessary labor to be respectively represented by one quarter of wheat and two pounds, nearly half an ounce of gold. Two pounds is the expression in money of the magnitude of the value of the quarter of wheat, or is its price. If now circumstances allow of this price being raised to three pounds or compel it to be reduced to one pound, then although one pound and three pounds may be too small or too great properly to express the magnitude of the wheat's value, nevertheless they are its prices for they are, in the first place, the form under which its value appears, that is, money, and in the second place, the exponents of its exchange ratio with money. If the conditions of production, in other words, if the productive power of labor, remain constant, the same amount of social labor time must, both before and after the change in price, be expended in the reproduction of a quarter of wheat. This circumstance depends neither on the will of the wheat producer nor on that of the owners of other commodities. Magnitude of value expresses a relation of social production. It expresses the connection that necessarily exists between a certain article and the portion of the total labor time of society required to produce it. As soon as the magnitude of value is converted into price, the above necessary relation takes the shape of a more or less accidental exchange ratio between a single commodity and another, the money commodity. But this exchange ratio may express either the real magnitude of that commodity's value or the quantity of gold deviating from that value, for which, according to circumstances, it may be parted with. The possibility, therefore, of quantitative incongruity between price and magnitude of value, or the deviation of the former from the latter, is inherent in the price form itself. This is no defect, but on the contrary, admirably adapts the price form to a mode of production whose inherent laws impose themselves only as the mean of apparently lawless irregularities that compensate one another. The price form, however, is not only compatible with the possibility of a quantitative incongruity between magnitude of value and price, that is, between the former 
and its expression in money, but it may also conceal a qualitative inconsistency, so much so that although money is nothing but the value form of commodities, price ceases altogether to express value. Objects that in themselves are no commodities, such as conscience, honour, etc., are capable of being offered for sale by their holders, and of thus acquiring, through their price, the form of commodities. Hence, an object may have a price without having a value. The price in that case is imaginary, like certain quantities in mathematics. On the other hand, the imaginary price form may sometimes conceal either a direct or indirect real value relation. For instance, the price of uncultivated land, which is without value, because no human labor has been incorporated in it. Price, like relative value in general, expresses the value of a commodity, for example a ton of iron, by stating that a given quantity of the equivalent, for example an ounce of gold, is directly exchangeable for iron. But it by no means states the converse, that iron is directly exchangeable for gold. In order, therefore, that a commodity may in practice act effectively as exchange value, it must quit its bodily shape, must transform itself from mere imaginary into real gold. Although to the commodity such transubstantiation may be more difficult than to the Hegelian concept, the transition from necessity to freedom, or to a lobster, the casting of his shell, or to St. Jerome, the putting off flesh by his fight in the desert with the handsome women of his imagination, but also in his old age with the spiritual flesh. I thought, he says, I was in the spirit before the judge of the universe. Who art thou? asked the voice. I am a Christian. Thou liest, thundered back the great judge. Thou art naught but a Ciceronian. End of footnote. Though a commodity may, side by side with its actual form, iron, for instance, take in our imagination the form of gold, yet it cannot at one and the same time actually be both iron and gold. To fix its price, it suffices to equate it to gold in imagination but to enable it to render to its owner the service of a universal equivalent, it must be actually replaced by gold. If the owner of the iron were to go to the owner of some other commodity offered for exchange, and were to refer him to the price of the iron as proof that it was already money, he would get the same answer as St. Peter gave in heaven to Dante. A price therefore implies both that a commodity is exchangeable for money, and also that it must be so exchanged. On the other hand, gold serves as an ideal measure of value. Ideal measure of values, there lurks the hard cash. Section two, the medium of circulation. A. THE METAMORPHOSIS OF COMMODITIES We saw in a former chapter that the exchange of commodities implies contradictory and mutually exclusive conditions. The differentiation of commodities into commodities and money does not sweep away these inconsistencies, but develops a modus vivendi, a form in which they can exist side by side. This is generally the way in which real contradictions are reconciled. For instance, it is a contradiction to depict one body as constantly falling towards another and as at the same time constantly flying away from it. The ellipse is a form of motion which, while allowing this contradiction to go on, at the same time reconciles it. Insofar as exchange is a price by which commodities are transferred from hands in which they are non-use values to hands in which they become use values, it is a social circulation of matter. 
the product of one form of useful labour replaces that of another. When once a commodity has found a resting place where it can serve as a use value, it falls out of the sphere of exchange into that of consumption. But the former sphere alone interests us at present. We have therefore now to consider exchange from a formal point of view, to investigate the change of form or metamorphosis of commodities which effectuates the social circulation of matter. The comprehension of this change of form is, as a rule, very imperfect. The cause of this imperfection is, apart from indistinct notions of value itself, that every change of form in a commodity results from the exchange of two commodities, an ordinary one and the money commodity. If we keep in view the material fact alone that a commodity has been exchanged for gold, we overlook the very thing that we ought to observe, namely, what has happened to the form of the commodity. We overlook the facts that gold, when a mere commodity, is not money and that when other commodities express their prices in gold, this gold is but the money form of those commodities themselves. Commodities, first of all, enter into the process of exchange just as they are. The process then differentiates them into commodities and money, and thus produces an external opposition corresponding to the internal opposition inherent in them, as being at once use-values and values. Commodities as use-values now stand opposed to money as exchange-value. On the other hand, both opposing sides are commodities, unities of use-value and value. But this unity of differences manifests itself at two opposite poles, and at each pole in an opposite way. Being poles, they are as necessarily opposite as they are connected. On the one side of the equation we have an ordinary commodity, which is in reality a use value. Its value is expressed only ideally in its price, by which it is equated to its opponent, the gold, as to the real embodiment of its value. On the other hand, the gold, in its metallic reality, ranks as the embodiment of value, as money. Gold, as gold, is exchange value itself. As to its use value, that has only an ideal existence, represented by the series of expressions of relative value in which it stands face to face with all other commodities, the sum of whose uses make up the sum of the various uses of gold. These antagonistic forms of commodities are the real forms in which the process of their exchange moves and takes place. Let us now accompany the owner of some commodity, say, our old friend the weaver of linen, to the scene of action, the market. His twenty yards of linen has a definite price, two pounds. He exchanges it for the two pounds, and then, like a man of the good old stamp that he is, he parts with the two pounds for a family Bible of the same price. The linen, which in his eyes is a mere commodity, a depository of value, he alienates in exchange for gold, which is the linen's value form, and this form he again parts with for another commodity, the Bible, which is destined to enter his house as an object of utility and of edification to its inmates. The exchange becomes an accomplished fact by two metamorphoses of opposite yet supplementary character, the conversion of the commodity into money and the reconversion of the money into a commodity. Footnote As Heraclitus says, All things are exchanged for fire, and fire for all things, as wares are exchanged for gold, and gold for wares. F. Lasalle, Die Philosophie Heraclitus des Dunkeln, Berlin, 1858. Lasalle, in his note on this passage, erroneously makes gold a mere symbol of value. End of footnote.
The two phases of this metamorphosis are both of them distinct transactions of the weaver, selling or the exchange of the commodity for money, buying or the exchange of the money for a commodity, and the unity of the two acts, selling in order to buy. The result of the whole transaction, as regards the weaver, is this, that instead of being in possession of the linen, he now has the Bible. Instead of his original commodity, he now possesses another of the same value, but of different utility. In like manner, he procures his other means of subsistence and means of production. From his point of view, the whole process effectuates nothing more than the exchange of the product of his labor for the product of someone else's, nothing more than an exchange of products. The exchange of commodities is therefore accompanied by the following changes in their form. Commodity to money to commodity. The result of the whole process is, so far as concerns the objects themselves, commodity to commodity, the exchange of one commodity for another, the circulation of materialized social labor. When this result is attained, the process is at an end. Commodity to Money First Metamorphosis or Sale The leap taken by value from the body of the commodity into the body of the gold is, as I have elsewhere called it, the salto mortale of the commodity. If it falls short, then although the commodity itself is not harmed, its owner decidedly is. The social division of labor causes his labor to be as one-sided as his wants are many-sided. This is precisely the reason why the product of his labor serves him solely as exchange value. But it cannot acquire the properties of a socially recognized universal equivalent except by being converted into money. That money, however, is in someone else's pocket. In order to entice the money out of that pocket, our friend's commodity must, above all things, be a use value to the owner of the money. For this, it is necessary that the labor expended upon it be of a kind that is socially useful, of a kind that constitutes a branch of the social division of labor. But division of labor is a system of production which has grown up spontaneously and continues to grow behind the backs of the producers. The commodity to be exchanged may possibly be the product of some new kind of labor that pretends to satisfy newly arisen requirements, or even to give rise itself to new requirements. A particular operation, though yesterday perhaps forming one out of the many operations conducted by one producer in creating a given commodity, may today separate itself from this connection, may establish itself as an independent branch of labor, and send its incomplete product to market as an independent commodity. The circumstances may or may not be ripe for such a separation. Today the product satisfies a social want. Tomorrow the article may, either altogether or partially, be superseded by some other appropriate product. Moreover, Although our weaver's labor may be a recognized branch of the social division of labor, yet that fact is by no means sufficient to guarantee the utility of his twenty yards of linen. The community's want of linen, and such a want has a limit like every other want, should already be saturated by the products of rival weavers, our friend's product is superfluous, redundant, and consequently useless. Although people do not look a gift horse in the mouth, our friend does not frequent the market for the purpose of making presents. But suppose his product turn out a real use value, and thereby attracts money. The question arises, how much will it attract? No doubt the answer is already anticipated in the price of the article, in the exponent of the magnitude of its value. We leave out of consideration here any accidental miscalculation of value that is on an average socially necessary. The price, then, 
is merely the money name of the quantity of social labour realised in his commodity. But without the leave and behind the back of our weaver, the old-fashioned mode of weaving undergoes a change. The labour time that yesterday was without doubt socially necessary to the production of a yard of linen ceases to be so today, a fact which the owner of the money is only too eager to prove from the prices quoted by our friend's competitors. Unluckily for him, weavers are not few and far between. Lastly, suppose that every piece of linen in the market contains no more labour time than is socially necessary. In spite of this, all the pieces taken as a whole may have had superfluous labour time spent on them. If the market cannot stomach the whole quantity at the normal price of two shillings a yard, this proves that too great a portion of the total labour of the community has been expended in the form of weaving. The effect is the same as if each individual weaver had expended more labour time upon his particular product than is socially necessary. Here, we may say, with the German proverb, caught together, hung together. All the linen in the market counts but as one article of commerce, of which each piece is only an aliquot part. And as a matter of fact, the value also of each single yard is but the materialised form of the same definite and socially fixed quantity of homogeneous human labour. We see, then, commodities are in love with money, but the course of true love never did run smooth. The quantitative division of labour is brought about in exactly the same spontaneous and accidental manner as its qualitative division. The owners of commodities therefore find out that the same division of labour that turns them into independent private producers also frees the social process of production and the relations of the individual producers to each other within that process from all dependence on the will of those producers, and that the seeming mutual independence of the individuals is supplemented by a system of general and mutual dependence and thereby makes necessary its further conversion into money. At the same time, it also makes the accomplishment of this transubstantiation quite accidental. Here, however, we are only concerned with the phenomenon in its integrity, and we therefore assume its progress to be normal. Moreover, if the conversion take place at all, that is, if the commodity be not absolutely unsaleable, its metamorphosis does take place although the price realised may be abnormally above or below the value. The seller has his commodity replaced by gold. The buyer has his gold replaced by a commodity. The fact which here stares us in the face is that a commodity and gold, twenty yards of linen and two pounds, have changed hands and places. In other words, that they have been exchanged. But for what is the commodity exchanged? For the shape assumed by its own value, for the universal equivalent. And for what is the gold exchanged? For a particular form of its own use value. Why does gold take the form of money face to face with the linen? Because the linen's price of two pounds, its denomination in money, has already equated the linen to gold in its character of money. A commodity strips off its original commodity form on being alienated. That is, on the instant its use value actually attracts the gold that before existed only ideally in its price. The realization of a commodity's price or of its ideal value form, is therefore at the same time the realization of the ideal use value of money. The conversion of a commodity into money is the simultaneous conversion of money into a commodity. The apparently single process is in reality a double one. From the pole of the commodity owner it is a sale, from the opposite pole of the money owner it is a purchase. 
In other words, a sale is a purchase. Commodity to money is also money to commodity. Footnote. Every sale is a purchase. Dr. Kesney, Dialogue sur le commerce et les travaux des artisans. Physiocrates, 1846. Or as Kesney, in his Maxime General, puts it, To sell is to buy. End of footnote. Up to this point, we have considered men in only one economic capacity, that of owners of commodities, a capacity in which they appropriate the produce of the labor of others by alienating that of their own labor. Hence, for one commodity owner to meet with another who has money, it is necessary either that the product of the labor of the latter person, the buyer, should be in itself money, should be gold, the material of which money consists, or that his product should already have changed its skin and have stripped off its original form of a useful object. In order that it may play the part of money, gold must, of course, enter the market at some point or other. This point is to be found at the source of production of the metal, at which place gold is bartered, as the immediate product of labor for some other product of equal value. From that moment, it always represents the realized price of some commodity. Footnote. The price of one commodity can only be paid by the price of another commodity. Mercier de la Riviere, L'Ordre Naturel et Essentiel des Sociétés Politiques. Physiocrates. End of footnote. Apart from its exchange for other commodities at the source of its production, gold, in whosoever hands it may be, is the transformed shape of some commodity alienated by its owner. It is the product of a sale or of the first metamorphosis, commodity to money. Footnote. In order to have this money, one must have made a sale. End of footnote. Gold, as we saw, became ideal money, or a measure of values, in consequence of all commodities measuring their values by it, and thus contrasting it ideally with their natural shape as useful objects, and making it the shape of their value. It became real money, by the general alienation of commodities, by actually changing places with their natural forms as useful objects, and thus becoming in reality the embodiment of their values. When they assume this money shape, commodities strip off every trace of their natural use value and of the particular kind of labor to which they owe their creation in order to transform themselves into the uniform, socially recognized incarnation of homogeneous human labor. We cannot tell from the mere look of a piece of money for what particular commodity it has been exchanged. Under their money form, all commodities look alike. Hence, money may be dirt, although dirt is not money. We will assume that the two gold pieces, in consideration of which our weaver has parted with his linen, are the metamorphosed shape of a quarter of wheat. The sale of linen, commodity to money, is at the same time its purchase, money, to commodity but the sale is the first act of a process that ends with a transaction of an opposite nature, namely the purchase of a Bible. The purchase of the linen, on the other hand, ends a movement that began with a transaction of an opposite nature, namely with the sale of the wheat. Commodity to money, linen to money, which is the first phase of commodity to money to commodity, linen to money to Bible, is also money to commodity, money to linen, the last phase of another movement, commodity to money to commodity, wheat to money to linen. The first metamorphosis of one commodity, its transformation from a commodity into money, is therefore also invariably the second metamorphosis of some other commodity, the retransformation of the latter from money 
into a commodity. Footnote. As before remarked, the actual producer of gold or silver forms an exception. He exchanges his product directly for another commodity without having first sold it. End of footnote. Money to commodity, or purchase. The second and concluding metamorphosis of a commodity. Because money is the metamorphosed shape of all other commodities, the result of their general alienation, for this reason it is alienable itself without restriction or condition. It reads all prices backwards, and thus, so to say, depicts itself in the bodies of all other commodities, which offer to it the material for the realization of its own use value. At the same time, the prices, wooing glances cast at money by commodities, define the limits of its convertibility by pointing to its quantity. Since every commodity on becoming money disappears as a commodity, it is impossible to tell from the money itself how it got into the hands of its possessor or what article has been changed into it. Non olet, from whatever source it may come. Representing on the one hand a sold commodity, it represents on the other a commodity to be bought. Footnote. If money represents in our hands the things we can wish to buy, it also represents the things we have sold to obtain that money. Mercier de la Riviere. End of footnote. Money to commodity, a purchase, is at the same time commodity to money, a sale. The concluding metamorphosis of one commodity is the first metamorphosis of another. With regard to our weaver, the life of his commodity ends with the Bible, into which he has reconverted his two pounds. But suppose the seller of the Bible turns the two pounds set free by the weaver into brandy, money to commodity. The concluding phase of commodity, money, commodity, linen, money, Bible, is also commodity to money, the first phase of commodity to money to commodity, Bible to money to brandy. The producer of a particular commodity has that one article alone to offer. This he sells very often in large quantities, but his many and various wants compel him to split up the price realized, the sum of money set free into numerous purchases. Hence a sale leads to many purchases of various articles. The concluding metamorphosis of a commodity thus constitutes an aggregation of first metamorphoses of various other commodities. If we now consider the completed metamorphosis of a commodity, as a whole it appears in the first place that it is made up of two opposite and complementary movements, commodity to money and money to commodity. These two antithetical transmutations of a commodity are brought about by two antithetical social acts on the part of the owner, and these acts, in their turn, stamp the character of the economic parts played by him. As the person who makes a sale, he is a seller. As the person who makes a purchase, he is a buyer. But just as, upon every such transmutation of a commodity, its two forms, commodity form and money form, exist simultaneously but at opposite poles, so every seller has a buyer opposed to him, and every buyer a seller. While one particular commodity is going through its two transmutations in succession, from a commodity into money and from money into another commodity, the owner of the commodity changes in succession his part from that of seller to that of buyer. These characters of seller and buyer are therefore not permanent, but attach themselves in turns to the various persons engaged in the circulation of commodities. The complete metamorphosis of a commodity in its simplest form implies four extremes and three dramatic personae. First, a commodity comes face to face with money. 
The latter is the form taken by the value of the former, and exists in all its hard reality in the pocket of the buyer. A commodity owner is thus brought into contact with a possessor of money. So soon now, as the commodity has been changed into money, the money becomes its transient equivalent form, the use value of which equivalent form is to be found in the bodies of other commodities. Money, the final term of the first transmutation, is at the same time the starting point for the second. The person who is a seller in the first transaction thus becomes a buyer in the second, in which a third commodity owner appears on the scene as a seller. Footnote. There are therefore four terms and three contracting parties, one of whom intervenes twice. Le Trône. End of footnote. The two phases, each inverse to the other, that make up the metamorphosis of a commodity, constitute together a circular movement, a circuit, commodity form, stripping off of this form, and return to the commodity form. No doubt the commodity appears here under two different aspects. At the starting point it is not a use value to its owner, at the finishing point it is. So, too, the money appears in the first phase as a solid crystal of value, a crystal into which the commodity eagerly solidifies, and in the second dissolves into the mere transient equivalent form destined to be replaced by a use value. The two metamorphoses constituting the circuit are at the same time two inverse partial metamorphoses of two other commodities. One and the same commodity, the linen, opens the series of its own metamorphoses, and completes the metamorphosis of another, the wheat. In the first phase or sale, the linen plays these two parts in its own person. But then, changed into gold, it completes its own second and final metamorphosis, and helps at the same time to accomplish the first metamorphosis of a third commodity. Hence the circuit, made by one commodity in the course of its metamorphoses, is inextricably mixed up with the circuits of other commodities. The total of all the different circuits constitutes the circulation of commodities. The circulation of commodities differs from the direct exchange of products, barter, not only in form but in substance. Only consider the course of events. The weaver has, as a matter of fact, exchanged his linen for a Bible, his own commodity for that of someone else. But this is true only so far as he himself is concerned. The seller of the Bible, who prefers something to warm his inside, no more thought of exchanging his Bible for linen than our weaver knew that wheat had been exchanged for his linen. B's commodity replaces that of A, but A and B do not mutually exchange those commodities. It may of course happen that A and B make simultaneous purchases, the one from the other, but such exceptional transactions are by no means the necessary result of the general conditions of the circulation of commodities. We see here, on the one hand, how the exchange of commodities breaks through all local and personal bounds inseparable from direct barter, and develops the circulation of the products of social labour, and on the other hand, how it develops a whole network of social relations spontaneous in their growth, and entirely beyond the control of the actors. It is only because the farmer has sold his wheat that the weaver is enabled to sell his linen. Only because the weaver has sold his linen, that our hotspur is enabled to sell his Bible, and only because the latter has sold the water of everlasting life, that the distiller is enabled to sell his eau de vie, and so on. The process of circulation, therefore, does not, like direct barter of products, become extinguished upon the use values changing places and hands. The money does not vanish on dropping out of the circuit of the metamorphosis of a given commodity. 
It is constantly being precipitated into new places in the arena of circulation, vacated by other commodities. In the complete metamorphosis of the linen, for example, linen to money to Bible, the linen first falls out of circulation, and money steps into its place. Then the Bible falls out of circulation, and again money takes its place. When one commodity replaces another, the money to commodity always sticks to the hands of some third person. Footnote. Self-evident as this may be, it is nevertheless for the most part unobserved by political economists, and especially by the free trader Vulgaris. End of footnote. Circulation sweats money from every pore. Nothing can be more childish than the dogma that because every sale is a purchase, and every purchase a sale, therefore the circulation of commodities necessarily implies an equilibrium of sales and purchases. If this means that the number of actual sales is equal to the number of purchases, it is mere tautology. But its real purport is to prove that every seller brings his buyer to market with him. Nothing of the kind. The sale and the purchase constitute one identical act, an exchange between a commodity owner and an owner of money, between two persons as opposed to each other as the two poles of a magnet. They form two distinct acts of polar and opposite characters when performed by one single person. Hence the identity of sale and purchase implies that the commodity is useless if on being thrown into the alchemistical retort of circulation it does not come out again in the shape of money, if, in other words, it cannot be sold by its owner and therefore be bought by the owner of the money. That identity further implies that the exchange, if it does take place, constitutes a period of rest, an interval, long or short, in the life of the process in itself. The purchaser has the commodity, the seller has the money, that is, a commodity ready to go into circulation at any time. No one can sell unless someone else purchases. But no one is forthwith bound to purchase because he has just sold. Circulation bursts through all restrictions as to time, place, and individuals imposed by direct barter, and this it effects by splitting up, into the antithesis of a sale and a purchase, the direct identity that in barter does exist between the alienation of one's own and the acquisition of some other man's product. To say that these two independent and antithetical acts have an intrinsic unity are essentially one is the same as to say that this intrinsic oneness expresses itself in an external antithesis. If the interval in time between the two complementary phases of the complete metamorphosis of a commodity become too great, if the split between the sale and the purchase become too pronounced, the intimate connection between them, their oneness, asserts itself by producing a crisis. The antithesis, use value and value, the contradictions that private labor is bound to manifest itself as direct social labor, that a particularized concrete kind of labor has to pass for abstract human labor, the contradiction between the personification of objects and the representation of persons by things, all these antitheses and contradictions, which are eminent in commodities, assert themselves and develop their modes of motion in the antithetical phases of the metamorphosis of a commodity. These modes therefore imply the possibility, and no more than the possibility, of crises. The conversion of this mere possibility into a reality is the result of a long series of relations that, from our present standpoint of simple circulation, have as yet no existence. Footnote. See my observations on James Mill in Zur Kritik, etc. With regard to this subject, we may notice 
two methods characteristic of apologetic economy. The first is the identification of the circulation of commodities with the direct barter of products by simple abstraction from their points of difference. The second is the attempt to explain away the contradictions of capitalist production by reducing the relations between the persons engaged in that mode of production to the simple relations arising out of the circulation of commodities. The production and circulation of commodities are, however, phenomena that occur to a greater or less extent in modes of production the most diverse. If we are acquainted with nothing but the abstract categories of circulation, which are common to all these modes of production, we cannot possibly know anything of the specific points of difference of those modes, nor pronounce any judgment upon them. In no science is such a big fuss made with commonplace truisms as in political economy. For instance, J. B. Say sets himself up as a judge of crises, because, forsooth, he knows that a commodity is a product. End of footnote. The currency of money. The change of form, commodity to money to commodity, by which the circulation of the material products of labor is brought about, requires that a given value in the shape of a commodity shall begin the process, and shall, also in the shape of a commodity, end it. The movement of the commodity is therefore a circuit. On the other hand, the form of this movement precludes a circuit from being made by the money. The result is not the return of the money, but its continued removal further and further away from its starting point. So long as the seller sticks fast to his money, which is the transformed shape of his commodity, that commodity is still in the first phase of its metamorphosis, and has completed only half its course. But so soon as he completes the process, so soon as he supplements his sale by a purchase, the money again leaves the hands of its possessor. It is true that if the weaver, after buying the Bible, sell more linen, money comes back into his hands. But this return is not owing to the circulation of the first twenty yards of linen. That circulation resulted in money getting into the hands of the seller of the Bible. The return of money into the hands of the weaver is brought about only by the renewal or repetition of the process of circulation with a fresh commodity, which renewed process ends with the same result as its predecessor did. Hence the movement directly imparted to money by the circulation of commodities takes the form of a constant motion away from its starting point, of a course from the hands of one commodity owner into those of another. This course constitutes its currency, cour de la monnaie. The currency of money is the constant and monotonous repetition of the same process. The commodity is just by realizing the price of the commodity. This realization transfers the commodity from the seller to the buyer and removes the money from the hands of the buyer into those of the seller, where it again goes through the same process with another commodity. That this one-sided character of the money's motion arises out of the two-sided character of the commodity's motion is a circumstance that is veiled over. The very nature of the circulation of commodities begets the opposite appearance. The first metamorphosis of a commodity is visibly not only the money's movement, but also of the commodity itself. In the second metamorphosis, on the contrary, the movement appears to us as the movement of the money alone. In the first phase of its circulation, the commodity changes place with the money. Thereupon the commodity, under its aspect of a useful object, falls out of circulation into consumption. Footnote. Even when the commodity is sold over and over again, a phenomenon that at present has no existence for us, it falls, when definitely sold for the last time, 
out of the sphere of circulation into that of consumption, where it serves either as means of subsistence or means of production. End of footnote. In its stead, we have its value shape, the money. It then goes through the second phase of its circulation, not under its own natural shape, but under the shape of money. The continuity of the movement is therefore kept up by the money alone. And the same movement that as regards the commodity consists of two processes of an antithetical character is, when considered as the movement of the money, always one and the same process, a continued change of places with ever fresh commodities. Hence the result brought about by the circulation of commodities, namely the replacing of one commodity by another, takes the appearance of having been effected not by means of the change of form of the commodities, but rather by the money acting as a medium of circulation, by an action that circulates commodities, to all appearance motionless in themselves, and transfers them from hands in which they are non-use values to hands in which they are use values, and that in a direction constantly opposed to the direction of the money. The latter is continually withdrawing commodities from circulation and stepping into their places, and in thus way continually moving further and further from its starting point. Hence, although the movement of the money is merely the expression of the circulation of commodities, yet the contrary appears to be the actual fact, and the circulation of commodities seems to be the result of the movement of the money. Footnote. It, money, has no other motion than that imparted to it by the products. Le trône. End of footnote. Again, Money functions as a means of circulation only because in it the values of commodities have independent reality. Hence its movement, as the medium of circulation, is in fact merely the movement of commodities while changing their forms. This fact must therefore make itself plainly visible in the currency of money. Thus, the linen, for instance, first of all changes its commodity form into its money form. The second term of its first metamorphosis, commodity to money, the money form, then becomes the first term of its final metamorphosis, money to commodity, its reconversion into the Bible. But each of these two changes of form is accomplished by an exchange between commodity and money, by their reciprocal displacement. The same pieces of coin come into the seller's hand as the alienated form of the commodity and leave it as the absolutely alienable form of the commodity. They are displaced twice. The first metamorphosis of the linen puts these coins into the weaver's pocket, the second draws them out of it. The two inverse changes undergone by the same commodity are reflected in the displacement, twice repeated, but in opposite directions, of the same pieces of coin. If, on the contrary, only one phase of the metamorphosis is gone through, if there are only sales or only purchases, then a given piece of money changes its place only once. Its second change of place always expresses the second metamorphosis of the commodity, its reconversion from money. The frequent repetition of the displacement of the same coins reflects not only the series of metamorphoses that a single commodity has gone through, but also the intertwining of the innumerable metamorphoses in the world of commodities in general. It is a matter of course that all this is applicable to the simple circulation of commodities alone, the only form that we are now considering. Every commodity, when it first steps into circulation and undergoes its first change of form, does so only to fall out of circulation again and to be replaced by other commodities. Money, on the contrary, as the medium of circulation, keeps continually within the sphere of circulation and moves about in it. The question therefore arises, how much money this sphere constantly absorbs?
in a given country there take place every day at the same time but in different localities numerous one-sided metamorphoses of commodities, or in other words, numerous sales and numerous purchases. The commodities are equated beforehand in imagination by their prices to definite quantities of money. And since in the former circulation now under consideration money and commodities always come bodily face to face, one at the positive pole of purchase, the other at the negative pole of sale, it is clear that the amount of the means of circulation required is determined beforehand by the sum of the prices of all these commodities. As a matter of fact, the money in reality represents the quantity or sum of gold ideally expressed beforehand by the sum of the prices of the commodities. The equality of these two sums is therefore self-evident. We know, however, that the values of commodities remaining constant, their prices vary with the value of gold, the material of money, rising in proportion as it falls, and falling in proportion as it rises. Now if, in consequence of such a rise or fall in the value of gold, the sum of the prices of commodities fall or rise, the quantity of money in currency must fall or rise to the same extent. The change in the quantity of the circulating medium is, in this case it is true, caused by the money itself, yet not in virtue of its function as a medium of circulation, but of its function as a measure of value. First, the price of the commodities varies inversely as the value of the money, and then the quantity of the medium in circulation varies directly as the price of the commodities. Exactly the same thing would happen if, for instance, instead of the value of gold falling, gold were replaced by silver as the measure of value, or if, instead of the value of silver rising, gold were to thrust silver out from being the measure of value. In the one case, more silver would be current than gold was before. In the other case, less gold would be current than silver was before. In each case, the value of the material of money, that is, the value of the commodity that serves as the measure of value, would have undergone a change, and therefore so too would the prices of commodities which express their values in money, and so too would the quantity of money current whose function it is to realize those prices. We have already seen that the sphere of circulation has an opening through which gold, or the material of money generally, enters into it as a commodity with a given value. Hence, when money enters on its functions as a measure of value, when it expresses prices, its value is already determined. If now its value fall, this fact is first evidenced by a change in the prices of those commodities that are directly bartered for the precious metals at the sources of their production. The greater part of all other commodities, especially in the imperfectly developed stages of civil society, will continue for a long time to be estimated by the former antiquated and illusory value of the measure of value. Nevertheless, one commodity infects another through their common value relation, so that their prices, expressed in gold or in silver, gradually settle down into the proportions determined by their comparative values, until finally the values of all commodities are estimated in terms of the new value of the metal that constitutes money. This process is accompanied by the continued increase in the quantity of the precious metals, an increase caused by their streaming in to replace the articles directly bartered for them at their sources of production. In proportion, therefore, as commodities in general acquire their true prices, in proportion as their values become estimated according to the fallen value of the precious metal, in the same proportion, the quantity of that metal necessary for realizing those new prices is provided beforehand. A one-sided observation of the results that followed upon the discovery of fresh supplies of gold and silver led some economists in the 17th and particularly in the 18th century 
to the false conclusion that the prices of commodities had gone up in consequence of the increased quantity of gold and silver serving as means of circulation. Henceforth, we shall consider the value of gold to be given, as in fact it is, momentarily, whenever we estimate the price of a commodity. On this supposition, then, the quantity of the medium of circulation is determined by the sum of the prices that have to be realized. If we now further suppose the price of each commodity to be given, the sum of the prices clearly depends on the mass of commodities in circulation. It requires but little racking of brains to comprehend that if one quarter of wheat costs two pounds, one hundred quarters will cost two hundred pounds, two hundred quarters four hundred pounds, and so on, that consequently the quantity of money that changes place with the wheat when sold must increase with the quantity of that wheat. If the mass of commodities remain constant, the quantity of circulating money varies with the fluctuations in the prices of those commodities. It increases and diminishes because the sum of the prices increases or diminishes in consequence of the change of price. To produce this effect, it is by no means requisite that the prices of all commodities should rise or fall simultaneously. A rise or a fall in the prices of a number of leading articles is sufficient in the one case to increase, in the other to diminish, the sum of the prices of all commodities, and therefore to put more or less money in circulation. Whether the change in the price correspond to an actual change of value in the commodities, or whether it be the result of mere fluctuations in market prices, the effect on the quantity of the medium of circulation remains the same. Suppose the following articles to be sold, or partially metamorphosed, simultaneously in different localities. Say, one quarter of wheat, twenty yards of linen, one Bible, and four gallons of brandy. If the price of each article be two pounds, and the sum of the prices to be realized be consequently eight pounds, it follows that eight pounds in money must go into circulation. If, on the other hand, these same articles are links in the following change of metamorphoses, one quarter of wheat, two pounds, to twenty yards of linen, two pounds, to one Bible, two pounds, to four gallons of brandy, two pounds, a chain that is already well known to us, in that case the two pounds cause the different commodities to circulate one after the other, and after realizing their prices successively, and therefore the sum of those prices, eight pounds, they come to rest at last in the pocket of the distiller. The two pounds thus makes four moves. This repeated change of place of the same pieces of money corresponds to the double change in form of the commodities, to their motion in opposite directions through two stages of circulation, and to the interlacing of the metamorphoses of different commodities. Footnote. It is products which set money in motion and make it circulate. The velocity of money's motion supplements its quantity. When necessary, it does nothing but slide from hand to hand, without stopping for a moment. Le Trône End of footnote. These antithetic and complementary phases, of which the process of metamorphosis consists, are gone through not simultaneously but successively. Time is therefore required for the completion of the series. Hence the velocity of the currency of money is measured by the number of moves made by a given piece of money in a given time. Suppose the circulation of the four articles takes a day. The sum of the prices to be realized in the day is eight pounds. The number of moves of the two pieces of money is four, and the quantity of money circulating is two pounds. Hence, for a given interval of time during the process of circulation, we have the following relation. The quantity of money functioning as the circulating medium 
is equal to the sum of the prices of the commodities divided by the number of moves made by coins of the same denomination. This law holds generally. The total circulation of commodities in a given country during a given period is made up on the one hand of numerous isolated and simultaneous partial metamorphoses, sales which are at the same time purchases, in which each coin changes its place only once or makes only one move, on the other hand, of numerous distinct series of metamorphoses partly running side by side and partly coalescing with each other, in each of which series each coin makes a number of moves, the number being greater or less according to circumstances. The total number of moves made by all the circulating coins of one denomination being given, we can arrive at the average number of moves made by a single coin of that denomination, or at the average velocity of the currency of money. The quantity of money thrown into the circulation at the beginning of each day is, of course, determined by the sum of the prices of all the commodities circulating simultaneously side by side. But once in circulation, coins are, so to say, made responsible for one another. If the one increases its velocity, the other either retards its own or altogether falls out of circulation. For the circulation can absorb only such a quantity of gold as when multiplied by the mean number of moves made by one single coin or element is equal to the sum of the prices to be realized. Hence, if the number of moves made by the separate pieces increase, the total number of those pieces in circulation diminishes. If the number of the moves diminish, the total number of pieces increases. Since the quantity of money capable of being absorbed by the circulation is given for a given mean velocity of currency, all that is necessary in order to abstract a given number of sovereigns from the circulation is to throw the same number of one-pound notes into it, a trick well known to all bankers. Just as the currency of money, generally considered, is but a reflex of the circulation of commodities, or of the antithetical metamorphoses they undergo, so too the velocity of that currency reflects the rapidity with which commodities change their forms, the continued interlacing of one series of metamorphoses with another, the hurried social interchange of matter, the rapid disappearance of commodities from the sphere of circulation, and the equally rapid substitution of fresh ones in their places. Hence, in the velocity of the currency, we have the fluent unity of the antithetical and complementary phases, the unity of the conversion of the useful aspect of commodities into their value aspect, and their reconversion from the latter aspect to the former, or the unity of the two processes of sale and purchase. On the other hand, the retardation of the currency reflects the separation of these two processes into isolated antithetical phases, reflects the stagnation in the change of form, and therefore in the social interchange of matter. The circulation itself, of course, gives no clue to the origin of this stagnation. It merely puts in evidence the phenomenon itself. The general public, who, simultaneously with the retardation of the currency, see money appear and disappear less frequently at the periphery of circulation, naturally attribute this retardation to a quantitative deficiency in the circulating medium. Footnote. Money being the common measure of buying and selling, everybody who hath anything to sell and cannot procure chapmen for it is presently apt to think that want of money in the kingdom or country is the cause why his goods do not go off. And so want of money is the common cry, which is a great mistake. What do these people want who cry out for money? The farmer complains. He thinks that were more money in the country, he should have a price for his goods. Then it seems money is not his want, but a price for his corn and cattle, which he would sell but cannot. Why cannot he get a price? 
One, either there is too much corn and cattle in the country, so that most who come to market have need of selling, as he hath, and few of buying. Or, two, there wants the usual vent abroad by transportation. Or, three, the consumption fails, as when men, by reason of poverty, do not spend so much in their houses as formerly they did. Wherefore it is not the increase of specific money which would at all advance the farmer's goods, but the removal of any of these three causes, which do truly keep down the market. The merchant and shopkeeper want money in the same manner, that is, they want a vent for the goods they deal in, by reason that the markets fail. A nation never thrives better than when riches are tossed from hand to hand. Sir Dudley North, Discourses Upon Trade, 1691 Herrenschwanz's fanciful notions amount merely to this, that the antagonism, which has its origin in the nature of commodities, and is reproduced in their circulation, can be removed by increasing the circulating medium. But if, on the one hand, it is a popular delusion to ascribe stagnation in production and circulation to insufficiency of the circulating medium, it by no means follows, on the other hand, that an actual paucity of the medium in consequence, for example, of bungling legislative interference with the regulation of currency, may not give rise to such stagnation. End of footnote. The total quantity of money functioning during a given period as the circulating medium is determined on the one hand by the sum of the prices of the circulating commodities, and on the other hand by the rapidity with which the antithetical phases of the metamorphoses follow one another. On this rapidity depends what proportion of the sum of the prices can, on the average, be realized by each single coin but the sum of the prices of the circulating commodities depends on the quantity as well as on the prices of the commodities. These three factors, however, state of prices, quantity of circulating commodities, and velocity of money currency, are all variable. Hence the sum of the prices to be realized, and consequently the quantity of the circulating medium depending on that sum, will vary with the numerous variations of these three factors in combination. Of these variations, we shall consider those alone that have been the most important in the history of prices. While prices remain constant, the quantity of the circulating medium may increase owing to the number of circulating commodities increasing, or to the velocity of currency decreasing, or to a combination of the two. On the other hand, the quantity of the circulating medium may decrease with a decreasing number of commodities, or with an increasing rapidity of their circulation. With a general rise in the price of commodities, the quantity of the circulating medium will remain constant, provided the number of commodities in circulation decrease proportionally to the increase in their prices, or provided the velocity of currency increase lating medium may decrease, owing to the number of commodities decreasing more rapidly, or to the velocity of currency increasing more rapidly than prices rise. With a general fall in the prices of commodities, the quantity of the circulating medium will remain constant provided the number of commodities increase proportionally to their fall in price, or provided the velocity of currency decrease in the same proportion. The quantity of the circulating medium will increase, provided the number of commodities increase quicker, or the rapidity of circulation decrease quicker than the prices fall. The variations of the different factors may mutually compensate each other, so that notwithstanding their continued instability, the sum of the prices to be realized and the quantity of money in circulation remain constant. Consequently, we find, especially if we take long periods into consideration, 
that the deviations from the average level of the quantity of money current in any country are much smaller than we should at first sight expect, apart, of course, from excessive perturbations periodically arising from industrial and commercial crises, or, less frequently, from fluctuations in the value of money. The law that the quantity of the circulating medium is determined by the sum of the prices of the commodity circulating and the average velocity of currency may also be stated as follows. Given the sum of the values of commodities and the average rapidity of their metamorphoses, the quantity of precious metal, current as money, depends on the value of that precious metal. The erroneous opinion that it is, on the contrary, prices that are determined by the quantity of the circulating medium, and that the latter depends on the quantity of the precious metals in a country, this opinion was based by those who first held it on the absurd hypothesis that commodities are without a price, and money without a value, when they first enter into circulation, and that once in circulation, an aliquot part of the medley of commodities is exchanged for an aliquot part of the heap of precious metals. Footnote. There is a certain measure and proportion of money requisite to drive the trade of a nation, more or less than which would prejudice the same, just as there is a certain proportion of farthings necessary in a small retail trade to change silver money, and to even such reckonings as cannot be adjusted with the smallest silver pieces. Now, as the proportion of the number of farthings requisite in commerce is to be taken from the number of people, the frequency of their exchanges, as also and principally from the value of the smallest silver pieces of money, so in like manner the proportion of money, gold and silver specie, requisite in our trade, is to be likewise taken from the frequency of commutations, and from the bigness of the payments. William Petty, A Treatise of Taxes and Contributions, 1667 The theory of Hume was defended against the attacks of J. Stuart and others by A. Young, in his Political Arithmetic, 1774, in which work there is a special chapter entitled Prices depend on quantity of money. I have stated in Surcritique, etc., he, Adam Smith, passes over without remark the question as to the quantity of coin in circulation, and treats money quite wrongly as a mere commodity. This statement applies only in so far as Adam Smith, ex officio, treats of money. Now and then, however, as in his criticism of the earlier systems of political economy, he takes the right view. The quantity of coin in every country is regulated by the value of the commodities which are to be circulated by it. The value of the goods annually bought and sold in any country requires a certain quantity of money to circulate and distribute them to their proper consumers, and can give employment to no more. The channel of circulation necessarily draws to itself a sum sufficient to fill it, and never admits any more. Wealth of Nations, Book 4, Chapter 1 In like manner, ex officio, he opens his work with an apotheosis on the division of labour. Afterwards, in the last book, which treats of the sources of public revenue, he occasionally repeats the denunciations of the division of labour made by his teacher, a. Ferguson. End of footnote. Footnote. The prices of things will certainly rise in every nation as the gold and silver increase amongst the people, and consequently, where the gold and silver decrease in any nation, the prices of all things must fall proportionately to such decrease of money. Jacob Vanderlint. Money Answers All Things, 1734. A careful comparison of this book with Hume's essays proves to my mind without doubt that Hume was acquainted with and made use of Vanderlint's work, which is certainly an important one. 
The opinion that prices are determined by the quantity of the circulating medium was also held by Barbon and other much earlier writers. No inconvenience, says Vanderlint, can arise by an unrestrained trade, but a very great advantage, since if the cash of the nation be decreased by it, which prohibitions are designed to prevent, those nations that get the cash will certainly find everything advance in price as the cash increases amongst them, and our manufactures and everything else will soon become so moderate as to turn the balance of trade in our favour, and thereby fetch the money back again. End of footnote. Footnote. That the price of each single kind of commodity forms a part of the sum of the prices of all the commodities in circulation is a self-evident proposition. But how use values, which are incommensurable with regard to each other, are to be exchanged, en masse for the total sum of gold and silver in a country, is quite incomprehensible. If we start from the notion that all commodities together form one single commodity, of which each is but an aliquot part, we get the following beautiful result. The total commodity equals X hundredweight of gold. Commodity A equals an aliquot part of the total commodity, equals the same aliquot part of X hundredweight of gold. This is stated in all seriousness by Montesquieu. If one compares the amount of gold and silver in the world with the sum of the commodities available, it is certain that each product or commodity taken in isolation could be compared with a certain portion of the total amount of money. Let us suppose that there is only one product or commodity in the world, or only one that can be purchased, and that it can be divided in the same way as money. A certain part of this commodity would then correspond to a part of the total amount of money. Half the total of the one would correspond to half the total of the other, etc. The determination of the prices of things always depends, fundamentally, on the relation between the total amount of things and the total amount of their monetary symbols. Montesquieu as to the further development of this theory by Ricardo and his disciple, with his usual eclectic logic, understands how to hold at the same time the view of his father James Mill and the opposite view. On a comparison of the text of his compendium Principles of Political Economy with his preface to the first edition, in which preface he announces himself as the Adam Smith of his day, we do not know whether to admire more the simplicity of resemblance to Adam Smith as, say, General Williams of Cars to the Duke of Wellington. The original researches of Mr. J. S. Mill, which are neither extensive nor profound in the domain of political economy, will be found mustered in rank and file in his little work Some Unsettled Questions of Political Economy which appeared in 1844. Locke asserts point-blank the connection between the absence of value in gold and silver and the determination of their values by quantity alone. Mankind having consented to put an imaginary value upon gold and silver, the intrinsic value regarded in these metals is nothing but the quantity. Some Considerations, etc., 1691. End of footnote. C. Coin and Symbols of Value That money takes the shape of coin springs from its function as the circulating medium. The weight of gold, represented in imagination by the prices or money names of commodities, must confront those commodities within the circulation in the shape of coins or pieces of gold of a given denomination. Coining, like the establishment of a standard of prices, is the business of the state. The different national uniforms worn at home by gold and silver as coins and doffed again in the market of the world indicate the separation between the internal or national spheres of the circulation of commodities 
and their universal sphere. The only difference, therefore, between coin and bullion is one of shape, and gold can at any time pass from one form to the other. Footnote. It lies, of course, entirely beyond my purpose to take into consideration such details as the seigneurage on minting. I will, however, cite for the benefit of the romantic sycophant Adam Muller, who admires the generous liberality with which the English government coins gratuitously, the following opinion of Sir Dudley North. Silver and gold, like other commodities, have their ebbings and flowings. Upon the arrival of quantities from Spain, it is carried into the tower and coined. Not long after there will come a demand for bullion to be exported again. If there is none, but all happens to be in coin, what then? Melt it down again, there's no loss in it, for the coining costs the oath the merchant were made to pay the price of the coinage, he would not have sent his silver to the tower without consideration, and coined money would always keep a value above uncoined silver. North North was himself one of the foremost merchants in the reign of Charles II. End of footnote. But no sooner does coin leave the mint than it immediately finds itself on the high road to the melting pot. During their currency, coins wear away, some more, others less. Name and substance, nominal weight and real weight, begin their process of separation. Coins of the same denomination become different in value because they are different in weight. The weight of gold, fixed upon as the standard of prices, deviates from the weight that serves as the circulating medium, and the latter thereby ceases any longer to be a real equivalent of the commodities whose prices it realizes. The history of coinage during the Middle Ages and down into the 18th century records the ever-renewed confusion arising from this cause. The natural tendency of circulation to convert coins into a mere semblance of what they profess to be into a symbol of the weight of metal they are officially supposed to contain is recognized by modern legislation, which fixes the loss of weight sufficient to demonetize a gold coin, or to make it no longer legal tender. The fact that the currency of coins itself effects a separation between their nominal and their real weight, creating a distinction between them as mere pieces of metal on the one hand and as coins with a definite function on the other, this fact implies the latent possibility of replacing metallic coins by tokens of some other material, by symbols serving the same purposes as coins. The practical difficulties in the way of coining extremely minute quantities of gold or silver, and the circumstance that at first the less precious metal is used as a measure of value instead of the more precious, copper instead of silver, silver instead of gold, and that the less precious circulates as money until dethroned by the more precious, all these facts explain the parts historically played by silver and copper tokens as substitutes for gold coins. Silver and copper tokens take the place of gold in those regions of the circulation where coins pass from hand to hand most rapidly and are subject to the maximum amount of wear and tear. This occurs where sales and purchases on a very small scale are continually happening. In order to prevent these satellites from establishing themselves permanently in the place of gold, positive enactments determine the extent to which they must be compulsorily received as payment instead of gold. The particular tracks pursued by the different species of coin in currency run naturally into each other. The tokens keep company with the gold to pay fractional parts of the smallest gold coin. Gold is, on the one hand, constantly pouring into retail circulation, and on the other hand is as constantly being thrown out again by being changed into tokens. Footnote. 
If silver never exceed what is wanted for the smaller payments, it cannot be collected in sufficient quantities for the larger payments. The use of gold in the main payments necessarily implies also its use in the retail trade. Those who have gold coin offering them for small purchases and receiving with the commodity purchased a balance of silver in return, by which means the surplus of silver that would otherwise encumber the retail dealer, is drawn off and dispersed into general circulation. But if there is as much silver as will transact the small payments independent of gold, the retail trader must then receive silver for small purchases, and it must of necessity accumulate in his hands. David Buchanan Inquiry into the Taxation and Commercial Policy of Great Britain Edinburgh, 1844 The weight of metal in the silver and copper tokens is arbitrarily fixed by law. When in currency, they wear away even more rapidly than gold coins. Hence their functions are totally independent of their weight, and consequently of all value. The function of gold as coin becomes completely independent of the metallic value of that gold. Therefore, things that are relatively without value, such as paper notes, can serve as coins in its place. This purely symbolic character is to a certain extent masked in metal tokens. In paper money, it stands out plainly. In fact, ce n'est que le premier pas qui coûte. We allude here only to inconvertible paper money issued by the state and having compulsory circulation. It has its immediate origin in the metallic currency. Money based upon credit implies, on the other hand, conditions which, from our standpoint of the simple circulation of commodities, are as yet totally unknown to us. But we may affirm this much, that just as true paper money takes its rise in the function of money as the circulating medium, so money based upon credit takes root spontaneously in the function of money as the means of payment. Footnote The Mandarin Wan Mao In, the Chinese Chancellor of the Exchequer, took it into his head one day to lay before the Son of Heaven a proposal that secretly aimed at converting the assignats of the empire into convertible banknotes. The assignats committee, in its report of April 1854, gives him a severe snubbing. Whether he also received the traditional drubbing with bamboos is not stated. The concluding part of the report is as follows. The committee has carefully examined his proposal and finds that it is entirely in favour of the merchants and that no advantage will result to the Crown. Arbeiten der Kaiserlich Russischen Gesandtschaft zu Peking über China Aus dem Russischen von Dr. K. Abel and F. A. Mecklenburg Erster Band, Berlin, 1858 in his evidence before the Committee of the House of Lords on the Bank Acts, a governor of the Bank of England says, with regard to the abrasion of gold coins during currency, Every year a fresh class of sovereigns becomes too light. The class, which one year passes with full weight, loses enough by wear and tear to draw the scales next year against it. House of Lords Committee, 1848. End of footnote. The state puts in circulation bits of paper on which their various denominations, say one pound, five pound, etc., are printed. In so far as they actually take the place of gold to the same amount, their movement is subject to the laws that regulate the currency of money itself. A law peculiar to the circulation of paper money can spring up only from the proportion in which that paper money represents gold. Such a law exists. Stated simply, it is as follows. The issue of paper money must not exceed in amount the gold, or silver as the case may be, which would actually circulate if not replaced by symbols. Now the quantity of gold which the circulation can absorb constantly fluctuates about a given level. Still, 
The mass of the circulating medium in a given country never sinks below a certain minimum easily ascertained by actual experience. The fact that this minimum mass continually undergoes changes in its constituent parts, or that the pieces of gold of which it consists are being constantly replaced by fresh ones, causes, of course, no change either in its amount or in the continuity of its circulation. It can therefore be replaced by paper symbols. If, on the other hand, all the conduits of circulation were today filled with paper money to the full extent of their capacity for absorbing money, they might tomorrow be overflowing in consequence of a fluctuation in the circulation of commodities there would no longer be any standard. If the paper money exceed its proper limit, which is the amount in gold coins of the like denomination that can actually be current, it would, apart from the danger of falling into general disrepute, represent only that quantity of gold which, in accordance with the laws of the circulation of commodities, is required and is alone capable of being represented by paper. If the quantity of paper money issued be double what it ought to be, then, as a matter of fact, one pound would be the money name not of one quarter of an ounce, but of one eighth of an ounce of gold. The effect would be the same as if an alteration had taken place in the function of gold as a standard of prices. Those values that were previously expressed by the price of one pound would now be expressed by the price of two pounds. Paper money is a token representing gold or money. The relation between it and the values of commodities is this, that the latter are ideally expressed in the same quantities of gold that are symbolically represented by the paper. Only in so far as paper money represents gold, which like all other commodities has value, is it a symbol of value. Footnote the following passage from Fullerton shows the want of clearness on the part of even the best writers on money in their comprehension of its various functions. That, as far as concerns our domestic exchanges, all the monetary functions which are usually performed by gold and silver coins may be performed as effectually by a circulation of inconvertible notes paying no value but that factitious and conventional value they derive from the law is a fact which admits, I conceive, of no denial. Value of this description may be made to answer all the purposes of intrinsic value and supersede even the necessity for a standard, provided only the quantity of issues be kept under due limitation. Fullerton. Regulation of Currencies. London, 1845. Because the commodity that serves as money is capable of being replaced in circulation by mere symbols of value, therefore its functions as a measure of value and a standard of prices are declared to be superfluous. End of footnote. Finally, someone may ask why gold is capable of being replaced by tokens that have no value. But as we have already seen, it is capable of being replaced only in so far as it functions exclusively as coin, or as the circulating medium, and as nothing else. Now money has other functions besides this one, and the isolated function of serving as the mere circulating medium is not necessarily the only one attached to gold coin, although this is the case with those abraded coins that continue to circulate. Each piece of money is a mere coin, or means of circulation, only so long as it actually circulates. But this is just the case with that minimum mass of gold, which is capable of being replaced by paper money. That mass remains constantly within the sphere of circulation, continually functions as a circulating medium, and exists exclusively for that purpose. Its movement, therefore, represents nothing but the continued alternation of the inverse phases of the metamorphosis commodity to money to commodity, phases in which commodities confront their value forms 
only to disappear again immediately. The independent existence of the exchange value of a commodity here is a transient apparition, by means of which the commodity is immediately replaced by another commodity. Hence, in this process which continually makes money pass from hand to hand, the mere symbolical existence of money suffices. Its functional existence absorbs, so to say, its material existence. Being a transient and objective reflex of the prices of commodities, it serves only as a symbol of itself, and is therefore capable of being replaced by a token. Footnote From the fact that gold and silver, so far as they are coins, or exclusively serve as the medium of circulation, become mere tokens of themselves, Nicolas Barbon deduces the right of governments to raise money, that is, to give to the weight of silver that is called a shilling the name of a greater weight, such as a crown, and so to pay creditors' shillings, instead of crowns. Money does wear and grow lighter by often telling over, it is the denomination and currency of the money that men regard in bargaining, and not the quantity of silver. Tis the public authority upon the metal that makes it money. N. Barbon End of footnote One thing is, however, requisite. This token must have an objective social validity of its own, and this the paper symbol acquires by its forced currency. This compulsory action of the state can take effect only within that inner sphere of circulation which is coterminous with the territories of the community, but it is also only within that sphere that money completely responds to its function of being the circulating medium, or becomes coin. Section 3. Money The commodity that functions as a measure of value and, either in its own person or by a representative, as the medium of circulation, is money. Gold, or silver, is therefore money. It functions as money, on the one hand, when it has to be present in its own golden person. It is then the money commodity, neither merely ideal, as in its function of a measure of value, nor capable of being represented as in its function of circulating medium. On the other hand, it also functions as money, when by virtue of its function, whether that function be performed in person or by representative, it congeals into the sole form of value, the only adequate form of existence of exchange value, in opposition to use value, represented by all other commodities. A. Hoarding the continual movement in circuits of the two antithetical metamorphoses of commodities, or the never-ceasing alternation of sale and purchase, is reflected in the restless currency of money, or in the function that money performs of a perpetuum mobile of circulation. But so soon as the series of metamorphoses is interrupted, so soon as sales are not supplemented by subsequent purchases, money ceases to be mobilized. It is transformed, as Bois-Gilbert says, from meuble into immeuble, from movable into immovable, from coin into money. With the very earliest development of the circulation of commodities, there is also developed the necessity and the passionate desire to hold fast the product of the first metamorphosis. This product is the transformed shape of the commodity, or its gold chrysalis. Footnote Monetary wealth is nothing but wealth in products, transformed into money. Mercier de la Riviere A value in the form of products which has merely changed its form. End of footnote Commodities are thus sold not for the of commodities, this change of form becomes the end and aim. 
The changed form of the commodity is thus prevented from functioning as its unconditionally alienable form, or as its merely transient money form. The money becomes petrified into a hoard, and the seller becomes a hoarder of money. In the early stages of the circulation of commodities, it is the surplus use values alone that are converted into money. Gold and silver thus become of themselves social expressions for superfluity or wealth. This naive form of hoarding becomes perpetuated in those communities in which the traditional mode of production is carried on for the supply of a fixed and limited circle of home wants. It is thus with the people of Asia, and particularly of the East Indies. Vanderlint, who fancies that the prices of commodities in a country are determined by the quantity of gold and silver to be found in it, asks himself why Indian commodities are so cheap. Answer, because the Hindus bury their money. From 1602 to 1734 he remarks they buried 150 millions of pounds sterling of silver, which originally came from America to Europe. Footnote. "'Tis by this practice they keep all their goods and manufactures at such low rates. Vanderlint. In the ten years from 1856 to 1866, England exported to India and China one hundred and twenty million pounds in silver, which had been received in exchange for Australian gold. Most of the silver exported to China makes its way to India. As the production of commodities further develops, every producer of commodities is compelled to make sure of the nexus rerum, or the social pledge. Footnote. Money is a pledge. John Bellers, Essays About the Poor, Manufactures, Trade, Plantations, and Immorality. 1699. End of footnote. His wants are constantly making themselves felt, and necessitate the continual purchase of other people's commodities, while the production and sale of his own goods require time and depend upon circumstances. In order, then, to be able to buy without selling, he must have sold previously without buying. This operation, conducted on a general scale, appears to imply a contradiction but the precious metals at the sources of their production are directly exchanged for other commodities. And here we have sales, by the owners of commodities, without purchases, by the owners of gold or silver. Footnote. A purchase, in a categorical sense, implies that gold and silver are already the converted form of commodities, or the product of a sale. End of footnote. And subsequent sales by other producers, unfollowed by purchases, merely bring about the distribution of the newly produced precious metals among all the owners of commodities. In this way, all along the line of exchange, hoards of gold and silver of varied extent are accumulated. With the possibility of holding and storing up exchange value in the shape of a particular commodity arises also the greed for gold. Along with the extension of circulation increases the power of money, that absolutely social form of wealth ever ready for use. Gold is a wonderful thing. Whoever possesses it is lord of all he wants. By means of gold, one can even get souls into paradise. Columbus, in his letter from Jamaica, 1503. Since gold does not disclose what has been transformed into it, everything, commodity or not, is convertible into gold. Everything becomes saleable and buyable. The circulation becomes the great social retort into which everything is thrown to come out again as a gold crystal. Not even are the bones of saints, and still less are more delicate res sacrosancti, extra commercium hominum, able to withstand this alchemy. Footnote. Henry III, most Christian king of France, robbed cloisters of their relics, 
and turned them into money. It is well known what part the despoiling of the Delphic temple by the Phocians played in the history of Greece. Temples with the ancients served as the dwellings of the gods of commodities. They were sacred banks. With the Phoenicians, a trading people par excellence, money was the transmuted shape of everything. It was therefore quite in order that the virgins, who at the feast of the goddess of love gave themselves up to strangers, should offer to the goddess the piece of money they received. End of footnote. Just as every qualitative difference between commodities is extinguished in money, so money, on its side, like the radical leveller that it is, does away with all distinctions. Footnote. Gold, yellow, glittering, precious gold, thus much of this will make black white, foul fair, wrong right, base noble, old young, coward valiant. What's this, you gods? Why, this will lug your priests and servants from your sides, pluck stout men's pillows from below their heads. This yellow slave will knit and break religions, bless the accursed, make the whore leprosy adored, place thieves, and give them title, knee, and approbation. With senators on the bench, this is it, that makes the wappened widow wed again. Come, damned earth, though common whore of mankind. Shakespeare, Timon of Athens. End of footnote. But money itself is a commodity, an external object, capable of becoming the private property of any individual. Thus social power becomes the private power of private persons. The ancients therefore denounced money as subversive of the economic and moral order of things. Footnote. Money, nothing worse in our lives, so current, rampant, so corrupting. Money, you demolish cities, root men from their homes, you train and twist good minds and set them on the most atrocious schemes. No limit, you make them adept at every kind of outrage, every godless crimes. Money. Sophocles, Antigone. Modern society, which soon after its birth pulled Plutus by the hair of his head from the bowels of the earth, greets gold as its holy grail, as the glittering incarnation of the very principle of its own life. Footnote. The desire of avarice to draw Pluto himself out of the bowels of the earth. The Deipnosophists. Athenaeus. A commodity, in its capacity of a use value, satisfies a particular want and is a particular element of material wealth but the value of a commodity measures the degree of its attraction for all other elements of material wealth, and therefore measures the social wealth of its owner. To a barbarian owner of commodities, and even to a West European peasant, value is the same as value form, and therefore to him the increase in his hoard of gold and silver is an increase in value. It is true that the value of money varies, at one time in consequence of a variation in its own value, at another in consequence of a change in the values of commodities. But this, on the one hand, does not prevent two hundred ounces of gold from still containing more value than one hundred ounces, nor, on the other hand, does it hinder the actual metallic form of this article from continuing to be the universal equivalent form of all other commodities, and the immediate social incarnation of all human labour. The desire after hoarding is in its very nature unsatiable. In its qualitative aspect, or formally considered, money has no bounds to its efficacy. That is, it is the universal representative of material wealth because it is directly convertible into any other commodity. But at the same time, every actual sum of money is limited in amount, and therefore, as a means of purchasing, has only a limited 
efficacy. This antagonism between the quantitative limits of money and its qualitative boundlessness continually acts as a spur to the hoarder in his Sisyphus-like labour of accumulating. It is with him as it is with a conqueror who sees in every new country annexed only a new boundary. In order that gold may be held as money and made to form a hoard, it must be prevented from circulating or from transforming itself into a means of enjoyment. The hoarder, therefore, makes a sacrifice of the lusts of the flesh to his gold fetish. He acts in earnest up to the gospel of abstention. On the other hand, he can withdraw from circulation no more than what he has thrown into it in the shape of commodities. The more he produces, the more he is able to sell. Hard work, saving, and avarice are therefore his three cardinal virtues, and to sell much and buy little the sum of his political enemy. Footnote. These are the pivots around which all the measures of political economy turn. The maximum possible increase in the number of sellers of each commodity, and the maximum possible decrease in the number of buyers. Very. By the side of the gross form of a hoard, we find also its aesthetic form in the possession of gold and silver articles. This grows with the wealth of civil society. Soyons riches ou paraissons riches. Diderot. In this way there is created, on the one hand, a constantly extending market for gold and silver, unconnected with their functions as money, and on the other hand a latent source of supply, to which recourse is had principally in times of crisis and social disturbance. Hoarding serves various purposes in the economy of the metallic circulation. Its first function arises out of the conditions to which the currency of gold and silver coins is subject. We have seen how, along with the continual fluctuations in the extent and rapidity of the circulation of commodities and in their prices, the quantity of money current unceasingly ebbs and flows. This mass must, therefore, be capable of expansion and contraction. At one time, money must be attracted in order to act as circulating coin, at another, circulating coin must be repelled in order to act again as more or less stagnant money. In order that the mass of money actually current may constantly saturate the absorbing power of the circulation, it is necessary that the quantity of gold and silver in a country be greater than the quantity required to function as coin. This condition is fulfilled by money taking the form of hoards. These reserves serve as conduits for the supply or withdrawal of money to or from the circulation, which in this way never overflows its banks. Footnote. There is required for carrying on the trade of a nation a determinate sum of specific money which varies, and is sometimes more, sometimes less, as the circumstances we are in require. This ebbing and flowing of money supplies and accommodates itself, without any aid of politicians. The buckets work alternately. When money is scarce, bullion is coined. When bullion is scarce, money is melted. Sir D. North John Stuart Mill, who for a long time was an official of the East India Company, confirms the fact that in India silver ornaments still continue to perform directly the functions of a hoard. The silver ornaments are brought out and coined when there is a high rate of interest, and go back again when the rate of interest falls. J. S. Mills's Evidence Reports on Bank Acts, 1857 According to a parliamentary document of 1864 on the gold and silver import and export of India, the import of gold and silver in 1863 exceeded the export by 19,367,764 pounds. During the eight years immediately preceding 
1864, the excess of imports over exports of the precious metals amounted to 109,652,917. During this century, far more than 200 million pounds has been coined in India. End of footnote. Means of payment. In the simple form of the circulation of commodities hitherto considered, we found a given value always presented to us in a double shape, as a commodity at one pole, as money at the opposite pole. The owners of commodities came therefore into contact as the respective representatives of what were already equivalents. But with the development of circulation, conditions arise under which the alienation of commodities becomes separated, by an interval of time, from the realization of their prices. It will be sufficient to indicate the most simple of these conditions. One sort of article requires a longer, another a shorter time for its production. Again, the production of different commodities depends on different seasons of the year. One sort of commodity may be born on its own marketplace, another has to make a long journey to market. Commodity owner number one may therefore be ready to sell before number two is ready to buy. When the same transactions are continually repeated between the same persons, the conditions of sale are regulated in accordance with the conditions of production. On the other hand, the use of a given commodity, of a house, for instance, is sold, in common parlance, let, for a definite period. Here, it is only at the end of the term that the buyer has actually received the use value of the commodity. He therefore buys it before he pays for it. The vendor sells an existing commodity. The purchaser buys as the mere representative of money, or rather of future money. The vendor becomes a creditor, the purchaser becomes a debtor. Since the metamorphosis of commodities, or the development of their value form, appears here under a new aspect, money also acquires a fresh function. It becomes the means of payment. The character of creditor, or of debtor, results here from the simple circulation. The change in the form of that circulation stamps buyer and seller with this new die. At first, therefore, these new parts are just as transient and alternating as those of seller and buyer, and are in turns played by the same actors. But the opposition is not nearly so pleasant and is far more capable of crystallization. Footnote. The following shows the debtor and creditor relations existing between English traders at the beginning of the 18th century. Such a spirit of crudity reigns here in England among the men of trade that is not to be met with in any other society of men, nor in any other kingdom of the world. An Essay on Credit and the Bankrupt Act 1707. End of footnote. The same characters can, however, be assumed independently of the circulation of commodities. The class struggles of the ancient world took the form chiefly of a contest between debtors and creditors, which in Rome ended in the ruin of the plebeian debtors. They were displaced by slaves. In the Middle Ages, the contest ended with the ruin of the feudal debtors, who lost their political power together with the economic basis on which it was established. Nevertheless, the money relation of debtor and creditor that existed at these two periods reflected only the deeper-lying antagonism between the general economic conditions of existence of the classes in question. Let us return to the circulation of commodities. The appearance of the two equivalents, commodities and money, at the two poles of the process of sale, has ceased to be simultaneous. The money functions now, first as a measure of value in the determination of the price of the commodity sold, 
The price fixed by the contract measures the obligation of the debtor or the sum of money that he has to pay at a fixed date. Secondly, it serves as an ideal means of purchase. Although existing only in the promise of the buyer to pay, it causes the commodity to change hands. It is not before the day fixed for payment that the means of payment actually steps into circulation, leaves the hand of the buyer for that of the seller. The circulating medium was transformed into a hoard because the process stopped short after the first phase, because the converted shape of the commodity, viz. the money, was withdrawn from circulation. The means of payment enters the circulation, but only after the commodity has left it. The money is no longer the means that brings about the process. It only brings it to a close by stepping in as the absolute form of existence of exchange value, or as the universal commodity. The seller turned his commodity into money in order thereby to satisfy some want. The hoarder did the same in order to keep his commodity in its money shape, and the debtor in order to be able to pay. If he do not pay, his goods will be sold by the sheriff. The value form of commodities, money, is therefore now the end and aim of a sale, and that owing to a social necessity springing out of the process of circulation itself. The buyer converts money back into commodities before he has turned commodities into money. In other words, he achieves the second metamorphosis of commodities before the first. The seller's commodity circulates and realizes its price, but only in the shape of a legal claim upon money. It is converted into a use value before it has been converted into money. The completion of its first metamorphosis follows only at a later period. Footnote It will be seen from the following quotation from my book which appeared in 1859 why I take no notice in the text of an opposite form. Contrariwise, in the process in money to commodity, the money can be alienated as a real means of purchase and in that way the price of the commodity can be realized before the use value of the money is realized and the commodity actually delivered. This occurs constantly under the everyday form of prepayments, and it is under this form that the English government purchases opium from the riots of India. In these cases, however, the money always acts as a means of purchase. Of course, capital also is advanced in the shape of money. This point of view, however, does not fall within the horizon of simple circulation. Sur critique, etc. End of footnote. The obligations falling due within a given period represent the sum of the prices of the commodities, the sale of which gave rise to those obligations. The quantity of gold necessary to realize this sum depends in the first instance on the rapidity of currency of the means of payment. That quantity is conditioned by two circumstances. First, the relations between debtors and creditors form a sort of chain, in such a way that A, when he receives money from his debtor B, straightway hands it over to C, his creditor, and so on. The second circumstance is the length of the intervals between the different due days of the obligations. The continuous chain of payments, or retarded first metamorphoses, is essentially different from that interlacing of the series of metamorphoses which we considered previously. By the currency of the circulating medium, the connection between buyers and sellers is not merely expressed. This connection is originated by and exists in the circulation alone. Contrariwise, the movement of the means of payment expresses a social relation that was in existence long before. The fact that a number of sales take place simultaneously and side by side limits the extent to which coin can be replaced by the rapidity of currency. 
On the other hand, this fact is a new lever in economizing the means of payment. In proportion, as payments are concentrated at one spot, special institutions and methods are developed for their liquidation. Such in the Middle Ages were the virements at Lyon. The debts due to A from B to B from C to C from A and so on have only to be confronted with each other in order to annul each other to a certain extent like positive and negative quantities. There thus remains only a single balance to pay. The greater the amount of the payments concentrated, the less is this balance relatively to that amount, and the less is the mass of the means of payment in circulation. The function of money as the means of payment implies a contradiction without a terminus medius. In so far as the payments balance one another, money functions only ideally as money of account, as a measure of value. In so far as actual payments have to be made, money does not serve as a circulating medium, as a mere transient agent in the interchange of products, but as the individual incarnation of social labor as the independent form of existence of exchange value, as the universal commodity. This contradiction comes to a head in those phases of industrial and commercial crises which are known as monetary crises. Footnote. The monetary crisis referred to in the text, being a phase of every crisis, must be clearly distinguished from that particular form of crisis which also is called a monetary crisis, but which may be produced by itself as an independent phenomenon in such a way as to react only indirectly on industry and commerce. The pivot of these crises is to be found in moneyed capital, and their sphere of direct action is therefore the sphere of that capital, viz. banking, the stock exchange, and finance. End of footnote. Such a crisis occurs only where the ever-lengthening chain of payments and an artificial system of settling them has been fully developed. Whenever there is a general and extensive disturbance of this mechanism, no matter what its cause, money becomes suddenly and immediately transformed from its merely ideal shape of money of commodities becomes valueless, and their value vanishes in the presence of its own independent form. On the eve of the crisis, the bourgeois, with the self-sufficiency that springs from intoxicating prosperity, declares money to be a vain imagination. Commodities alone are money. But now the cry is everywhere, money alone is a commodity. As the heart pants after fresh water, so pants his soul after money, the only wealth. Footnote the sudden reversion from a system of credit to a system of hard cash heaps theoretical fright on top of the practical panic, and the dealers by whose agency circulation is affected shudder before the impenetrable mystery in which their own economic relations are involved. Karl Marx The poor stand still, because the rich have no money to employ them though they had the same land and hands to provide victuals and clothes as ever they had, which is the true riches of a nation, and not the money. John Bellers, Proposals for Raising a College of Industry, London, 1696. In a crisis, the antithesis between commodities and their value form money becomes heightened into an absolute contradiction. Hence, in such events, the form under which money appears is of no importance. The money famine continues, whether payments have to be made in gold or in credit money such as banknotes. Footnote. The following shows how such times are exploited by the Ami du Commerce. On one occasion, 1839, an old grasping banker in the city, in his private room, raised the lid of the desk he sat over, and displayed to a friend rolls of banknotes, saying with intense glee 
there were six hundred thousand pounds of them. They were held to make money tight, and would all be let out after three o'clock on the same day. The Theory of Exchanges, the Bank Charter Act of 1844. 1864. The Observer, a semi-official government organ, contained the following paragraph on the 24th of April, 1864. Some very curious rumours are current of the means which have been resorted to in order to create a scarcity of banknotes. Questionable as it would seem to suppose that any trick of the kind would be adopted, the report has been so universal that it really deserves a mention. End of footnote. If we now consider the sum total of the money current during a given period, we shall find that, given the rapidity of currency of the circulating medium and of the means of payment, it is equal to the sum of the prices to be realized, plus the sum of the payments falling due, minus the payments that balance each other, minus finally the number of circuits in which the same piece of coin serves, in turn, as means of circulation and of payment. Hence, even when prices, rapidity of currency, and the extent of the economy in payments are given, the quantity of money current, and the mass of commodities circulating during a given period, such as a day, no longer correspond. Money that represents commodities long withdrawn from circulation continues to be current. Commodities circulate whose equivalent in money will not appear on the scene till some future day. Moreover, the debts contracted each day and the payments falling due on the same day are quite incommensurable quantities. Footnote The amount of purchases or contracts entered upon during the course of any given day will not affect the quantity of money afloat on that particular day, but, in the vast majority of cases, will resolve themselves into multifarious drafts upon the quantity of money which may be afloat at subsequent dates more or less distant. The bills granted or credits opened today need have no resemblance whatever, either in quantity, amount, or duration, to those granted or entered upon tomorrow or next day. Nay, many of today's bills and credits, when due, fall in with a mass of liabilities whose origins traverse a range of antecedent dates altogether indefinite. Bills at twelve, six, three months, or one, often aggregating together to swell the common liabilities of one particular day. The Currency Theory Reviewed in a Letter to the Scottish People by a Banker in England, Edinburgh, 1845. Credit money springs directly out of the function of money as a means of payment. Certificates of the debts owing for the purchased commodities circulate for the purpose of transferring those debts to others. On the other hand, to the same extent as the system of credit is extended, so is the function of money as a means of payment. In that character, it takes various forms peculiar to itself under which it makes itself at home in the sphere of great commercial transactions. Gold and silver coin, on the other hand, are mostly relegated to the sphere of retail trade. When the production of commodities has sufficiently extended itself, money begins to serve as the means of payment beyond the sphere of the circulation of commodities. It becomes the commodity that is the universal subject matter of all contracts. Footnote. The course of trade being thus turned from exchanging of goods for goods or delivering and taking to selling and paying, all the bargains are now stated upon the foot of a price in money. An Essay Upon Public Credit, 1710. End of footnote. Rents, taxes, and such like payments are transformed from payments in kind into money payments. To what extent this transformation depends upon the general conditions of production is shown to take one example by the fact that the Roman Empire twice failed in its attempt to levy all contributions in money. 
The unspeakable misery of the French agricultural population under Louis XIV, a misery so eloquently denounced by Bois-Gilbert, Marshal Vauban, and others, was due not only to the weight of the taxes, but also to the conversion of taxes in kind into money taxes. Footnote Money has become the executioner of all things. Finance is the alembic that evaporates a frightful quantity of goods and commodities in order to obtain this fatal extract. Money declares war on the whole human race. Bois-Gilbert Dissertation sur la nature des richesses, de l'argent et des tribus. Economiste financier. Paris, 1843. End of footnote. In Asia, on the other hand, the fact that state taxes are chiefly composed of rents payable in kind depends on conditions of production that are reproduced with the regularity of natural phenomena, and this mode of payment tends in turn to maintain the ancient form of production. It is one of the secrets of the conservation of the Ottoman Empire. If the foreign trade, forced upon Japan by Europeans, should lead to the substitution of money rents for rents in kind, it would be all up with the exemplary agriculture of that country. The narrow economic conditions under which that agriculture is carried on will be swept away. In every country, certain days of the year become by habit recognized settling days for various large and recurrent payments. These dates depend, apart from other revolutions in the wheel of reproduction, on conditions closely connected with the seasons. They also regulate the dates for payments that have no direct connection with the circulation of commodities such as taxes, rents, and so on. The quantity of money requisite to make the payments, falling due on those dates all over the country, causes periodical, though merely superficial, perturbations in the economy of the medium of payment. Footnote On Whitsuntide, 1824, says Mr. Craig before the Commons Committee of 1826, there was such an immense demand for notes upon the banks of Edinburgh that by eleven o'clock they had not a note left in their custody. They sent round to all the different banks to borrow, but could not get them, and many of the transactions were adjusted by slips of paper only. Yet by three o'clock the whole of the notes were returned into the banks from which they had issued. It was a mere transfer from hand to hand. Although the average effective circulation of banknotes in Scotland is less than three million sterling, yet on certain paydays in the year, every single note in the possession of the bankers, amounting in the whole to about seven million pounds, is called into activity. On these occasions the notes have a single and specific function to perform, and so soon as they have performed it, they flow back into the various banks from which they issued. See John Fullerton, Regulation of Currencies, London, 1845. In explanation it should be stated that in Scotland, at the date of Fullerton's work, notes and not cheques were used to withdraw deposits. End of footnote. From the law of the rapidity of currency of the means of payment, it follows that the quantity of the means of payment required for all periodical payments, whatever their source, is in inverse proportion to the length of their periods. Footnote To the question, if there were occasion to raise forty millions per annum, whether the same six millions, gold, would suffice for such revolutions and circulations thereof as trade requires, Petty replies in his usual masterly manner. I answer yes, for the expense being forty millions, if the revolutions were in such short circles, viz. weekly, as happens among poor artisans and labourers who receive pay every Saturday, then forty fifty-second parts of one million of money would answer these ends. But if the circles be quarterly, 
according to our custom of paying rent and gathering taxes, then ten millions were requisite. Wherefore, supposing payments in general to be of a mixed circle between one week and thirteen, then add ten millions to forty fifty seconds, the half of which will be five and a half. So as if we have five and a half millions, we have enough. William Petty, Political Anatomy of Ireland, 1672 End of footnote The development of money into a medium of payment makes it necessary to accumulate money against the dates fixed for the payment of the sums owing, while hoarding, as a distinct mode of acquiring riches, vanishes with the progress of civil society, the formation of reserves of the means of payment grows with that progress. C. Universal Money When money leaves the home sphere of circulation, it strips off the local garbs which it there assumes of a standard of prices, of coin, of tokens, and of a symbol of value, and returns to its original form of bullion. In the trade between the markets of the world, the value of commodities is expressed so as to be universally recognized. Hence their independent value form also, in these cases, confronts them under the shape of universal money. It is only in the markets of the world that money acquires to the full extent the character of the commodity whose bodily form is also the immediate social incarnation of human labor in the abstract. Its real mode of existence in this sphere adequately corresponds to its ideal concept. Within the sphere of home circulation, there can be but one commodity which, by serving as a measure of value, becomes money. In the markets of the world, a double measure of value holds sway, gold and silver. Footnote. Hence the absurdity of every law prescribing that the banks of a country shall form reserves of that precious metal alone which circulates at home. The pleasant difficulties, thus self-created by the Bank of England, are well known. On the subject of the great epochs in the history of the changes in the relative value of gold and silver, see Karl Marx. Sir Robert Peel, by his Bank Act of 1844, sought to tide over the difficulty by allowing the Bank of England to issue notes against silver bullion, on condition that the reserve of silver should never exceed more than one-fourth of the reserve of gold, the value of silver being, for that purpose, estimated at its price in the London market. Added in the fourth German edition we find ourselves once more in a period of serious change in the relative values of gold and silver. About twenty-five years ago, the ratio expressing the relative value of gold and silver was fifteen and a half to one. Now it is approximately twenty-two to one, and silver is still constantly falling as against gold. This is essentially the result of a revolution in the mode of production of both metals. Formerly, Gold was obtained almost exclusively by washing it out from gold-bearing alluvial deposits, products of the weathering of auriferous rocks. Now this method has become inadequate and has been forced into the background by the processing of the quartz loads themselves, a way of extraction which formerly was only of secondary importance, although well known to the ancients. Diodorus, Sicilian, Historische Bibliothèque, 1828. Moreover, not only were new huge silver deposits discovered in North America, in the western part of the Rocky Mountains, but these and the Mexican silver mines were really opened up by the laying of railways, which made possible the shipment of modern machinery and fuel, and in consequence the mining of silver on a very large scale at a low cost. However, there is a great difference in the way the two metals occur in the quartz loads. The gold is mostly native, but disseminated throughout the quartz in minute quantities. The whole mass of the vein must therefore be crushed, and the gold either washed out 
or extracted by means of mercury. Often, one million grams of quartz barely yield one-third and very seldom thirty to sixty grams of gold. Silver is seldom found native. However, it occurs in special quartz that is separated from the load with comparative ease and contains mostly forty to ninety percent silver. Or it is contained in smaller quantities in copper, lead, and other ores, which in themselves are worthwhile working. From this alone, it is apparent that the labor expended on the production of gold is rather increasing while that expended on silver production has decidedly decreased, which quite naturally explains the drop in the value of the latter. This fall in value would express itself in a still greater fall in price if the price of silver were not pegged even today by artificial means. But America's rich silver deposits have so far barely been tapped, and thus the prospects are that the value of this metal will keep on dropping for rather a long time to come. A still greater contributing factor here is the relative decrease in the requirement of silver for articles of general use and for luxuries, that is, its replacement by plated goods, aluminium, etc. One may thus gauge the utopianism of the bimetallist idea that compulsory international quotation will raise silver again to the old value ratio of one to fifteen and a half. It is more likely that silver will forfeit its money function more and more in the markets of the world. Friedrich Engels End of footnote Money of the world serves as the universal medium of payment, as the universal means of purchasing, and as the universally recognized embodiment of all wealth. Its function as a means of payment in the settling of international balances is its chief one. Hence the watchword of the mercantilists, balance of trade. Footnote. The opponents themselves of the mercantile system, a system which considered the settlement of surplus trade balances in gold and silver as the aim of international trade, entirely misconceived the functions of money of the world. I have shown by the example of Ricardo in what way their false conception of the laws that regulate the quantity of the circulating medium is reflected in their equally false conception of the international movement of the precious metals. His erroneous dogma, an unfavorable balance of trade, never arises but from a redundant currency, the exportation of the coin is caused by its cheapness, and is not the effect but the cause of an unfavorable balance, already occurs in Barbon. The balance of trade, if there be one, is not the cause of sending away the money out of a nation, but that proceeds from the difference of the value of bullion in every country, in Barbon. McCulloch, in The Literature of Political Economy, a classified catalogue, London 1845, praises Barbon for this anticipation, but prudently passes over the naive forms in which Barbon closed the absurd catalogue, culminates in the sections devoted to the history of the theory of money. The reason is that McCulloch in this part of the work is flattering Lord Overstone, whom he calls Facile Princeps Argentinorum. End of footnote. Gold and silver serve as international means of purchasing chiefly and necessarily in those periods when the customary equilibrium in the interchange of products between different nations is suddenly disturbed. And lastly, it serves as the universally recognized embodiment of social wealth, whenever the question is not of buying or paying, but of transferring wealth from one country to another, and whenever this transference in the form of commodities is rendered impossible, either by special conjunctures in the markets or by the purpose itself that is intended. Footnote. For instance, in subsidies, money loans for carrying on wars, or for enabling banks to resume cash payments, etc. It is the money form 
and no other of value that may be wanted. End of footnote. Just as every country needs a reserve of money for its home circulation, so too it requires one for external circulation in the markets of the world. The functions of hoards, therefore, arise in part out of the function of money as the medium of the home circulation and home payments, and in part out of its function of money of the world. Footnote I would desire, indeed, no more convincing evidence of the competency of the machinery of the hordes in specie-paying countries to perform every necessary office of international adjustment without any sensible aid from the general circulation than the facility with which France, when but just recovering from the shock of a destructive foreign invasion, completed within the space of twenty-seven months the payment of her forced contribution of nearly twenty millions to the Allied powers, and a considerable portion of the sum in specie, without any perceptible contraction or derangement of her domestic currency, or even any alarming fluctuation of her exchanges. Fullerton. Added in the fourth German edition. We have a still more striking example in the facility with which the same France was able in 1871-73 to to pay off within thirty months a forced contribution more than ten times as great, a considerable part of it likewise in specie. Friedrich Engels End of footnote For this latter function, the genuine money commodity, actual gold and silver, is necessary. On that account, Sir James Stewart in order to distinguish them from their purely local substitutes, calls gold and silver money of the world. The current of the stream of gold and silver is a double one. On the one hand, it spreads itself from its sources over all the markets of the world, in order to become absorbed, to various extents, into the different national spheres of circulation, to fill the conduits of currency, to replace abraded gold and silver coins, to supply the material of articles of luxury, and to petrify into hoards. Footnote. Money is shared among the nations in accordance with their need for it, as it is always attracted by the products. Le Trone. The mines which are continually giving gold and silver do give sufficient to supply such a needful balance to every nation. J. Vanderlint. End of footnote. This first current is started by the countries that exchange their labor realized in commodities for the labor embodied in the precious metals by gold and silver producing countries. On the other hand, there is a continual flowing backwards and forwards of gold and silver between the different national spheres of circulation, a current whose motion depends on the ceaseless fluctuations in the course of exchange. Footnote. Exchanges rise and fall every week, and at some particular times in the year run high against a nation, and at other times run as high on the contrary. N. Barbon. Countries in which the bourgeois form of production is developed to a certain extent limit the hoards concentrated in the strong rooms of the banks to the minimum required for the proper performance of their peculiar functions. Footnote. These various functions are liable to come into dangerous conflict with one another whenever gold and silver have also to serve as a fund for the conversion of banknotes. End of footnote. Whenever these hordes are strikingly above their average level, it is, with some exceptions, an indication of stagnation in the circulation of commodities, of an interruption in the even flow of their metamorphoses. Footnote. What money is more than of absolute necessity for a home trade is dead stock, and brings no profit to that country it's kept in. but as it is transported in trade as well as imported. John Beller's Essays
What if we have too much coin? We may melt down the heaviest and turn it into the splendor of plate, vessels, or utensils of gold or silver, or send it out as a commodity, where the same is wanted or desired, or let it out at interest, where interest is high. W. Petty, Quantulum Cunque. Money is but the fat of the body politic, whereof too much doth as often hinder its agility as too little makes it sick. As fat lubricates the motion of the muscles, feeds in want of victuals, fills up the uneven cavities, and beautifies the body, so doth money in the state quicken its action, feeds from abroad in time of dearth at home, evens accounts, and beautifies the whole. Although more especially the particular persons that have it in plenty. W. Petty, Political Anatomy of Ireland. End of footnote. Part two. Transformation of money into capital. Chapter four. The general formula for capital. The circulation of commodities is the starting point of capital. The production of commodities, their circulation, and that more developed form of their circulation called commerce, these form the historical groundwork from which it rises. The modern history of capital dates from the creation in the 16th century of a world-embracing commerce from the exchange of the various use values and consider only the economic forms produced by this process of circulation, we find its final result to be money. This final product of the circulation of commodities is the first form in which capital appears. As a matter of history, capital, as opposed to landed property, invariably takes the form at first of money. It appears as moneyed wealth, as the capital of the merchant and of the usurer. Footnote. The contrast between the power, based on the personal relations of dominion and servitude, that is conferred by landed property, and the impersonal power that is given by money, is well expressed by two French proverbs, Nul terre sans seigneur, and l'argent n'a pas de maître. No land without its lord, and money has no master. End of footnote. But we have no need to refer to the origin of capital in order to discover that the first form of appearance of capital is money. We can see it daily under our very eyes. All new capital, to commence with, comes on the stage, that is, on the market, whether of commodities, labor, or money, even in our days in the shape of money that by a definite process has to be transformed into capital. The first distinction we notice between money that is money only and money that is capital is nothing more than a difference in their form of circulation. The simplest form of the circulation of commodities is commodity to money to commodity. The transformation of commodities into money and the change of the money back again into commodities, or selling in order to buy. But alongside of this form, we find another specifically different form, money to commodity to money, the transformation of money into commodities, and the change of commodities back again into money, or buying in order to sell. Money that circulates in the latter manner is thereby transformed into becomes capital, and is already potentially capital. Now let us examine the circuit money to commodity to money a little closer. It consists, like the other, of two antithetical phases. In the first phase, money to commodity, or the purchase, the money is changed into a commodity. In the second phase, commodity to money, or the sale, the commodity is changed back again into money. The combination of these two phases constitutes the single movement whereby money is exchanged for a commodity, and the same commodity is again exchanged for money. 
whereby a commodity is bought in order to be sold, or neglecting the distinction in form between buying and selling, whereby a commodity is bought with money, and then money is bought with a commodity. Footnote. With money one buys commodities, and with commodities one buys money. Mercier de la Riviere, L'Ordre Naturel et Essentiel des Sociétés Politiques. End of footnote. The result, in which the phases of the process vanish, is the exchange of money for money, money to money. If I purchase two thousand pounds of cotton for one hundred pounds, and resell the two thousand pounds of cotton for one hundred and ten pounds, I have in fact exchanged one hundred pounds for one hundred and ten pounds, money for money. Now it is evident that the circuit money to commodity to money would be absurd and without meaning if the intention were to exchange by this means two equal sums of money, one hundred pounds for one hundred pounds. The miser's plan would be far simpler and surer. He sticks to his hundred pounds instead of exposing it to the dangers of circulation. And yet, whether the merchant who has paid one hundred pounds for his cotton sells it for one hundred and ten pounds, or lets it go for one hundred pounds, or even fifty pounds, his money has, at all events, gone through a characteristic and original movement, quite different in kind from that which it goes through in the hands of the peasant, who sells corn, and with the money thus set free buys clothes. We have therefore to examine first the distinguishing characteristics of the forms of the circuits money to commodity to money, and commodity to money to commodity, and in doing this the real difference that underlies the mere difference of form will reveal itself. Let us see in the first place what the two forms have in common. Both circuits are resolvable into the same two antithetical phases, commodity to money, a sale, and money to commodity, a purchase. In each of these phases, the same material elements, a commodity and money, and the same economic dramatis personae, a buyer and a seller, confront one another. Each circuit is the unity of the same two antithetical phases, and in each case this unity is brought about by the intervention of three contracting parties, of whom one only sells, one only buys, while the third both buys and sells. What, however, first and foremost distinguishes the circuit commodity to money to commodity from the circuit money to commodity to money is the inverted order of succession of the two phases. The simple circulation of commodities begins with a sale and ends with a purchase, while the circulation of money as capital begins with a purchase and ends with a sale. In the one case, both the starting point and the goal are commodities. In the other, they are money. In the first form, the movement is brought about by the intervention of money, in the second, by that of a commodity. In the circulation commodity to money to commodity, the money is in the end converted into a commodity that serves as a use value. It is spent once and for all. In the inverted form, money to commodity to money, on the contrary, the buyer lays out money in order that, as a seller, he may recover money. By the purchase of his commodity he throws money into circulation, in order to withdraw it again by the sale of the same commodity. He lets the money go, but only with the sly intention of getting it back again. The money, therefore, is not spent, it is merely advanced. Footnote. When a thing is bought in order to be sold again, the sum employed is called money advanced. When it is bought not to be sold, it may be said to be expended. James Stewart. Works, etc. Edited by General Sir James Stewart, his son, 1805. End of footnote. In the circuit Commodity to Money to Commodity, 
The same piece of money changes its place twice. The seller gets it from the buyer and pays it away to another seller. The complete circulation, which begins with the receipt, concludes with the payment of money for commodities. It is the very contrary in the circuit, money to commodity to money. Here it is not the piece of money that changes its place twice, but the commodity. The buyer takes it from the hands of the seller and passes it into the hands of another buyer. Just as in the simple circulation of commodities, the double change of place of the same piece of money effects its passage from one hand into another, so here the double change of place of the same commodity brings about the reflux of the money to its point of departure. Such reflux is not dependent on the commodity being sold for more than was paid for it. This circumstance influences only the amount of the money that comes back. The reflux itself takes place so soon as the purchased commodity is resold. In other words, so soon as the circuit money to commodity to money is completed. We have here, therefore, a palpable difference between the circulation of money as capital and its circulation as mere money. The circuit, commodity to money to commodity, comes completely to an end, so soon as the money brought in by the sale of one commodity is abstracted again by the purchase of another. If, nevertheless, there follows a reflux of money to its starting point, this can only happen through a renewal or repetition of the operation. If I sell a quarter of corn for three pounds, and with this three pounds buy clothes, the money, so far as I am concerned, is spent and done with. It belongs to the clothes merchant. If I now sell a quarter of corn, money indeed flows back to me, not, however, as a sequel to the first transaction, but in consequence of its repetition. The money again leaves me, so soon as I complete this second transaction by a fresh purchase. Therefore, in the circuit, commodity to money to commodity, the expenditure of money has nothing to do with its reflux. On the other hand, in money to commodity to money, the reflux of the money is conditioned by the very mode of its expenditure. Without this reflux, the operation fails or the process is interrupted and incomplete, owing to the absence of its complementary and final phase, the sale. The circuit commodity to money to commodity starts with one commodity and finishes with another, which falls out of circulation and into consumption. Consumption the satisfaction of wants, in one word use value, is its end and aim. The circuit money to commodity to money, on the contrary, commences with money and ends with money. Its leading motive, and the goal that attracts it, is therefore mere exchange value. In the simple circulation of commodities, the two extremes of the circuit have the same economic form. They are both commodities and commodities of equal value. But they are also use-values differing in their qualities, as, for example, corn and clothes. The exchange of products of the different materials in which the labour of society is embodied forms here the basis of the movement. It is otherwise in the circulation money to commodity to money, which at first sight appears purposeless, because tautological. Both extremes have the same economic form. They are both money, and therefore are not qualitatively different use values. For money is but the converted form of commodities, in which their particular use values vanish. To exchange one hundred pounds for cotton, and then this same cotton again for one hundred pounds, is merely a roundabout way of exchanging money for money, the same for the same, and appears to be an operation just as purposeless as it is absurd. Footnote. One does not exchange money for money, says Mercier de la Riviere to the mercantilists. In a work which ex professo treats of trade and speculation occurs the following. 
All trade consists in the exchange of things of different kinds, and the advantage to the merchant arises out of this difference. To exchange a pound of bread against a pound of bread would be attended with no advantage. Hence, trade is advantageously contrasted with gambling, which consists in a mere exchange of money for money. Thomas Corbett, an inquiry into the causes and modes. Although Corbett does not see that money to money, the exchange of money for money, is the characteristic form of circulation not only of merchants' capital but of all capital, yet at least he acknowledges that this form is common to gambling and to one species of trade, viz. speculation. But then comes McCulloch and makes out that to buy in order to sell is to speculate, and thus the difference between speculation and trade vanishes. Every transaction in which an individual buys produce in order to sell it again is, in fact, a speculation. McCulloch, A Dictionary Practical Etc. of Commerce, 1847 With much more naivety, Pinto, the Pindar of the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, remarks, Trade is a game, and nothing can be won from beggars. If one won everything from everybody all the time, it would be necessary to give back the greater part of the profit voluntarily in order to begin the game again. Pinto, Traité de la Circulation et du Crédit, 1771. End of footnote. One sum of money is distinguishable from another only by its amount. The character and tendency of the process money to commodity to money is therefore not due to any qualitative difference between its extremes, both being money, but solely to their quantitative difference. More money is withdrawn from circulation at the finish than was thrown into it at the start. The cotton that was bought for one hundred pounds is perhaps resold for one hundred pounds plus ten pounds, or one hundred and ten pounds. The exact form of this process is therefore money to commodity to incremented money, where incremented money equals money plus increment, equals the original sum advanced plus an increment. This increment or excess over the original value I call surplus value. The value originally advanced, therefore, not only remains intact while in circulation, but adds to itself a surplus value or expands itself. It is this movement that converts it into capital. Of course, it is also possible that in commodity to money to commodity, the two extremes commodity to commodity, say corn and clothes, may represent different quantities of value. The farmer may sell his corn above its value, or may buy clothes at less than their value. He may, on the other hand, be done by the clothes merchant. Yet, in the form of circulation now under consideration, such differences in value are purely accidental. The fact that the corn and the clothes are equivalents does not deprive the process of all meaning, as it does in money to commodity to money. The equivalence of their values is rather a necessary condition to its normal course. The repetition or renewal of the act of selling in order to buy is kept within bounds by the very object it aims at, namely, consumption or the satisfaction of definite wants, an aim that lies altogether outside the sphere of circulation. But when we buy in order to sell, we, on the contrary, begin and end with the same thing, money, exchange value, and thereby the movement becomes interminable. No doubt M becomes M plus increment. One hundred pounds become one hundred and ten pounds. But when viewed in their qualitative aspect alone, one hundred and ten pounds are the same as one hundred pounds, namely money, and considered quantitatively, one hundred and ten pounds is, like one hundred pounds, a sum of definite and limited value. If now the one hundred and ten pounds be spent as money, 
They cease to play their part. They are no longer capital. Withdrawn from circulation, they become petrified into a horde, and though they remained in that state till doomsday, not a single farthing would accrue to them. If, then, the expansion of value is once aimed at, there is just the same inducement to augment the value of the hundred and ten pounds as that of the hundred pounds, for both are but limited expressions for exchange value, and therefore both have the same vocation to approach, by quantitative increase, as near as possible to absolute wealth. Momentarily, indeed, the value originally advanced, the one hundred pounds, is distinguishable from the surplus value of ten pounds, that is, annexed to it during circulation, but the distinction vanishes immediately. At the end of the process, we do not receive with one hand the original one hundred pounds and with the other the surplus value of ten pounds, we simply get a value of one hundred and ten pounds, which is in exactly the same condition and fitness for commencing the expanding process as the original one hundred pounds was. Money ends the movement only to begin it again. Footnote. Capital is divisible into the original capital and the profit, the increment to the capital, although in practice this profit is immediately turned into capital and set in motion with the original. Friedrich Engels, Um Risse zu einer Kritik der Nationalökonomie in Deutsch-Französische Jahrbücher herausgegeben von Arnold Ruger und Karl Marx, 1844. End of footnote. Therefore, the final result of every separate circuit in which a purchase and consequent sale are completed forms of itself the starting point of a new circuit. The simple circulation of commodities selling in order to buy is a means of carrying out a purpose unconnected with circulation, namely the appropriation of use values, the satisfaction of wants. The circulation of money as capital is, on the contrary, an end in itself, for the expansion of value takes place only within this constantly renewed movement. The circulation of capital has therefore no limits. Footnote Aristotle opposes economique to crematistic. He starts from the former. So far as it is the art of gaining a livelihood, it is limited to procuring those articles that are necessary to existence, and useful either to a household or the state. True wealth consists of such values in use, for the quantity of possessions of this kind, capable of making life pleasant, is not unlimited. There is, however, a second mode of acquiring things, to which we may, by preference and with correctness, give the name of crematistic, and in this case there appear to be no limits to riches and possessions. Trade, a capellica is literally retail trade, and Aristotle takes this kind because in it values in use predominate, does not in its nature belong to crematistic, for here the exchange has reference only to what is necessary to themselves, the buyer or seller. Therefore, as he goes on to show, the original form of trade was barter, but with the extension of the latter there arose the necessity for money. On the discovery of money, barter of necessity developed into capellica, into trading in commodities, and this again, in opposition to its original tendency, grew into crematistic, into the art of making money. Now, crematistic is distinguishable from economic in this way, that In the case of crematistic, circulation is the source of riches, and it appears to revolve about money, for money is the beginning and end of this kind of exchange. Therefore also riches, such as crematistic strives for, are unlimited. Just as every art that is not a means to an end but an end in itself has no limit to its aims because it seeks constantly to approach nearer and nearer to that end, 
while those arts that pursue means to an end are not boundless, since the goal itself imposes a limit upon them, so with crematistic there are no bounds to its aims, these aims being absolute wealth. Economic, not crematistic, has a limit. The object of the former is something different from money, of the latter the augmentation of money. By confounding these two forms, which overlap each other, some people have been led to look upon the preservation and increase of money ad infinitum as the end and aim of economic. Aristoteles. De Rep. End of footnote. As the conscious representative of this movement, the possessor of money becomes a capitalist. His person, or rather his pocket, is the point from which the money starts and to which it returns. The expansion of value, which is the objective basis or mainspring of the circulation money to commodity to money, becomes his subjective aim. And it is only in so far as the appropriation of ever more and more wealth in the abstract becomes the sole motive of his operations that he functions as a capitalist. That is, as capital personified and endowed with consciousness and a will. Footnote. Commodities, here used in the sense of use values, are not the terminating object of the trading capitalist. Money is his terminating object. T. Chalmers, On Political Economy, etc., 1832. End of footnote. Use values must therefore never be looked upon as the real aim of the capitalist, neither must the profit on any single transaction. The restless, never-ending process of profit-making alone is what he aims at. Footnote. The merchant counts the money he has made as almost nothing. He always looks to the future. A. Genovese, Lezioni di Economia Civile. 1765, Custodes edition of Italian Economists, Parte Moderna. End of footnote. Footnote. The inextinguishable passion for gain, the auri sacra fames, will always lead capitalists. McCulloch, The Principles of Political Economy, 1830. This view, of course, does not prevent the same McCulloch and others of his kidney when in theoretical difficulties, such, for example, as the question of overproduction, from transforming the same capitalist into a moral citizen whose sole concern is for use values, and who even develops an insatiable hunger for boots, hats, eggs, calico, and other extremely familiar sorts of use values. End of footnote. This boundless greed after riches, this passionate chase after exchange value, is common to the capitalist and the miser. But while the miser is merely a capitalist gone mad, the capitalist is a rational miser. The never-ending augmentation of exchange value, which the miser strives after by seeking to save his money from circulation, is attained by the more acute capitalist, by constantly throwing it afresh into circulation. Footnote. That infinity which things do not possess, they possess in circulation. Galliani. End of footnote. The independent form, that is, the money form, which the value of commodities assumes in the case of simple circulation, serves only one purpose, namely their exchange and vanishes in the final result of the movement. On the other hand, in the circulation money to commodity to money, both the money and the commodity represent only different modes of existence of value itself, the money its general mode, and the commodity its particular, or so to say, disguised mode. Footnote. It is not matter which makes capital, but the value of that matter. J. B. Say, Traité d'économie politique, 1817, end of footnote.
It is constantly changing from one form to the other without thereby becoming lost, and thus assumes an automatically active character. If we now take in turn each of the two different forms which self-expanding value successively assumes in the course of its life, we then arrive at these two propositions. Capital is money. Capital is commodities. Footnote Currency employed in producing articles is capital. MacLeod, The Theory and Practice of Banking, 1855. Capital is commodities. James Mill, Elements of Political Economy, 1821. End of footnote. In truth, however, value is here the active factor in a process in which, while constantly assuming the form in turn of money and commodities, it at the same time changes in magnitude, differentiates itself by throwing off surplus value from itself. The original value, in other words, expands spontaneously. For the movement, in the course of which it adds surplus value, is its own movement, its expansion, therefore, is automatic expansion. Because it is value, it has acquired the occult quality of being able to add value to itself. It brings forth living offspring, or at least lays golden eggs. Value, therefore, being the active factor in such a process, and assuming at one time the form of money, at another that of commodities, but through all these changes preserving itself and expanding, it requires some independent form by means of which its identity may at any time be established, and this form it possesses only in the shape of money. It is under the form of money that value begins and ends, and begins again, every act of its own spontaneous generation. It began by being one hundred pounds, it is now one hundred and ten pounds, and so on but the money itself is only one of the two forms of value. Unless it takes the form of some commodity, it does not become capital. There is here no antagonism, as in the case of hoarding, between the money and commodities. The capitalist knows that all commodities, however scurvy they may look, or however badly they may smell, are in faith and in truth money inwardly circumcised Jews, and what is more, a wonderful means whereby out of money to make more money. In simple circulation, commodity to money to commodity, the value of commodities attained at most a form independent of their use values, that is, the form of money. But that same value, now in the circulation money to commodity to money, or the circulation of capital, suddenly presents itself as an independent substance, endowed with a motion of its own, passing through a life process of its own, in which money and commodities are mere forms which it assumes and casts off in turn. Nay, more. Instead of simply representing the relations of commodities, it enters now, so to say, into private relations with itself. It differentiates itself as original value from itself as surplus value. As the father differentiates himself from himself qua the son, yet both are one and of one age. For only by the surplus value of ten pounds does the one hundred pounds originally advanced become capital, and so soon as this takes place, so soon as the son and by the son the father is begotten, so soon does their difference vanish, and they again become one. One hundred and ten pounds. Value therefore now becomes value in process, money in process, and as such, capital. It comes out of circulation, enters into it again, preserves and multiplies itself within its circuit, comes back out of it with expanded bulk, and begins the same round ever afresh. Money to incremented money, money which begets money, such is the description of capital from the mouths of its first interpreters, the mercantilists.
buying in order to sell, or more accurately, buying in order to sell dearer money to commodity to incremented money, appears certainly to be a form peculiar to one kind of capital alone, namely merchants' capital. But industrial capital, too, is money that is changed into commodities and by the sale of these commodities is reconverted into more money. The events that take place outside the sphere of circulation, in the interval between the buying and the selling, do not affect the form of this movement. Lastly, in the case of interest-bearing capital, the circulation money to commodity to incremented money appears abridged. We have its result without the intermediate stage, in the form money to incremented money, en style lapidaire, so to say, money that is worth more money, value that is greater than itself. Money to commodity to incremented money is therefore in reality the general formula of capital, as it appears prima facie within the sphere of circulation. Chapter 5 Contradictions in the General Formula of Capital The form which circulation takes when money becomes capital is opposed to all the laws we have hitherto investigated bearing on the nature of commodities, value, and money, and even of circulation itself. What distinguishes this form from that of the simple circulation of commodities is the inverted order of succession of the two antithetical processes, sale and purchase. How can this purely formal distinction between these processes change their character, as it were, by magic? But that is not all. The inversion has no existence for two out of the three persons who transact business together. As capitalist, I buy commodities from A and sell them again to B but as a simple owner of commodities, I sell them to B and then purchase fresh ones from A. A and B see no difference between the two sets of transactions. They are merely buyers or sellers, and I on each occasion meet them as a mere owner of either money or commodities, as a buyer or a seller, and what is more, in both sets of transactions I am opposed to A only as a buyer and to be only as a seller, to the one only as money, to the other only as commodities, and to neither of them as capital or a capitalist, or as representative of anything that is more than money or commodities, or that can produce any effect beyond what money and commodities can. For me, the purchase from A and the sale to B are part of a series, but the connection between the two acts exists for me alone. A does not trouble himself about my transaction with B, nor does B about my business with A. And if I offered to explain to them the meritorious nature of my action in inverting the order of succession, they would probably point out to me that I was mistaken as to that order of succession, and that the whole transaction, instead of beginning with a purchase and ending with a sale, began, on the contrary, with a sale, and was concluded with a purchase. In truth, my first act, the purchase, was from the standpoint of A, a sale, and my second act, the sale, was from the standpoint of B, a purchase. Not content with that, A and B would declare that the whole series was superfluous, and nothing but hocus-pocus, that for the future A would buy direct from B, and B sell direct to A. Thus the whole transaction would be reduced to a single act, forming an isolated, non-complemented phase in the ordinary circulation of commodities, a mere sale from A's point of view, and from B's a mere purchase. The inversion, therefore, of the order of succession does not take us outside the sphere of the simple circulation of commodities, and we must rather look whether there is in this simple circulation anything permitting an expansion of the value that enters into circulation, and consequently a creation of surplus value. Let us take the process of circulation in a form under which it presents itself as a simple and direct exchange of commodities. 
This is always the case when two owners of commodities buy from each other, and on the settling day the amounts mutually owing are equal and cancel each other. The money in this case is money of account, and serves to express the value of the commodities by their prices, but is not itself in the shape of hard cash confronted with them. So far as regards use values, it is clear that both parties may gain some advantage. Both part with goods that, as use values, are of no service to them, and receive others that they can make use of. And there may also be a further gain. A, who sells wine and buys corn, possibly produces more wine with given labour time than farmer B could, and B, on the other hand, more corn than wine grower A could. A, therefore, may get for the same exchange value more corn and B, more wine, than each would respectively get without any exchange by producing his own corn and wine. With reference, therefore, to use value, there is good ground for saying that exchange is a transaction by which both sides gain. Footnote Exchange is a transaction in which the two contracting parties always gain, both of them. Distut de Tracy, Traité de la Volonté et de ses effets, Paris, 1826. It is otherwise with exchange value. A man who has plenty of wine and no corn treats with a man who has plenty of corn and no wine, an exchange takes place between them of corn to the value of fifty for wine of the same value. This act produces no increase of exchange value either for the one or the other, for each of them already possessed, before the exchange, a value equal to that which he acquired by means of that operation. Mercier de la Riviere. The result is not altered by introducing money as a medium of circulation between the commodities and making the sale and the purchase two distinct acts. Footnote. Whether one of those two values is money, or they are both ordinary commodities, is in itself a matter of complete indifference. Mercier de la Riviere. End of footnote. The value of a commodity is expressed in its price before it goes into circulation, and is therefore a precedent condition of circulation, not its result. Footnote. It is not the parties to a contract who decide on the value. That has been decided before the contract. Le Trône. End of footnote. Abstractedly considered, that is, apart from circumstances not immediately flowing from the laws of the simple circulation of commodities, there is in an exchange nothing, if we accept the replacing of one use value by another, but a metamorphosis, a mere change in the form of the commodity. The same exchange value, that is, the same quantity of incorporated social labour, remains throughout in the hands of the owner of the commodity, first in the shape of his own commodity, then in the form of the money for which he exchanged it, and lastly in the shape of the commodity he buys with that money. The change of form does not imply a change in the magnitude of the value, but the change which the value of the commodity undergoes in this process is limited to a change in its money form. This form exists first as the price of the commodity offered for sale, then as an actual sum of money, which, however, was already expressed in the price, and lastly as the price of an equivalent commodity. This change of form no more implies, taken alone, a change in the quantity of value than does the change of a five-pound note into sovereigns, half-sovereigns, and shillings. So far, therefore, as the circulation of commodities effects a change in the form alone of their values and is free from disturbing influences, it must be the exchange of equivalents. Little as vulgar economy knows about the nature of value, 
yet whenever it wishes to consider the phenomena of circulation in their purity, it assumes that supply and demand are equal, which amounts to this, that their effect is nil. If, therefore, as regards the use values exchanged, both buyer and seller may possibly gain something, this is not the case as regards the exchange values. Here we must rather say, where equality exists, there can be no gain. It is true, commodities may be sold at prices deviating from their values, but these deviations are to be considered as infractions of the laws of the exchange of commodities, which, in its normal state, is an exchange of equivalents. Consequently, no method for increasing value. Footnote. The exchange becomes unfavorable for one of the parties when some external circumstance comes to lessen or increase the price. Then equality is infringed, but this infringement arises from that cause and not from the exchange itself. Le Trône. Exchange is by its nature a contract which rests on equality, that is, it takes place between two equal values, and is not a means of self-enrichment, since as much is given as is received. Le Trône. End of footnote. Hence we see that behind all attempts to represent the circulation of commodities as a source of surplus value, there lurks a quid pro quo, a mixing up of use value and exchange value. For instance, Condiac says, It is not true that on an exchange of commodities we give value for value. On the contrary, each of the two contracting parties in every case gives a less for a greater value. If we really exchanged equal values, neither party could make a profit. And yet they both gain, or ought to gain. Why? The value of a thing consists solely in its relation to our wants. What is more to the one is less to the other, and vice versa. It is not to be assumed that we offer for sale articles required for our own consumption. We wish to part with a useless thing in order to get one that we need. We want to give less for more. It was natural to think that, in an exchange, value was given for value, whenever each of the articles exchanged was of equal value with the same quantity of gold. But there is another point to be considered in our calculation. The question is whether we both exchange something superfluous for something necessary. Footnote, Condillac. Le Commerce et le Gouvernement, 1776. End of footnote. We see in this passage how Condillac not only confuses use value with exchange value, but in a really childish manner assumes that in a society in which the production of commodities is well developed, each producer produces his own means of subsistence and throws into circulation only the excess over his own requirements. Footnote. Le Trône, therefore, answers his friend Condillac with justice as follows. In a developed society, absolutely nothing is superfluous. At the same time, in a bantering way, he remarks, if both the persons who exchange receive more to an equal amount and part with less to an equal amount, they both get the same. It is because Condillac has not the remotest idea of the nature of exchange value that he has been chosen by Herr Professor Wilhelm Rocher as a proper person to answer for the soundness of his own childish notions. See Rocher's Die Grundlagen der Nationalökonomie, Dritte Auflage, 1858. End of footnote. Still, Condillac's argument is frequently used by modern economists, more especially when the point is to show that the exchange of commodities in its developed form, commerce, is productive of surplus value. For instance, commerce adds value to products, for the same products in the hands of consumers are worth more than in the hands of producers, and it may strictly be considered an act of production. Footnote. S. P. Newman, 
Elements of Political Economy, 1835. End of footnote. But commodities are not paid for twice over, once on account of their use value and again on a serviceable to the seller. Would he otherwise sell it? We might therefore just as well say that the buyer performs strictly an act of production by converting stockings, for example, into money. If commodities, or commodities and money, of equal exchange value, and consequently equivalents, are exchanged, it is plain that no one abstracts more value from than he throws into circulation. There is no creation of surplus value, and in its normal form the circulation of commodities demands the exchange of equivalents. But in actual practice, the process does not retain its normal form. Let us therefore assume an exchange of non equivalents. In any case, the market for commodities is only frequented by owners of commodities, and the power which these persons exercise over each other is no other than the power of their commodities. The material variety of these commodities is the material incentive to the act of exchange, and makes buyers and sellers mutually dependent because none of them possesses the object of his own wants, and each holds in his hand the object of another's wants. Besides these material differences of their use values, there is only one other difference between commodities, namely that between their bodily form and the form into which they are converted by sale, the difference between commodities and money. And consequently the owners of commodities are distinguishable only as sellers, those who own commodities, and buyers, those who own money. Suppose then that by some inexplicable privilege the seller is enabled to sell his commodities above their value, what is worth one hundred for one hundred and ten, in which case the price is nominally raised ten per cent. The seller therefore pockets a surplus value of ten. But after he has sold, he becomes a buyer. A third owner of commodities comes to him now as seller, who in this capacity also enjoys the privilege of selling his commodities ten per cent too dear. Our friend gained ten as a seller, only to lose it again as buyer. Footnote. By the augmentation of the nominal value of the produce, sellers not enriched since what they gain as sellers, they precisely expend in the quality of buyers. The Essential Principles of the Wealth of Nations, etc., London, 1797. End of footnote. The net result is that all owners of commodities sell their goods to one another at 10% above their value, which comes precisely to the same as if they sold them at their true value. Such a general and nominal rise of prices has the same effect as if the values had been expressed in weight of silver instead of in weight of gold. The nominal prices of commodities would rise, but the real relation between their values would remain unchanged. Let us make the opposite assumption, that the buyer has the privilege of purchasing commodities under their value. In this case, it is no longer necessary to bear in mind that he in his turn will become a seller. He was so before he became buyer. He had already lost 10% in selling before he gained 10% as buyer. Footnote. If one is compelled to sell a quantity of a certain product for 18 livres, when it has a value of 24 livres, when one employs the same amount of money in buying, one will receive for 18 livres the same quantity of the product as 24 livres would have bought otherwise. Le Trône. End of footnote. Everything is just as it was. The creation of surplus value, and therefore the conversion of money into capital, can consequently be explained neither on the assumption that commodities are sold above their value, nor that they are bought below their value. Footnote. A seller can normally only succeed in raising the prices of his commodities if he agrees to pay, by and large, more for the commodities of the other sellers, 
and for the same reason, a consumer can normally only pay less for his purchases if he submits to a similar reduction in the prices of the things he sells. Mercier de la Riviere. End of footnote. The problem is in no way simplified by introducing irrelevant matters after the manner of Colonel Torrens. Effectual demand consists in the power and inclination on the part of consumers to give for commodities, either by immediate or circuitous barter, some greater portion of capital than their production costs. Footnote. Torrens. An Essay on the Production of Wealth. London, 1821. End of footnote. In relation to circulation, producers and consumers meet only as buyers and sellers. To assert that the surplus value acquired by the producer has its origin in the fact that consumers pay for commodities more than their value is only to say, in other words, the owner of commodities possesses, as a seller, the privilege of selling too dear. The seller has himself produced the commodities or represents their producer, but the buyer has to no less extent produced the commodities represented by his money or represents their producer. The distinction between them is that one buys and the other sells. The fact that the owner of the commodities under the designation of producer sells them over their value and under the designation of consumer pays too much for them, does not carry us a single step further. Footnote. The idea of profits being paid by the consumers is assuredly very absurd. Who are the consumers? G. Ramsey, An Essay on the Distribution of Wealth, Edinburgh, 1836. End of footnote. To be consistent, therefore, the upholders of the delusion that surplus value has its origin in a nominal rise of prices or in the privilege which the seller has of selling too dear must assume the existence of a class that only buys and does not sell, that is, only consumes and does not produce. The existence of such a class is inexplicable from the standpoint we have so far reached, viz. that of simple circulation. But let us anticipate. The money with which such a class is constantly making purchases must constantly flow into their pockets without any exchange, gratis, by might or right, from the pockets of the commodity owners themselves. To sell commodities above their value to such a class is only to crib back again a part of the money previously given to it. Footnote when a man is in want of a demand, does Mr. Malthus recommend him to pay some other person to take off his goods? Is a question put by an angry disciple of Ricardo to Malthus, who, like his disciple Parson Chalmers, economically glorifies this class of simple buyers or consumers. See, an inquiry into those principles respecting the nature of demand and the necessity of consumption lately advocated by Mr. Malthus, etc., 1821. End of footnote. The towns of Asia Minor thus paid a yearly money tribute to ancient Rome. With this money, Rome purchased from them commodities and purchased them too dear. The provincials cheated the Romans and thus got back from their conquerors in the course of trade a portion of the tribute. Yet, for all that, the conquered were the really cheated. Their goods were still paid for with their own money. That is not the way to get rich or to create surplus value. Let us therefore keep within the bounds of exchange where sellers are also buyers and buyers sellers. Our difficulty may perhaps have arisen from treating the actors as personifications instead of as individuals. A may be clever enough to get the advantage of B or C without their being able to retaliate. A sells wine worth forty pounds to B, and obtains from him, in exchange, corn to the value of fifty pounds. A has converted his forty pounds into fifty pounds, 
has made more money out of less, and has converted his commodities into capital. Let us examine this a little more closely. Before the exchange we had forty pounds worth of wine in the hands of A, and fifty pounds worth of corn in those of B, a total of ninety pounds. After the exchange we have still the same total value of ninety pounds. The value in circulation has not increased by one iota. It is only distributed differently between A and B. What is a loss of value to B is surplus value to A. What is minus to one is plus to the other. The same change would have taken place if A, without the formality of an exchange, had directly stolen the ten pounds from B. The sum of the values in circulation can clearly not be augmented by any change in their distribution, any more than the quantity of the precious metals in a country by a Jew selling a Queen Anne's farthing for a guinea. The capitalist class as a whole in any country cannot overreach themselves. Footnote. Destut de Tracy, although, or perhaps because, he was a member of the Institute, held the opposite view. He says, Industrial capitalists make profits because they all sell for more than it has cost to produce. And to whom do they sell? In the first instance, to one another. End of footnote. Turn and twist, then, as we may, the fact remains unaltered. If equivalents are exchanged, no surplus value results, and if non-equivalents are exchanged, still no surplus value. Footnote. The exchange of two equal values neither increases nor diminishes the amount of the values available in society, nor does the exchange of two unequal values change anything in the sum of social values, although it adds to the wealth of one person what it removes from the wealth of another. J.B. Say Say, not in the least troubled as to the consequences of this statement, borrows it, almost word for word, from the physiocrats. The following example will show how Monsieur Say turned to account the writings of the physiocrats, in his day quite forgotten, for the purpose of expanding the value of his own. His most celebrated saying, Products can only be bought with products, runs as follows in the original physiocratic work. Products can only be paid for with products. Le trône. End of footnote. Circulation, or the exchange of commodities, begets no value. Footnote. Exchange confers no value at all upon products. F. Wayland, The Elements of Political Economy, Boston, 1843. End of footnote. The reason is now therefore plain why, in analyzing the standard form of capital, the form under which it determines the economic organization of modern society, we entirely left out of consideration its most popular and, so to say, antediluvian forms, merchants' capital and money-lenders' capital. The circuit, money to commodity to money, buying in order to sell dearer, is seen most clearly in genuine merchants' capital. But the movement takes place entirely within the sphere of circulation. Since, however, it is impossible, by circulation alone, to account for the conversion of money into capital, for the formation of surplus value, it would appear that merchants' capital is an impossibility, so long as equivalents are exchanged. That, therefore, it can only have its origin in the twofold advantage gained over both the selling and the buying producers, by the merchant who parasitically shoves himself in between them. Footnote. Under the rule of invariable equivalence, commerce would be impossible. G. Opdyke, A Treatise on Political Economy, New York, 1851. The difference between real value and exchange value is based upon this fact, namely, that the value of a thing is different from the so-called equivalent given for it in trade, that is, 
that this equivalent is no equivalent. Friedrich Engels End of footnote It is in this sense that Franklin says, War is robbery, commerce is generally cheating. Footnote Benjamin Franklin Positions to be examined concerning national wealth. End of footnote. If the transformation of merchants' money into capital is to be explained otherwise than by the producers being simply cheated, a long series of intermediate steps would be necessary, which, at present, when the simple circulation of commodities forms our only assumption, are entirely wanting. What we have said with reference to merchants' capital applies still more to moneylenders' capital. In merchants' capital, the two extremes, the money that is thrown upon the market and the augmented money that is withdrawn from the market, are at least connected by a purchase and a sale, in other words, by the movement of the circulation. In moneylenders' capital, the form money to commodity to money is reduced to the two extremes without a mean. Money to money money exchanged for more money, a form that is incompatible with the nature of money, and therefore remains inexplicable from the standpoint of the circulation of commodities. Hence Aristotle. Since crematistic is a double science, one part belonging to commerce, the other to economic, the latter being necessary and praiseworthy, the former based on circulation and with justice disapproved, for it is not based on nature but on mutual cheating, therefore the usurer is most rightly hated, because money itself is the source of his gain, and is not used for the purposes for which it was invented. For it originated for the exchange of commodities, but interest makes out of money more money. Hence its name, tokos, interest and offspring. For the begotten, are like those who beget them. But interest is money of money, so that of all modes of making a living, this is the most contrary to nature. Aristotle In the course of our investigation, we shall find that both merchants' capital and interest-bearing capital are derivative forms, and at the same time it will become clear why these two forms appear in the course of history before the modern standard form of capital. We have shown that surplus value cannot be created by circulation, and therefore that in its formation something must take place in the background, which is not apparent in the circulation itself. Footnote. Profit, in the usual condition of the market, is not made by exchanging. Had it not existed before, neither could it after that transaction. Ramsey. End of footnote. But can surplus value possibly originate anywhere else than in circulation, which is the sum total of all the mutual relations of commodity owners, as far as they are determined by their commodities? Apart from circulation, the commodity owner is in relation only with his own commodity. So far as regards value, that relation is limited to this, that the commodity contains a quantity of his own labor, that quantity being measured by a definite social standard. This quantity is expressed by the value of the commodity, and since the value is reckoned in money of account, this quantity is also expressed by the price, which we will suppose to be ten pounds. But his labor is not represented both by the value of the commodity and by a surplus over that value, not by a price of ten pounds that is also a price of eleven, not by a value that is greater than itself. The commodity owner can, by his labor, create value, but not self-expanding value. He can increase the value of his commodity by adding fresh labor and therefore more value to the value in hand by making, for instance, leather into boots. The same material has now more value because it contains a greater quantity of labor. The boots have therefore more value than the leather, but the value of the leather remains what it was. It has not expanded itself, has not, during the making of the boots, annexed surplus value. 
It is therefore impossible that outside the sphere of circulation a producer of commodities can, without coming into contact with other commodity owners, expand value and consequently convert money or commodities into capital. It is therefore impossible for capital to be produced by circulation, and it is equally impossible for it to originate apart from circulation. It must have its origin both in circulation and yet not in circulation. We have, therefore, got a double result. The conversion of money into capital has to be explained on the basis of the laws that regulate the exchange of commodities, in such a way that the starting point is the exchange of equivalents. Footnote. From the foregoing investigation, the reader will see that this statement only means that the formation of capital must be possible even though the price and value of a commodity be the same, for its formation cannot be attributed to any deviation of the one from the other. If prices actually differ from values, we must, first of all, reduce the former to the latter. In other words, treat the difference as accidental in order that the phenomena may be observed in their purity and our observations not interfered with by disturbing circumstances that have nothing to do with the process in question. We know, moreover, that this reduction is no mere scientific process. The continual oscillations in prices, their rising and falling, compensate each other and reduce themselves to an average price which is their hidden regulator. It forms the guiding star of the merchant or the manufacturer in every undertaking that requires time. He knows that when a long period of time is taken, commodities are sold neither over nor under but at their average price. If, therefore, he thought about the matter at all, he would formulate the problem of the formation of capital as follows. How can we account for the origin of capital on the supposition that prices are regulated by the average price, that is, ultimately by the value of the commodities? I say ultimately because average prices do not directly coincide with the values of commodities, as Adam Smith, Ricardo and others believe. End of footnote. Our friend Moneybags who as yet is only an embryo capitalist, must buy his commodities at their value, must sell them at their value, and yet at the end of the process must withdraw more value from circulation than he threw into it at starting. His development into a full-grown capitalist must take place both within the sphere of circulation and without it. These are the conditions of the problem. Hic Rodus, Hic Salta. Chapter 6. The Buying and Selling of Labor Power The change of value that occurs in the case of money intended to be converted into capital cannot take place in the money itself, since in its function of means of purchase and of payment, it does no more than realize the price of the commodity it buys or pays for and as hard cash, it is value petrified, never varying. Footnote. In the form of money, capital is productive of no profit. Ricardo. Principles of Political Economy. End of footnote. Just as little can it originate in the second act of circulation, the resale of the commodity, which does no more than transform the article from its bodily form back again into its money form. The change must, therefore, take place in the commodity bought by the first act, money to commodity, but not in its value, for equivalents are exchanged, and the commodity is paid for at its full value. We are, therefore, forced to the conclusion that the change originates in the use value, as such, of the commodity, that is, in its consumption. In order to be able to extract value from the consumption of a commodity, 
Our friend Moneybags must be so lucky as to find within the sphere of circulation, in the market, a commodity whose use value possesses the peculiar property of being a source of value, whose actual consumption, therefore, is itself an embodiment of labour, and consequently a creation of value. The possessor of money does find on the market such a special commodity in capacity for labour, or labour power. By labour power, or capacity for labour, is to be understood the aggregate of those mental and physical capabilities existing in a human being, which he exercises whenever he produces a use value of any description. But in order that our owner of money may be able to find labour power offered for sale as a commodity, various conditions must first be fulfilled. The exchange of commodities of itself implies no other relations of dependence than those which result from its own nature. On this assumption, labour power can appear upon the market as a commodity, only if, and so far as its possessor, the individual whose labour power it is, offers it for sale, or sells it as a commodity. In order that he may be able to do this, he must have it at his disposal, must be the untrammeled owner of his capacity for labour, that is, of his person. Footnote. In encyclopedias of classical antiquities we find nonsense such as this, that in the ancient world capital was fully developed. Quote, except that the free labourer and a system of credit was wanting. Unquote. Momsen also, in his History of Rome, commits in this respect one blunder after another. End of footnote. He and the owner of money meet in the market, and deal with each other as on the basis of equal rights, with this difference alone, that one is the buyer, the other seller both, therefore, equal in the eyes of the law. The continuance of this relation demands that the owner of the labour power should sell it only for a definite period, for if he were to sell it rump and stump once for all, he would be selling himself, converting himself from a free man into a slave, from an owner of a commodity into a commodity. He must constantly look upon his labour power as his own property, his own commodity, and this he can only do by placing it at the disposal of the buyer temporarily, for a definite period of time. By this means alone can he avoid renouncing his rights of ownership over it. Footnote. Hence, legislation in various countries fixes a maximum for labour contracts. Wherever free labour is the rule, the laws regulate the mode of terminating this contract. In some states, particularly in the Danubian provinces till the revolution effected by Cusa, slavery is hidden under the form of peonage. His family become de facto the property of other persons and their families. Juarez abolished peonage. The so-called Emperor Maximilian re-established it by a decree which, in the House of Representatives at Washington, was aptly denounced as a decree for the reintroduction of slavery into Mexico. I may make over to another the use for a limited time of my particular bodily and mental aptitudes and capabilities, because in consequence of this restriction they are impressed with a character of alienation with regard to me as a whole, but by the alienation of all my labour time and the whole of my work, I should be converting the substance itself, in other words, my general activity and reality, my person, into the property of another. Hegel, Philosophie des Rechts, Berlin, 1840, end of footnote. The second essential condition to the owner of money finding labour power in the market as a commodity is this, that the labourer, instead of being in the position to sell commodities in which his labour is incorporated, must be obliged to offer for sale as a commodity that very labour power which exists only in his living self. 
in order that a man may be able to sell commodities other than labor power, he must, of course, have the means of production as raw material, implements, etc. No boots can be made without leather. He requires also the means of subsistence. Nobody, not even a musician of the future, can live upon future products or upon use values in an unfinished state. And ever since the first moment of his appearance on the world stage, man has always been and must still be a consumer both before and while he is producing. In a society where all products assume the form of commodities, these commodities must be sold after they have been produced. It is only after their sale that they can serve in satisfying the requirements of their producer. The time necessary for their sale is superadded to that necessary for their production. For the conversion of his money into capital, therefore, the owner of money must meet in the market with the free labourer, free in the double sense, that as a free man he can dispose of his labour power as his own commodity, and that on the other hand he has no other commodity for sale, is short of everything necessary for the realisation of his labour power. The question why this free labourer confronts him in the market has no interest for the owner of money, who regards the labour market as a branch of the general market for commodities. And for the present, it interests us just as little. We cling to the fact theoretically as he does practically. One thing, however, is clear. Nature does not produce on the one side owners of money or commodities and on the other men possessing nothing but their own labour power. This relation has no natural basis, neither is its social basis one that is common to all historical periods. It is clearly the result of a past historical development, the product of many economic revolutions, of the extinction of a whole series of older forms of social. Definite historical conditions are necessary that a product may become a commodity. It must not be produced as the immediate means of subsistence of the producer himself. Had we gone further, and inquired under what circumstances all or even the majority of products take the form of commodities, we should have found that this can only happen with production of a very specific kind, capitalist production. Such an inquiry, however, would have been foreign to the analysis of commodities. Production and circulation of commodities can take place, although the great mass of the objects produced are intended for the immediate requirements of their producers, are not turned into commodities, and consequently social production is not yet by a long way dominated in its length and breadth by exchange value. The appearance of products as commodities presupposes such a development of the social division of labour that the separation of use value from exchange value, a separation which first begins with barter, must already have been completed. But such a degree of development is common to many forms of society, which in other respects present the most varying historical features. On the one hand, if we consider money— its existence implies a definite stage in the exchange of commodities. The particular functions of money which it performs, either as the mere equivalent of commodities or as a means of circulation or means of payment, as hoard or as universal money, point, according to the extent and relative preponderance of the one function or the other, to very different stages in the process of social production. Yet we know by experience that a circulation of commodities relatively primitive suffices for the production of all these forms, otherwise with capital. The historical conditions of its existence are by no means given with the mere circulation of money and commodities. It can spring into life only when the owner of the means of production and subsistence meets in the market with the free labourer selling his labour power and this one historical condition comprises a world's history. Capital, therefore, announces from its first appearance a new epoch in the process of social production. 
Footnote. The capitalist epoch is therefore characterized by this, that labor power takes, in the eyes of the laborer himself, the form of a commodity which is his property. His labor, consequently, becomes wage labor. On the other hand, it is only from this moment that the produce of labor universally becomes a commodity. End of footnote. We must now examine more closely this peculiar commodity, labor power. Like all others, it has a value. Footnote. The value or worth of a man is, as of all other things, his price. That is to say, so much as would be given for the use of his power. Thomas Hobbes, Leviathan, in Works, 1839-44. How is that value determined? The value of labor power is determined, as in the case of every other commodity, by the labor time necessary for the production, and consequently also the reproduction of this special article. So far as it has value, it represents no more than a definite quantity of the average labor of society incorporated in it. Labor power exists only as the capacity, or power, of the living individual. Its production, consequently, presupposes his existence. Given the individual, the production of labor power consists in his reproduction of himself or his maintenance. For his maintenance, he requires a given quantity of the means of subsistence. Therefore, the labor time requisite for the production of labor power, reduces itself to that necessary for the production of those means of subsistence. In other words, the value of labor power is the value of the means of subsistence necessary for the maintenance of the laborer. Labor power, however, becomes a reality only by its exercise. It sets itself in action only by working but thereby a definite quantity of human muscle, nerve, brain, etc., is wasted, and these require to be restored. This increased expenditure demands a larger income. Footnote. Hence the Roman Villicus, as overlooker of the agricultural slaves, received, quote, more meagre fare than working slaves, because his work was lighter, unquote. Theodor Mommsen, Römische Geschichte, 1856. End of footnote. If the owner of labor power works today, tomorrow he must again be able to repeat the same process in the same conditions as regards health and strength. His means of subsistence must therefore be sufficient to maintain him in his normal state as a laboring individual. His natural wants such as food, clothing, fuel, and housing, vary according to the climatic and other physical conditions of his country. On the other hand, the number and extent of his so-called necessary wants, as also the modes of satisfying them, are themselves the product of historical development, and depend therefore to a great extent on the degree of civilization of a country, more particularly on the conditions under which and consequently on the habits and degree of comfort in which the class of free laborers has been formed. Footnote. Compare William Thomas Thornton. Overpopulation and its remedy. London, 1846. End of footnote. In contradistinction, therefore, to the case of other commodities, there enters into the determination of the value of labor power a historical and moral element. Nevertheless, in a given country, at a given period, the average quantity of the means of subsistence necessary for the laborer is practically known. The owner of labor power is mortal. If, then, his appearance in the market is to be continuous, and the continuous conversion of money into capital assumes this, the seller of labor power must perpetuate himself in the way that every living individual perpetuates himself by procreation. William Petty
the labour power withdrawn from the market by wear and tear and death, must be continually replaced by, at the very least, an equal amount of fresh labour power. Hence, the sum of the means of subsistence necessary for the production of labour power must include the means necessary for the labourer's substitutes, that is, his children, in order that this race of peculiar commodity owners may perpetuate its appearance in the market. Footnote. Labour's natural price consists in such a quantity of necessaries and comforts of life as, from the nature of the climate and the habits of the country, are necessary to support the labourer and to enable him to rear such a family as may preserve in the market an undiminished supply of labour. End of footnote. In order to modify the human organism so that it may acquire skill and handiness in a given branch of industry, and become labour power of a special kind, a special education or training is requisite, and this, on its part, costs an equivalent in commodities of a greater or less amount. This amount varies according to the more or less complicated character of the labour power. The expenses of this education, excessively small in the case of ordinary labour power, enter pro tanto into the total value spent in its production. The value of labour power resolves itself into the value of a definite quantity of the means of subsistence. It therefore varies with the value of these means or with the quantity of labour requisite for their production. Some of the means of subsistence, such as food and fuel, are consumed daily, and a fresh supply must be provided daily. Others, such as clothes and furniture, last for longer periods and require to be replaced only at longer intervals. One article must be bought or paid for daily, another weekly, another quarterly, and so on. But in whatever way the sum total of these outlays may be spread over the year, they must be covered by the average income, taking one day with another. If the total of the commodities required daily for the production of labour power equals A, and those required weekly equals B, and those required quarterly equals C, and so on, the daily average of these commodities equals 365A plus 52B plus 4C plus etc. over 365. Suppose that in this mass of commodities requisite for the average day there are embodied six hours of social labour, then there is incorporated daily in labour power half a day's average social labour. In other words, half a day's labour is requisite for the daily production of labour power. This quantity of labour forms the value of a day's labour power or the value of the labour power daily reproduced. If half a day's average social labour is incorporated in three shillings, then three shillings is the price corresponding to the value of a day's labour power. If its owner therefore offers it for sale at three shillings a day, its selling price is equal to its value, and according to our supposition, our friend Moneybags, who is intent upon converting his three shillings into capital, pays this value. The minimum limit of the value of labour power is determined by the value of the commodities without the daily supply of which the labourer cannot renew his vital energy, consequently by the value of those means of subsistence that are physically indispensable. If the price of labour power falls to this minimum, it falls below its value, since under such circumstances it can be maintained and developed only in a crippled state. But the value of every commodity is determined by the labour time requisite to turn it out, so as to be of normal quality. It is a very cheap sort of sentimentality which declares this method of determining the value of labour power, a method prescribed by the very nature of the case, to be a brutal method, and which wails with Rossi that, to comprehend capacity for labour, puissance de travail, 
at the same time that we make abstraction from the means of subsistence of the laborers during the process of production, is to comprehend a phantom. When we speak of labor or capacity for labor, we speak at the same time of the laborer and his means of subsistence, of laborer and wages. Footnote Rossi, Cour d'économie politique, Brussels, 1842. End of footnote. When we speak of capacity for labor, we do not speak of labor any more than when we speak of capacity for digestion, we speak of digestion. The latter process requires something more than a good stomach. When we speak of capacity for labor, we do not abstract from the necessary means of subsistence. On the contrary, their value is expressed in its value. If his capacity for labor remains unsold, the laborer derives no benefit from it, but rather he will feel it to be a cruel nature-imposed necessity that this capacity has cost for its production a definite amount of the means of subsistence, and that it will continue to do so for its reproduction. He will then agree with Sismondi that capacity for labor is nothing unless it is sold. Footnote, Sismondi Nouveau principe d'économie politique. End of footnote. One consequence of the peculiar nature of labor power as a commodity is that its use value does not, on the conclusion of the contract between the buyer and seller, immediately pass into the hands of the former. Its value, like that of every other commodity, is already fixed before it goes into circulation, since a definite quantity of social labor has been spent upon it but its use-value consists in the subsequent exercise of its force. The alienation of labor-power and its actual appropriation by the buyer, its employment as a use-value, are separated by an interval of time. But in those cases in which the formal alienation by sale of the use-value of a commodity is not simultaneous with its actual delivery to the buyer, the money of the latter usually functions as a means of payment. Footnote. All labor is paid after it has ceased. An inquiry into those principles respecting the nature of demand, etc. The system of commercial credit had to start at the moment when the laborer, the prime creator of products, could, thanks to his savings, wait for his wages until the end of the week. Charles Gagny des systèmes d'économie politique. End of footnote. In every country in which the capitalist mode of production reigns, it is the custom not to pay for labor power before it has been exercised for the period fixed by the contract, as, for example, the end of each week. In all cases, therefore, the use value of the labor power is advanced to the capitalist. The laborer allows the buyer to consume it before he receives payment of the price. He everywhere gives credit to the capitalist. That this credit is no mere fiction is shown not only by the occasional loss of wages on the bankruptcy of the capitalist. Footnote. The laborer lends his industry, but, adds Storch slyly, he risks nothing except the loss of his wages. The laborer does not hand over anything of a material nature. Storch. Cour d'économie politique. End of footnote. But also by a series of more enduring consequences. Footnote. One example. In London there are two sorts of bakers, the full-priced, who sell bread at its full value, and the undersellers, who sell it under its value. The latter class comprises more than three-fourths of the total number of bakers. Report of H. S. Tremen here, Commissioner to examine into the grievances complained of by the journeyman bakers, etc., London, 1862. The undersellers, almost without exception, sell bread adulterated with alum, soap, pearl ashes, chalk, Derbyshire stone dust, and such like agreeable, nourishing, and wholesome ingredients. See the above 
cited Blue Book, as also the report of the Committee of 1855 on the Adulteration of Bread, and Dr. Hassel's Adulterations Detected, 1861. Sir John Gordon stated before the Committee of 1855 that, in consequence of these adulterations, the poor man, who lives on two pounds of bread a day, does not now get one fourth part of nourishing matter, let alone the deleterious effects on his health. Tremon here states, as the reason why a very large part of the working class, although well aware of this adulteration, nevertheless accept the alum, stone dust, etc., as part of their purchase, that it is for them a matter of necessity to take from their baker or from the chandler's shop such bread as they choose to supply. As they are not paid their wages before the end of the week, they in turn are unable to pay for the bread consumed by their families during the week before the end of the week. And Tremon here adds on the evidence of witnesses, It is notorious that bread composed of those mixtures is made expressly for sale in this manner. In many English and still more Scotch agricultural districts, wages are paid fortnightly and even monthly. With such long intervals between the payments, the agricultural labourer is obliged to buy on credit. He must pay higher prices, and is in fact tied to the shop which gives him credit. Thus at Horningham in Wilts, for example, where the wages are monthly, the same flour that he could buy elsewhere at one and tenpence per stone cost him two and fourpence per stone. Sixth reporters of Paisley and Kilmarnock enforced by a strike fortnightly instead of monthly payment of wages. Unquote. Reports of the inspectors of factories for 31st of October 1853. As a further pretty result of the credit given by the workmen to the capitalist, we may refer to the method current in many English coal mines, where the labourer is not paid till the end of the month, and in the meantime receives sums on account from the capitalist, often in goods for which the miner is obliged to pay more than the market price. Truck system. It is a common practice with the coal masters to pay once a month, and advance cash to their workmen at the end of each intermediate week. The cash is given in the shop, that is, the tommy shop which belongs to the master. The men take it on one side and lay it out on the other. Children's Employment Commission, 1864. Nevertheless, whether money serves as a means of purchase or as a means of although it is not realized till later, like the rent of a house. The labor power is sold, although it is only paid for at a later period. It will, therefore, be useful for a clear comprehension of the relation of the parties to assume provisionally that the possessor of labor power on the occasion of each sale immediately receives the price stipulated to be paid for it. We now know how the value paid by the purchaser to the possessor of this peculiar commodity, labor power, is determined. The use value which the former gets in exchange manifests itself only in the actual utilization, in the consumption of the labor power. The money owner buys everything necessary for this purpose, such as raw material in the market, and pays for it at its full value. The consumption of labor power is at one and the same time the production of commodities and of surplus value. The consumption of labor power is completed, as in the case of every other commodity, outside the limits of the market or of the sphere of circulation. Accompanied by Mr. Moneybags and by the possessor of labor power, we therefore take leave for a time of this noisy sphere where everything takes place on the surface and in view of all men, and follow them both into the hidden abode of production, on whose threshold there stares us in the face. No admittance except on business. Here we shall see 
not only how capital produces, but how capital is produced. We shall at last force the secret of profit-making. This sphere that we are deserting, within whose boundaries the sale and purchase of labour-power goes on, is in fact a very Eden of the innate rights of man. There alone rule freedom, equality, property, and Bentham. Freedom, because both buyer and seller of a commodity, say of labour-power, are constrained only by their own free will. They contract as free agents, and the agreement they come to is but the form in which they give legal expression to their common will. Equality, because each enters into relation with the other, as with a simple owner of commodities, and they exchange equivalent for equivalent. Property, because each disposes only of what is his own. And Bentham, because each looks only to himself, the only force that brings them together and puts them in relation with each other is the selfishness, the gain, and the private interests of each. Each looks to himself only, and no one troubles himself about the rest. And just because they do so, do they all, in accordance with the pre-established harmony of things, or under the auspices of an all-shrewd providence, work together to their mutual advantage, for the common weal, and in the interest of all. On leaving this sphere of simple circulation, or of exchange of commodities, which furnishes the free trader vulgaris with his views and ideas, and with the standard by which he judges a society based on capital and wages, we think we can perceive a change in the physiognomy of our dramatis personae. He, who before was the money owner, now strides in front as cap irking, intent on business. The other, timid and holding back, like one who is bringing his own hide to market, and has nothing to expect but a hiding. The Production of Absolute Surplus Value Chapter 7 The Labour Process and the Process of Producing Surplus Value Section 1 The Labour Process or the Production of Use Values the capitalist buys labour power in order to use it, and labour power in use is labour itself. The purchaser of labour power consumes it by setting the seller of it to work. By working, the latter becomes actually what before he only was potentially, labour power in action, a labourer. In order that his labour may reappear in a commodity, he must, before all things, expend it on something useful, on something capable of satisfying a want of some sort. Hence, what the capitalist sets the labourer to produce is a particular use-value, a specified article. The fact that the production of use-values, or goods, is carried on under the control of a capitalist and on his behalf does not alter the general character of that production. We shall, therefore, in the first place, have to consider the labour process independently of the particular form it assumes under given social conditions. Labour is, in the first place, a process in which both man and nature participate, and in which man, of his own accord, starts, regulates, and controls the material reactions between himself and nature. He opposes himself to nature as one of her own forces, setting in motion arms and legs, head and hands, the natural forces of his body, in order to appropriate nature's productions in a form adapted to his own wants. By thus acting on the external world and changing it, he at the same time changes his own nature. He develops his slumbering powers and compels them to act in obedience to his sway. We are not now dealing with those primitive instinctive forms of labour that remind us of the mere animal. An immeasurable interval of time separates the state of things 
in which a man brings his labor power to market for sale as a commodity from that state in which human labor was still in its first instinctive stage. We presuppose labor in a form that stamps it as exclusively human. A spider conducts operations that resemble those of a weaver, and a bee puts to shame many an architect in the construction of her cells. But what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of bees is this, that the architect raises his structure in imagination before he erects it in reality. At the end of every labor process, we get a result that already existed in the imagination of the laborer at its commencement. He not only effects a change of form in the material on which he works, but he also realizes a purpose of his own that gives the law to his modus operandi, and to which he must subordinate his will. And this subordination is no mere momentary act. Besides the exertion of the bodily organs, the process demands that, during the whole operation, the workman's will be steadily in consonance with his purpose. This means close attention. The less he is attracted by the nature of the work and the mode in which it is carried on, and the less, therefore, he enjoys it as something which gives play to his bodily and mental powers, the more close his attention is forced to be. The elementary factors of the labor process are, one, the personal activity of man, that is, work itself, two, the subject of that work, and three, its instruments. The soil, and this, economically speaking, includes water, in the virgin state in which it supplies man with the necessaries or the means of subsistence, ready to hand, exists independently of him, and is the universal subject of human labor. Footnote. The earth's spontaneous productions being in small quantity and quite independent of man appear, as it were, to be furnished by nature in the same way as a small sum is given to a young man in order to put him in a way of industry and of making his fortune. James Stewart. Principles of Political Economy, Dublin, 1770. End of footnote. All those things which labor merely separates from immediate connection with their environment element. Water, timber which we fell in the virgin forest, and ores which we extract from their veins. If, on the other hand, the subject of labor has, so to say, been filtered through previous labor, we call it raw material. Such is ore already extracted and ready for washing. All raw material is the subject of labor, but not every subject of labor is raw material. It can only become so after it has undergone some alteration by means of labor. An instrument of labor is a thing, or a complex of things, which the laborer interposes between himself and the subject of his labor, and which serves as the conductor of his activity. He makes use of the mechanical, physical, and chemical properties of some substances in order to make other substances subservient to his aims. Footnote. Reason is just as cunning as she is powerful. Her cunning consists principally in her mediating activity, which by carries out reason's intentions. Hegel, Berlin, 1840. End of footnote. Leaving out of consideration such ready-made means of subsistence as fruits, in gathering which a man's own limbs serve as the instruments of his labor, the first thing of which the laborer possesses himself is not the subject of labor, but its instrument. Thus, Nature becomes one of the organs of his activity, one that he annexes to his own bodily organs, adding stature to himself in spite of the Bible. As the earth is his original larder, so too it is his original toolhouse. It supplies him, for instance, with stones for throwing, grinding, pressing, cutting, etc. The earth itself is an instrument of labor, 
but when used as such in agriculture implies a whole series of other instruments and a comparatively high development of labour. Footnote. In his otherwise miserable work, Théorie de l'économie politique, Paris, 1815, necessary before agriculture, properly so called, can commence. End of footnote. No sooner does labour undergo the least development than it requires specially prepared instruments. Thus, in the oldest caves we find stone implements and weapons. In the earliest period of human history, domesticated animals, that is, animals which have been bred for the purpose and have undergone modifications by means of labour, play the chief part as instruments of labour along with specially prepared stones, wood, bones, and shells. Footnote. Turgot, in his Réflexion sur la formation et la distribution des richesses, 1766, brings well into prominence the importance of domesticated animals to early civilization. End of footnote. The use and fabrication of instruments of labor, although existing in the germ among certain species of animals, is specifically characteristic of the human labor process, and Franklin therefore defines man as a tool making animal. Relics of bygone instruments of labor possess the same importance for the investigation of extinct economic forms of society as do fossil bones for the determination of extinct species of animals. It is not the articles made, but how they are made and by what instruments that enables us to distinguish different economic epochs. Footnote. The least important commodities of all for the technological comparison of different epochs of production are articles of luxury, in the strict meaning of the term. However little our written histories up to this time notice the development of material production, which is the basis of all social life and therefore of all history, yet prehistoric times have been classified in accordance with the results not of so-called historical, but of materialistic investigations. These periods have been divided to correspond with the materials from which their implements and weapons were made, viz. into the stone, the bronze, and the iron ages. End of footnote. Instruments of labor not only supply a standard of the degree of development to which human labor has attained, but they are also indicators of the social conditions under which that labor is carried on. Among the instruments of labor, those of a mechanical nature which, taken as a whole, we may call the bone and muscles of production, offer much more decided characteristics of a given epoch of production than those which, like pipes, tubs, baskets, jars, etc., serve only to hold the materials for labor, which latter class we may in a general way call the vascular system of production. The latter first begins to play an important part in the chemical industries. In a wider sense, we may include among the instruments of labor, in addition to those things that are used for directly transferring labor to its subject and which therefore in one way or another serve as conductors of activity, all such objects as are necessary for carrying on the labor process. These do not enter directly into the process, but without them it is either impossible for it to take place at all, or possible only to a partial extent. Once more we find the earth to be a universal instrument of this sort, for it furnishes a locus standi to the laborer and a field of employment for his activity, roads, and so forth. In the labor process, therefore, man's activity with the help of the instruments of labor is in the product. The latter is a use value. Nature's material adapted by a change of form to the wants of man. Labor has incorporated itself with its subject. The former is materialized, the latter transformed. 
that which in the labourer appeared as movement now appears in the product as a fixed quality without motion. The blacksmith forges, and the product is a forging. If we examine the whole process from the point of view of its result, the is productive labour. Footnote. This method of determining, from the standpoint of the labour process alone, what is productive, Though a use value in the form of a product issues from the labour process, yet other use values, products of previous labour, enter into it as means of production. The same use value is both the product of a previous process and conditions of labour. With the exception of the extractive industries in which the material for labour is provided immediately by means of industry manipulate raw material. Objects already filtered through labour, already products of labour. Such is seed in agriculture. Animals and plants, which we are accustomed to consider as products of nature, are, in their present form, not only products of, say, last year's labour, but the result of a gradual transformation, continued through many generations under man's superintendence and by means of his labour. But in the great majority of cases, instruments of labour show even to the most superficial observer traces of the labour of past ages. Raw material may either form the principal substance of a product, or it may enter into its formation only as necessary. An accessory may be consumed mixed with the raw material in order to produce some modification thereof, as chlorine into unbleached linen coal with iron, dye stuff with wool, or again, it may help to carry on the work itself, as in the case of the materials used for heating and lighting workshops. The distinction between principal substance and accessory vanishes in the true chemical industries, because there none of the raw material reappears in its original composition in the substance of the product. Footnote. Storch calls true raw materials matière, and accessory material matériau. Chaboulier describes accessories as matière instrumentale. End of footnote. Every object possesses various properties, and is thus capable of being applied to different uses. One and the same product may therefore serve as raw material in very different processes. Corn, for example, is a raw material for millers, starch manufacturers, distillers, and cattle breeders. It also enters as raw material into its own production, in the shape of seed. Coal, too, is at the same time the product of, and a means of production in, coal mining. Again, a particular product may be used in one and the same process both as an instrument of labour and as a raw material. Take, for instance, the fattening of cattle, where the animal is the raw material and at the same time an instrument for the production of manure. A product, though ready for immediate consumption, may yet serve as raw material for a further product, as grapes when they become the raw material for wine. On the other hand, labour may give us its product in such a form that we can use it only as a raw material, as is the case with cotton, thread and yarn. Such a raw material, though itself a product, may have to go through a whole series of different processes. In each of these in turn it serves, with constantly varying form, as raw material until the last process of the series leaves it a perfect product, ready for individual consumption, or for use as an instrument of labour. Hence we see that whether a use value is to be regarded as raw material, as instrument of labour, or as product, this is determined entirely by its function in the labour process, by the position it there occupies. As this varies, so does its character.
Whenever, therefore, a product enters as a means of production into a new labour process, it thereby loses its character of product and becomes a mere factor in the process. A spinner treats spindles only as implements for spinning, and flax only as the material that he spins. Of course, it is impossible to spin without material and spindles, and of the fact that they are products of previous labour is a matter of utter indifference, just as in the digestive process it is, on the contrary, it is generally by their imperfections as products that the means of production in any process assert themselves in their character of products. A blunt knife or weak thread forcibly remind us of Mr. A the cutler or Mr. B the spinner, in the finished product, the labour, by means of which it has acquired its useful qualities, is not palpable, has apparently vanished. A machine which does not serve the purposes of labour is useless. In addition, it falls a prey to the destructive influence of natural forces. Iron rusts, and wood rot things, and rouse them from their death sleep, change them from mere possible use values into real and effective ones. Based in the process, they are in truth consumed, but consumed with a purpose, as elementary constituents of new use values, of new products, ever ready as means of subsistence for individual consumption, or as means of production for some new labour process. If, then, on the one hand, Finished products are not only results, but also necessary conditions of the labour process. On the other hand, their assumption into that process, their contact with living labour, is the sole means by which they can be made to retain their character of use values and be utilised. Labour uses up its material factors, its subject and its instruments, consumes them, and is therefore a process of consumption. Such productive consumption is distinguished from individual consumption by this, that the latter uses up products as means of subsistence for the living individual, the former as means of individual consumption is the consumer himself. The result of productive consumption is a product distinct from the consumer. In so far, then, as its instruments and subjects are themselves products, Labour consumes products in order to create products, or in other words, consumes one set of products by turning them into means of production for another set. But just as in the beginning the only participators in the labour process were man and earth, which latter exists independently of man, so even now we still employ in the process many means of production provided directly by nature that do not represent any combination of natural substances with human labour. The labour process, resolved as above into its simple elementary factors, is human action with a view to the production of use values, appropriation of natural substances to human requirements. It is the necessary condition for effecting exchange of matter between man and nature. It is the everlasting, nature-imposed, condition of human existence, and therefore is independent of every social phase of that existence, or rather is common to every such phase. It was therefore not necessary to represent our labourer in connection with other labourers. Man and his labour on one side, nature and its materials on the other, sufficed. As the taste of porridge does not tell you who grew the oats, no more does this simple process tell you of itself what are the social conditions under which it is taking place, whether under the, or a savage in killing wild animals with stones. Footnote. By a wonderful feat of logical acumen, Colonel Torrens has discovered in this stone of the savage the origin of capital. Quote. In the first stone which the savage flings at the wild animal he pursues, in the first stick that he seizes to strike down the fruit which hangs above his reach, we see the appropriation of one article 
for the purpose of aiding in the acquisition of another, and thus discover the origin of capital. Unquote. R. Torrens, an essay on the production of wealth, etc. End of footnote. Let us now return to our would be capitalist. We left him just after he had purchased, in the open market, all the necessary factors of the labor process, its objective factors, the means of production, as well as its subjective factor, labor power. With the keen eye of an expert, he has selected the means of production and the kind of labor power best adapted to his particular trade, be it spinning, boot-making, or any other kind. He then proceeds to consume the commodity, the labor power that he has just bought, by causing the laborer, the impersonation of that labor power, to consume the means of production by his labor. The general character of the labor process is evidently not changed by the fact that the laborer works for the capitalist instead of for himself. Moreover, the particular methods and operations employed in bootmaking or spinning are not immediately changed by the intervention of the capitalist. He must begin by taking the labor power as he finds it in the market and consequently be satisfied with labor of such a kind as would be found in the period immediately preceding the rise of capitalists. Changes in the methods of production by the subordination of labor to capital can take place only at a later period, and therefore will have to be treated of in a later chapter. The labor process, turned into the process by which the capitalist consumes labor power, exhibits two characteristic phenomena. First, the laborer works under the control of the capitalist to whom his labor belongs, the capitalist taking good care that the work is done in a proper manner and that the means of production are used with intelligence, so that there is no unnecessary waste of raw material and no wear and tear of the implements beyond what is necessarily caused by the work. Secondly, the product is the property of the capitalist and not that of the laborer, its immediate producer. Suppose that a capitalist pays for a day's labor power at its value, then the right to use that power for a day belongs to him, just as much as the right to use any other commodity, such as a horse that he has hired for the day. To the purchaser of a commodity belongs its use and the seller of labor power by giving his labor does no more in reality than part with the use value that he has sold. From the instant he steps into the workshop, the use value of his labor power and therefore also its use, which is labor, belongs to the capitalist. By the purchase of labor power, the capitalist incorporates labor as a living ferment, with the lifeless constituents of the product. From his point of view, the labor process is nothing more than the consumption of the commodity purchased, that is, of labor power. But this consumption cannot be effected except by supplying the labor power with the means of production. The labor process is a process between things that the capitalist has purchased, things that have become his property. The product of this process belongs, therefore, to him, just as much as does the wine which is the product of a process of fermentation completed in his cellar. Footnote. Products are appropriated before they are converted into capital. This conversion does not secure them from such appropriation. Cheboulier, Richesse ou Pauvreté, 1841 the proletarian, by selling his labor for a definite quantity of the necessaries of life, renounces all claim to a share in the product. The mode of appropriation of the products remains the same as before. It is in no way altered by the bargain we have mentioned. The product belongs exclusively to the capitalist, who supplied the raw material and the necessaries of life, and this is a rigorous consequence of the law of appropriation a law whose fundamental principle 
was the very opposite, namely, that every labourer has an exclusive right to the ownership of what he produces. When labourers receive wages for their labour, the capitalist is then the owner not of the capital only, he means the means of production, but of the labour also. If what is paid as wages is included, as it commonly is, in the term capital, capital, both. James Mill, Elements of Political Economy, 1821 The product appropriated by the capitalist is a use value, as yarn, for example, or boots. But although boots are, in one sense, the basis of all social progress, and our capitalist is a decided progressist, yet he does not manufacture boots for their own sake. Use value is by no means the thing qu'on aime pour lui-même in the production of commodities. Use values are only produced by capitalists because, and in so far as, they are the material substratum, the depositories of exchange value. Our capitalist has two objects in view. In the first place, he wants to produce a use value that has a value in exchange, that is to say, an article destined to be sold, a commodity. And secondly, he desires to produce a commodity whose value shall be greater than the sum of the values of the commodities used in its production, that is, of the means of production and the labour power that he purchased with his good money in the open market. His aim is to produce not only a use value, but a commodity also. Not only use value, but value. Not only value, but at the same time, surplus value. It must be borne in mind that we are now dealing with the production of commodities, and that up to this point we have only considered one aspect be a labour process, and at the same time, a process of creating value. Footnote. As has been stated in a previous note, the English language has two different expressions for these two different aspects of labour. In the simple labour process, the process of producing use values, it is work. In the process of creating value, it is labour, taking the term in its strictly economic sense. Friedrich Engels. End of footnote. Let us now examine production as a creation of value. We know that the value of each commodity is determined by the quantity of labour expended on and materialised in it, by the working time necessary to our capitalist as the result of the labour process carried on for him. Assuming this product to be ten pounds of yarn, our first step is to calculate the quantity of labour realised in it. For spinning the yarn, raw material is required. Suppose in this case, ten pounds of cotton. We have no need at present to investigate the value of this cotton, for our capitalist has, we will assume, bought it at its full value, say of ten shillings. In this price, the labour required wear and tear of the spindle, which, for our present purpose, may represent all other instruments of labour employed, amounts to the value of two shillings. If, then, twenty-four hours' labour or two working days are required to produce the quantity of gold represented by twelve shillings, we have here, to begin with, two days' labour already incorporated in the yarn. We must not let ourselves be misled by the circumstance that the cotton has taken a new shape while the substance of the spindle has to a certain extent been used up. By the general law of value, if the value of forty pounds of yarn equals the value of forty pounds of cotton plus the value of a whole spindle, that is, if the same working time is required to produce the commodities on either side of this equation, then ten pounds of yarn are an equivalent for ten pounds of cotton, together with one-fourth of a spindle. In the case we are considering, the same working time is materialised in the ten pounds of yarn on the one hand, and in the ten pounds of cotton and the fraction of a spindle on the other. 
Therefore, where the value appears in cotton, in a spindle, or in yarn, makes no difference in the amount of that value. The spindle and cotton, instead of resting quietly side by side, join together in the process, their forms are altered, and they are turned into yarn. But their value is no more affected by this fact than it would be if they had been simply exchanged for their equivalent in yarn. The labour required for the production of the cotton, the raw material of the yarn, is part of the labour necessary to produce the yarn, and is therefore contained in the yarn. The same applies to the labour embodied in the spindle, without whose wear and tear the cotton could not be spun. Hence, in determining the value of the yarn, or the labour time required for its production, all the special processes carried on at various times and in different places, which were necessary first to produce the cotton and the wasted portion of the spindle, and then with the cotton and spindle to spin the yarn, may together be looked on as different and successive phases of one and the same process. The whole of the labour in the yarn is past labour, and it is a matter of no importance that the operations necessary for the production of its constituent elements were carried on at times which, referred to the present, are more remote than the final operation of spinning. If a definite quantity of labour, say thirty days, is requisite to build a house, the total amount of labour incorporated in it is not altered by the fact that the work of the last day is done twenty-nine days later than that of the first. Therefore, the labour contained in the raw material and the instruments of labour can be treated just as if it were labour expended in an earlier stage of the spinning process, before the labour of actual spinning commenced. The values of the means of production, that is, the cotton and the spindle, which values are expressed in the price of twelve shillings, are therefore constituent parts of the value of the yarn. First, the cotton and spindle must concur in the production of a use value. They must, in the present case, become yarn. Value is independent of the particular use value by which it is borne, but it must be embodied in a use value of some kind. Secondly, the time occupied in the labour of production must not exceed the time really necessary under the given social conditions of the case. Therefore, if no more than one pound of cotton be requisite to spin one pound of yarn, care must be taken that no more than this weight of cotton is consumed in the production of one pound of yarn, and similarly with regard to the spindle. Though the capitalist have a hobby and use a gold instead of a steel spindle, yet the only labour that counts for anything in the value of the yarn is that which would be required to produce a steel spindle. The value of the yarn is owing to the cotton and the spindle. It amounts to twelve shillings, or the value of two days' work, the labour of the spinner. We have now to consider this labour under a very different aspect from that which it had during the labour process. There, we viewed it solely as that particular kind of human activity which changes cotton into yarn. There, the more the labour was suited to the work, the better the yarn, other circumstances remaining the same. The labour of the sp spinning, different, on the other hand, in the special character of its operations in the special nature of its means of production, and in the special use-value of its product. For the operation of spinning, cotton and spindles are a necessity, but for making rifled cannon they would be of no use whatever. Here, on the contrary, where we consider the labour of the spinner only so far as it is value-creating, that is, a source of value, his labour differs in no respect from the labour of the man who bores cannon, or, what here more nearly concerns us, from the labour of the cotton planter and spindle-maker incorporated in the means of production.
It is solely by reason of this identity that cotton planting, spindle making, and spinning are capable of forming the component parts, differing only quantitatively from each other, of one whole, namely the value of the yarn. Here we have nothing more to do with the quality, the nature, and the specific character of the labor, but merely with its quantity. And this simply requires to be calculated. We proceed upon the assumption that spinning is simple, unskilled labor, the average labor of a given state of society. Hereafter, we shall see that the contrary assumption would make no difference. When the laborer is at work, his labor constantly undergoes a transformation. From being motion, it becomes an object without motion. From being the laborer working, it becomes the thing produced. At the end of one hour's spinning, that act is represented by a definite quantity of yarn. In other words, a definite quantity of labor, namely that of one hour, has become embodied in the cotton. We say labor, that is the expenditure of his vital force by the spinner, and not spinning labor, because the special work of spinning counts here only so far as it is the expenditure of labor power in general, and not in so far as it is the specific work of the spinner. In the process we are now considering, it is of extreme importance that no more time be consumed in the work of transforming the cotton into yarn than is necessary under the given social conditions. If, under normal, that is average, social conditions of production, A pounds of cotton ought to be made into B pounds of yarn by one hour's labor, then a day's labor does not count as twelve hours' labor unless twelve A pounds of cotton have been made into twelve B pounds of yarn. For in the creation of value, the time that is socially necessary alone counts. Not only the labor, but also the raw material and the product now appear in quite a new light, very different from that in which we viewed them in the labor process pure and simple. The raw material serves now merely as an absorbent of a definite quantity of labor. By this absorption, it is in fact changed into yarn, because it is spun, because labor power in the form of spinning is added to it. But the product, the yarn, is now nothing more than a measure of the labor absorbed by the cotton. If in one hour one and two-thirds pounds of cotton can be spun into one and two-thirds pounds of yarn, then ten pounds of yarn indicate the absorption of six hours' labor. Definite quantities of product, these quantities being determined by experience, now represent nothing but definite quantities of labor, definite masses of crystallized labor time. They are nothing more than the materialization of so many hours or so many days of social labor. We are here no more concerned about the facts that the labor is the specific work of spinning, that its subject is cotton and its product yarn, than we are about the fact that the subject itself is already a product and therefore raw material. If the spinner, instead of spinning, were working in a coal mine, the subject of his labor, the coal, would be supplied by nature. Nevertheless, a definite quantity of extracted coal, a hundredweight, for example, would represent a definite quantity of absorbed labor. We assumed, on the occasion of its sale, that the value of a day's labor power is three shillings, and that six hours' labor is incorporated in that sum and consequently that this amount of labor is requisite to produce the necessaries of life daily required on an average by the laborer. If now our spinner, by working for one hour, can convert one and two-thirds pounds of cotton into one and two-thirds pounds of yarn, footnote, these figures are quite arbitrary, end of footnote, 
it follows that in six hours he will convert ten pounds of cotton into ten pounds of yarn. Hence, during the spinning process, the cotton absorbs six hours' labor. The same quantity of labor is also embodied in a piece of gold of the value of three shillings. Consequently, by the mere labor of spinning, a value of three shillings is added to the cotton. Let us now consider the total value of the product, the ten pounds of yarn. Two and a half days' labor has been embodied in it, of which two days were contained in the cotton is also represented by a piece of gold to the value of fifteen shillings. Hence, fifteen shillings is an adequate price for the ten pounds of yarn, or the price of one pound is eighteen pence. Our capitalist stares in astonishment. The value of the product is exactly equal to the value of the capital advanced. The value so advanced has not expanded, no surplus value has been created, and consequently money has not been converted into capital. The price of the yarn is fifteen shillings, and fifteen shillings were spent in the open market upon the constituent elements of the product, or what amounts to the same thing, upon the factors of the labour process. Ten shillings were paid for the cotton, two shillings for the substance of the spindle worn away, and three shillings for the labour power. The swollen value of the yarn is of no avail, for it is merely the sum of the values formerly existing in the garise. Footnote This is the fundamental proposition on which is based the doctrine of the physiocrats, as to the unproductiveness of all labour that is not agriculture. It is irrefutable for the orthodox economist. This method of adding to one particular object the value of a number of others, for example adding the living costs of the weaver to the flax, of, as it were, heaping up various values in layers on top of one single value, has the result that this value grows to the same extent. The expression addition gives a very clear picture of the way in which the price of a manufactured product is formed. This price is only the sum of a number of values which have been consumed, and it is arrived at by adding them together. However, addition is not the same as multiplication. Mercier de la Riviere. End of footnote. These separate values are now all concentrated in one thing but so they were also in the sum of fifteen shillings before it was split up into three parts by the purchase of the commodities. There is in reality nothing very strange in this result, the value of one pound of yarn being eighteen pence. If our capitalist buys ten pounds of yarn in the market, he must pay fifteen shillings for them. It is clear that whether a man buys his house ready-built or gets it built for him, in neither case will the mode of acquisition increase the amount of money laid out on the house. Our capitalist, who is at home in his vulgar economy, exclaims, Oh, but I advanced my money for the express purpose of making more money. The way to hell is paved with good intentions, and he might just as easily have intended to make money without producing at all. Footnote. Thus, from 1844 to 47, he withdrew part of his capital from productive employment in order to throw it away in railway speculations, and so also, during the American Civil War, he closed his factory and turned his workpeople into the streets in order to gamble on the Liverpool Cotton Exchange. End of footnote. He threatens all sorts of things, he won't be caught napping again. In future, he will buy the commodities in the market instead of manufacturing them himself. But if all his brother capitalists were to do the same, where would he find his commodities in the market? And his money he cannot eat. He tries persuasion. Consider my abstinence. I might have played ducks and drakes with the fifteen shillings, but instead of that I consumed it productively and made yarn with it. Very well, and by way of reward he is now in possession of good yarn instead of a bad conscience. 
and as for playing the part of a miser, it would never do for him to relapse into such bad ways as that. We have seen before to what results such asceticism leads. Besides, where nothing is, the king has lost his rights. Whatever may be the merit of his abstinence, there is nothing wherewith specially to remunerate it, because the value of the product is merely the sum of the values of the commodities that were thrown into the process of production. Let him therefore console himself with the reflection that virtue is its own reward. But no, he becomes importunate. He says, The yarn is of no use to me. I produced it for sale. In that case, let him sell it. Or, still better, let him for the future produce only things for satisfying his per— He now gets obstinate. Can the labourer, he asks, merely with his arms and legs, produce commodities out of nothing? Did I not supply him with the materials, by means of which and in which alone his labour could be embodied? And as the greater part of society consists of such ne'er-do-wells, have I not rendered society incalculable service by my instruments of production, my cotton and my spindle, and not only society, but the labourer also, whom in addition I have provided with the necessaries of life? And am I to be allowed nothing in return for all this service? Well, but has not the labourer rendered him the equivalent service of changing his cotton and spindle into yarn? Moreover, there is here no question of service. Footnote. Extol thyself, put on finery, and adorn thyself. But whoever takes more or better than he gives, that is usury, and is not service, but wrong done to his neighbour, as when one steals and robs. All is not service and benefit to a neighbour that is called service and benefit for an adulteress and adulterer do one another great service and pleasure. A horseman does an incendiary a great service by helping him to rob on the highway and pillage land and houses. The papists do ours a great service in that they don't drown, burn, murder all of them, or let them all rot in prison, but let some live, and only drive them out, or take from them what they have. The devil himself does his servants inestimable service. To sum up, the world is full of great, excellent, and daily service and benefit. Martin Luther and die Pfarrherrn wieder den Dwuchel zu predigen Wittenberg, 1540 A service is nothing more than the useful effect of a use value. I make the following remark on this point. It is not difficult to understand what service the category service must render to a class of economists like J. B. Say and F. Bastia. End of footnote. Ebra gave him back an exact equivalent in the value of three shillings added by him to the cotton. He gave him value for value. Have I myself not worked? Have I not performed the labour 